Translator's Note to Small Souls by Louis Couperus Translated by Alexander Teixeira de Matos This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org This story is translated from the Dutch of Louis Couperus, the foremost novelist in a country which has lately had the good sense to join the Berne Convention. Friends who have seen my version in manuscript suggest to me that certain details of the action and dialogue strike an exotic note to English ears, and may therefore need some interpretation. But I could not bring myself to burden a work of fiction with an array of footnotes, nor to believe that it is really necessary to explain to readers of Couperus's fellow countrymen, Martin Martins, that Dutchmen and women of the upper classes still call their parents papa and mamma, as the English did in the sixties, and still drink tea after dinner, as the English did in the forties, that in Holland persons of quality are not addressed by their titles in conversation, that it is not quite correct, or that it is at least a departure from the aristocratic tradition for a lady of family not to wash up her own breakfast china at the table, that the Dutch speak of Java as India, and sometimes marry native wives who, nihilo obstante, are received by the family at home. I have done my best, by a complicated and perhaps only partly successful system of italics, hyphens and dots, to render the various eccentricities of speech of Cato van Loer, Adolphine van Satzma and Aunt Ravener. The few Malay words employed by the last named, by Otto van Nagel's wife and by her native nurse, are explained in notes as and when they occur. Small Souls is the first of a series of four novels describing the fortunes of the van Loer family and known in Holland by the generic title of the Books of the Small Souls. The remainder will be translated and published if and as the antecedent volumes find favour with English and American readers. They are called The Later Life, The Twilight of the Souls and Dr. Adrian. Alexander Teixeira de Matos, Chelsea, 4th of December, 1913. End of translator's note. Chapter 1 of Small Souls by Louis Couperus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was pouring with rain, and Doreen van Loer was tired out when, by way of a last visit, she dropped in on Carol and Cateau just before dinner. But Doreen was pleased with herself. She had gone out immediately after lunch and had trotted and trammed all over the Hague. She had done much, if not everything, and her tired face looked very glad, and her bright black eyes sparkled. Have Benier and Mefrau gone into dinner yet, Sincha? she asked, nervous and breathless, in a sudden fright, lest she should be too late. Now, miss, but it's just on six said Sincha, severely. Doreen van Loer whisked through the hall and rushed upstairs, forgetting to put her wet umbrella in the stand. She clutched it in one hand, together with her skirt, which she forgot to let fall. In her arm she held a parcel pressed close to her, under her cape. In the other hand she carried her muff and her old black satin reticule. With the same hand, making a superhuman effort, she felt for her pocket handkerchief and managed to blow her nose without dropping anything but four or five tram tickets, which flew around her on every side. Old Sincha followed her with her glance, severely. Then she went to the kitchen, fetched a cloth, silently wiped up a trail of rain and drops along the hall and staircase, and carefully picked the tram tickets off the stair carpets. Doreen walked into her brother's study. Carol van Loer was sitting placidly by a good fire, reading. His smooth-shaven face shone pink and young. He wore his thick, glossy hair neatly combed and brushed into a fine tuft. He dyed his moustache black, 
and like Doreen he had the black eyes of the Van Loers. His broad figure looked comfortable and well-fed in his spruce clothes. His waistcoat lay in thick creases over his stomach, and his watch-chain rose and fell with his regular breathing. He seemed calm and healthy, full of calculating prudence and quiet selfishness. He gently put aside the magazine which he was reading, as though he felt that he was in for it, that he would have to listen to his sister for a quarter of an hour at least, but he made up his mind to interrupt her pretty often. So he rubbed his large fat pink hands and looked at Doreen impassively, and his glance seemed to convey, Go on, I'm listening, I can't help myself. Doreen stood near his writing table, which was in the middle of the prim room, while he remained sitting by the fire. I've been to all of them, Doreen began triumphantly. To Bertha, to Bertha, to Gerrit, to Gerrit, to Adolphine, and to Ernst and Paul. I've been to all of them, said Doreen triumphantly, and they've all promised to come. Doreen, would you mind putting your umbrella outside? It's so wet. Doreen put her umbrella in the passage outside the door, and she now also let fall her skirt, the hem of which showed an edge of wet mud, at which her brother kept staring as though hypnotised. "'And what did Bertha say?' he asked, pretending to be interested, but giving all his attention to the wet hem. "'Well, Bertha was very nice. I must say, Bertha was very nice,' said Doreen, and the tears, always so ready with her, came into her dark eyes. She was very busy with the girls, drawing up the lists of invitations for Emily's wedding, and tomorrow they have one of their official dinners. But she said at once that if Mamma wished it, we must all of us obey her wish and go to Mamma's tonight to meet Constance. And Van Nagel, who came in for a moment, said so too. Bertha never agreed with Mamma about encouraging Constance to come back to Holland, but now that things had gone as far as they had, she said she would look upon Constance as a sister again, quite as a sister. And what did Van Nagel say? asked Carol Van Loer. Carol was not really interested in what his brother-in-law, Van Nagel van Voorde, the colonial secretary, had said, but he had a methodical mind, and now that he knew Bertha's opinion, he also wanted to know her husband's opinion, and the opinion of all the other brothers and sisters. Meanwhile, he continued to look at the wet hem of Doreen's skirt, and longed to ask her not to touch his paper knife and paperweight, which she kept playing with half nervously. But he said nothing, calculating within himself that, presently, when Doreen was gone, he would have a moment before dinner to put everything straight. Well, I gathered from what Van Nagel said that he hoped Constance would show the greatest tact and not be too pushing at first, but that, as their brother-in-law, he would welcome Van der Velke and Constance very cordially. Carol nodded placidly to show that he understood what lay at the back of Van Nagel's words, and that he quite agreed. And what did Van Satsuma and Adolphine say? Well, of course, I had more trouble with Adolphine than with any of the others, cried Doreen, triumphantly waving the paper knife, while Carol anxiously followed the movements of her hand. First, she didn't want to come, and said that Mamma had no morals and all that sort of thing. I answered that I respected her views, that, of course, everyone was free to think as he pleased, but that she must not forget that Mamma was an old woman, a very old woman, and that we ought to try and make her happy in her old age. Then I said that Constance was Mamma's child as much as any of us, and that it was only natural for Mamma to want us all to take Constance back as a sister, as it had all happened so very long ago, and she had been married to Van der Velke for fifteen years, and their boy is thirteen. Doreen, would you please mind leaving the paperweight alone, else all those letters are sure to get mixed? And what did Adolphine say to that? Well, at first, Adolphine wouldn't hear of going, said she was afraid of Constance's bad influence on the girls, said she couldn't possibly take them. In fact, she talked like a fool, 
but when I told her that Van Nagel and Bertha were coming, and that not a word had been said about their girls, that they were coming too, then Adolphine said that she would come after all and bring her girls, and Gerrit and Ernst. Doreen opened Carol's stamp box, but shut it again at once, terrified when she saw the stamps neatly arranged in the compartments according to their values. I saw Gerrit and Ernst too, and Adeline spoke very nicely, and Paul. A gong sounded. That's dinner, said Carol. I suppose you won't stay, Doreen. I don't think there's much. Cato and I always dine so simply. Oh, I eat very little. I should like to stay if I may. Then we can all go on to Mamma's afterwards. Carol van Loer gave one more look at the muddy hem. He remembered that the dining room had been cleaned that day, and he could restrain himself no longer. Doreen, he said in despair, in that case, won't you let Marie brush you down first? Then, at last, Doreen realised that she was not fit to be seen after trotting and tramming the whole afternoon in the rain. She looked in the glass. When she had taken off her wet cape, she would be less presentable than ever and so she dolefully changed her mind. "'You're right, Carol. I don't look nice, and my boots are wet. I think I had better go home and change for the evening. So good-bye for the present, Carol.' "'Good-bye, Doreen.' The gong sounded again. Doreen clutched her reticule, hunted all round the room for her umbrella, until she remembered that it was outside, and hurried away, while Carol repaired the disorder on his writing-table and puts the paperweight and paper knife straight. In the hall, Doreen met her round-faced sister-in-law, staring at her with startled eyes like an owl's. Cateau asked in a slow, whining voice that emphasised every third or fourth word, Oh, Doreen, are you really staying to dinner? No, thanks, Cateau, it's very kind of you. "'but I must change my things. "'They're all coming this evening to Mamma's. "'Oh, are they all coming? "'Yes, and I am so glad. "'Well, don't let me keep you. "'Carol will tell you all about it. "'So, good-bye till later.' "'She hurried away. "'Sincha let her out, severely. "'Carol and Cato sat down to dinner. "'They had no children.' They were now living in The Hague, after many years spent in a pretty village in Utrecht, where Carol had been burgomaster. They had a large and handsome house in the Oranjestraat. They kept three servants. They kept a carriage. They loved good fare and took their meals by themselves, just the two of them. They never entertained. There were no small dinners for relations, nor dinner parties for friends. They lived according to the rules of opulent respectability. Everything in their large house, with its heavy, comfortable furniture, was solid and respectable, in no wise luxurious. They both looked healthy and opulent and Dutch and respectable. Cateau was a heavy woman of forty, with a pair of startled round eyes in a round face, and she always wore a neat, smooth, well-fitting dress, brown, black or blue. They lived by the clock. In the morning, Carol took a walk, always the same walk, through the woods. After lunch, Cateau did her shopping. Once a week, they paid a round of visits together, and that was the only time when they went out together. They were always at home in the evening, except on Sundays when they went to Mamma Van Loer's. Notwithstanding their comfortable life, their three servants and their carriage, they were thrifty. They considered it a sin and a shame to spend money on a theatre, an exhibition or a book. Every spring and autumn they bought what they needed for their house and wardrobe, so as to have everything good and nice, but that was all. Their one vice was their table, they lived exceedingly well, but kept the facts from the family, and always said that they lived so very simply that they could never ask an unexpected visitor to stay, and as they never invited anybody, 
the secret of their dainty table did not leak out. They had a first-rate cook, and Cateau kept a tight rein upon her, telling her that Menia was so particular. But they both feasted daily, and at their meals they would exchange a glance of intelligence, as though relishing some voluptuous moment of mutual gratification, because everything was so good. Softly smacking their lips, they drank a good glass of good red wine, and then, at dessert, Carol's face beamed fiery red, and Cateau blinked her eyes, as though tickled to her marrow. Then they went into the sitting-room, and sat down at the round table with their hands folded in their laps, to digest in silence. Carol, for appearance's sake, would undo the parcel from the circulating library. Now and again they looked at each other, reflecting complacently that Anna had cooked that dinner beautifully. But, as they considered that this enjoyment was sinful, and above all, un-Dutch, they never spoke of their enjoyment and enjoyed in silence. This evening, they reckoned out that they had quite an hour left in which to digest their dinner by the big stove, and as they did not like Mamma's tea, they had a cup of tea at home. At eight o'clock, Cynthia came to say that the broom was at the door, so as not to let the broom wait longer than necessary in the rain and spoil. They got up at once, put on cloak and greatcoat, and started. They did not so much mind if the horse got wet, for the horse was jobbed, but the broom was their own. End of chapter 1「Of Small Souls」by Louis Couperus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Doreen van Loer lived by herself in a boarding house, though old Mrs. van Loer had a large house in the Alexanderstraat. Their friends all thought this odd, and Doreen was a little perplexed at having constantly to explain that she would have liked nothing better than to live with Mamma and keep house with Mamma, and look after Mamma, and spoil Mamma. But, as a girl of twenty-two, she had left home to become a nurse, and, when she found that she had mistaken her vocation, Mamma had refused to let her come back. But surely, Mamma, who was so fond of gathering all her children round her, the friends would say. Yes, that was so, said Doreen. Mamma doted on her brood, and yet she preferred to be alone in her big house. She preferred to do her housekeeping herself, and did not care to have anyone staying with her or fussing about her. No, it was better that Doreen should stop in her boarding house. Mamma was still so active, saw to everything, knew about everything. Doreen would have been of no use to her at home. Besides, Mamma herself wouldn't hear of it, and used to say laughingly, but quite in earnest, those who go away can stay away. And the Van Loer's friends thought it odd, for the old lady was known for just that motherly quality of hers, for loving to keep all her children round her in a close family circle, at the Hague or in the immediate neighbourhood. And she did not look at all a difficult old lady, with her gentle, refined old face of a waxy pallor, and her smooth grey hair, not at all a managing old dame who could not possibly live in the same house with her unmarried daughter. And so Doreen was always a little perplexed at having to explain, especially as she herself thought it odd of Mamma. But Mamma was what she was, and it couldn't be helped. Doreen felt less tired after she had had some dinner and changed her clothes, and she put on her galoshes and went on to Mamma's at once. The rawness of the March evening bore down on the deserted Java Strat with a shudder of dripping fog. It had rained all day, and now the heavy grey sky was blotted from sight, in a mist that clung in masses of woolly dampness to the roofs and treetops. The wind whistled from the northwest and skimmed over the rippling puddles, the trees dripped as heavily as though it were still raining, 
and the pale yellow light in the clouded street lamp shimmered down upon the street. Hardly anyone was out of doors so early after dinner. A man, carrying a parcel, left a shop and shuffled close to the houses with wide hurrying legs. Doreen tripped across the puddles in her galoshes, hugging herself in her old-fashioned long fur cloak, and she talked to herself and muttered out loud. She grumbled at the rain, grumbled at all the trouble which Mamma had given her that day, sending her to all the brothers and sisters for Constance's sake. And you'd see, Constance wouldn't even be grateful to her. Constance would think it only natural. Everyone always thought it only natural that Doreen should run about for the family, and no one was ever really grateful. Everyone was selfish, Mamma included. Well, she would try it herself one day, being selfish, and sit all day long by her fire, as Carol always did, and live only for herself, for her own pleasure, and leave them all to their fate. Just imagine, supposing tomorrow she were to say to Bertha and Adolphine, whose girls were soon to be married, that she had no time to go on everybody's errands. It was always Doreen. Doreen could do it all. Doreen didn't mind the rain. Doreen had to be in the Weinerstraat anyhow. Running about, running about, running about without stopping, all out of sheer silly good nature. And who thanked her for it? Nobody. Not Mamma, nor Bertha, nor Adolphine. It was all taken as a matter of course. Well, she would like to see their faces tomorrow if she said, I've no time, you know, or I'm staying at home today, or I'm feeling rather tired. Doreen feeling tired. What next? Still grumbling, she rang the bell at Mamma's in the Alexanderstraat. She took off her things in the hall, and now she emerged from her long cloak, a lean and wiry little woman of thirty-five, with a thin and sallow face, her breast shrunk within a painfully tight, dark silk blouse, her dull, mud-coloured hair drawn tightly from her forehead into a knot at the back, very thin, with no hips, with not a single rounded line, and with those dark eyes of the Van Loers, which in her were bright and intelligent, but with an odd sort of silent reproach and secret discontent at the back of them, as though brooding under her glance. With all she had retained something very young and girlish, something innocent and gay and lively. While pulling off her gloves, she spoke pleasantly to the servant, made a playful remark about the wet weather. She felt her hair to see if it was smooth and drawn back properly, and tripped up the stairs with a swinging gait, her shoulders bobbing up and down, her legs wide apart. There was now something quite young and unconstrained in that gay liveliness of hers. She found Mamma upstairs in the double drawing-room, where Clarcher was lighting the gas. "'They're all coming, Mamma," Doreen blurted out. Then, starting when she saw the servant, she whispered, "'I've been to all of them, first to Carol, then to Bertha, then to Adolphine. No, first to Gerrit.' She became muddled, laughed, made Mamma sit down beside her, and told her what all the brothers and sisters had said. The old woman's face beamed with satisfaction. She kissed Doreen. "'You're a dear girl, Dorincha, she said, with a motherly voice which she used when speaking to any of her children, even to Bertha, who was fifty, and which she had never learnt to give up. "'You're a dear girl to have taken so much trouble.' And it's very nice of all the others to come tonight, for I know it means a great effort to some of them to forgive and forget, and to take back Constance as a sister. And I appreciate it all the more. Mrs. Van Loer said this in a tone of approval, but a little autocratically, as though she granted her children a right to their own opinion, but yet thought it only natural that they should obey their mother's wish and she and Doreen watched the servants putting out the card-tables, one in the big drawing-room, one in the second drawing-room, and one in the boudoir. It was the sacred Sunday, the evening of the family group, as the grandchildren naughtily called it among themselves. Every Sunday, 
Mama collected as many Van Loers, Reuveners, Van Nagels, and Satsumas as she could, minding the name less than whether they were relations, even though they were only relations of relations. It was all brother and sister, uncle and aunt, cousin and cousin. Years ago, the Van Loers, Papa, the retired Governor-General, and Mama had instituted that Sunday gathering of the members of the family who happened to be at The Hague, and they had all, as far as possible, kept themselves free on Sunday evenings to come to the family group. This very regularity bore witness to the close bonds connecting the several families. Uncle Reuvener could not remember missing a single Sunday evening, except when he ran over to Java on a six-month's return ticket to see how the sugar factory was going on. The Reuveners were first, as usual, arriving very early and at once filling the rooms. Uncle, with a shiver, abused the Dutch climate. He was tall and stout, wearisome with his noisy attempts at humour, full of a superficial good nature and an affectation of kind-heartedness. He was always blundering out things that fell like a sledgehammer. He at once filled the whole room with his blustering joviality, his ponderous efforts to make himself agreeable. His sister, Mrs. Van Loer, so gentle, so distinguished, was always afraid that he would break something. Auntie was a rich nonna, who had brought the sugar factory as her dowry. She too was heavy and fat, like a Hindu idol, and covered with big diamonds. Still, there was something kind and friendly about her. Looking at her, you had a vision of a spicy rice table, and toothsome kwe a promise of material comfort, of a lavish supply of good things to eat and drink. And with it all, she was not unsympathetic, with her soft, dark eyes. They brought with them their three daughters and two sons, the two elder girls of Doreen's age, gay and boisterous, regular natives, a son of twenty-eight, who was also in the sugar business when in Java, a third daughter, a couple of years younger, and the youngest son, a little brown fellow, fifteen years old, very short and thin, who seemed to have come much later, by accident, all the Van Loers, though Mamma was born in India and Papa had made his way there until he reached the highest office of all, were ultra-Dutch, and always laughed a little at the Reuveners, while cheerfully resigning themselves to the Indian strain, which shocked them a bit, made them a trifle uncomfortable in the presence of their purely Dutch friends and connections. Still, the old lady, whose family affection was very strong, declared that they were in their right place there, even though Uncle Reuvener was only her half-brother, and Auntie very Indian. For Mamma Van Loer carried her family pride to the point of maintaining that all that formed part of the family was good. To be related to the Van Loers seemed in a sense to ennoble, to exalt, to improve the very stock. And so she always looked severe when her children... Gerrit, Adolphine and Paul laughed at Aunt Reuvener and the Indian nieces, who were good children, always cheerful, always amiable, bright and pleasant. Uncle was very noisy, strode up and down the rooms with straddling legs to warm himself. So, we shall see Constance here tonight? Well, it is a long time since we did. Let me see, how long is it? How long is it, Marie? Twenty years? Yes, it must be twenty years. At least, I haven't seen her since she married the Stuffler. Lord, what a sweet child she was. What a sweet, pretty child. Twenty years ago. Why, it's an age. She must have grown old. Yes, of course she must. She must have grown old. How old is she? It's easy to reckon. She must be forty-two, eh? And van der Velke is a nice fellow. What? Very decent of him. I'm bound to say, very decent. Mamma Van Loer turned very white. Doreen gave an angry look. Tutti Reuvener pulled Papa's sleeve. Allah, that's Papa, she whispered good-naturedly to her sister Dutcher. No tact. Yes, Aunt Reuvener began in a fat, slow voice. Was it so long ago? Cassian, 
she added, sympathetically. Poor Constance. I'm so glad I'm going to see her. Papa, said Poppy Roivener, the youngest. What is it? How can you? What? You're upsetting Aunt Marie, don't you see? But good Lord. Oh, do stop about Constance. What have I said? If you don't stop, you'll make Aunt Marie cry. Don't you understand? Oh, mustn't I talk about Constance? There's always something in our family one mustn't talk about. It's beyond me. And Uncle began to stride up and down the rooms again, rubbing his hands which were still cold. Two very old aunts entered. They were the Miss Roiveners, very old ladies, turned eighty and looking more than that, unmarried sisters of Uncle and Mrs. Van Loer. Their names were Doreen and Christine, but the younger generations called them Auntie Rina and Auntie Tina. So nice of you, said Mrs. Van Loer. So nice. What? asked Auntie Rina. So nice of you, Doreen, screamed Mrs. Van Loer in her ear. Marie stays, screamed Aunt Tina. It's so nice of you to come tonight. Doreen is so deaf, Marie. Really, she's getting unbearable. Aunt Tina was the young one, the tetchy one, the bitter one. Aunt Rena was the older one, the good-natured, deaf one. Outwardly, the two old ladies resembled each other and looked like old prints in their antiquated dresses. They wore black lace caps on the grey hair that framed their faces, which were wrinkled like a walnut. The old ladies went and sat far apart, and it was strange to see them sitting at either end of the drawing-room, quietly, watching attentively, not saying much. Now the others came, gradually. The first to arrive were the Fansatsumas, Adolphine, her husband, Florcha, Caroline, Maricha, and three noisy boys, all younger than their sisters. Next came Geritz and his wife Adeline. Their children were still in the nursery. Next, Carol and Cato, still digesting their good dinner and their good wine. Ernst entered, gloomy, timid, queer and shy, as usual. Paul followed. He was the youngest son, thirty-five, good-looking, fair-haired and excessively well-dressed. Last came the Van Nagels, Bertha and her husband, the colonial secretary, with their children, the three elder girls, Louise, Emily, with Van Raven, her future husband, and Marianne, young Carol, and another Maricha. The two undergraduates were away, this time at Leiden. There was a general humming and buzzing. The uncles, aunts, nephews, and nieces exchanged greetings. Many of them had not seen one another all the week, but they made it a rule to meet at Mamma's Sundays, and this evening there was great excitement among them all, though they restrained it for Mamma's sake. A mutual whispering and asking of opinions, because Constance was returning to The Hague, to her family, after twenty years' absence. Adolphine overwhelmed her eldest sister, Bertha van Nagel van Voorde, with a torrent of whispered words, "'It's Mamma's wish,' said Bertha, laconically, blinking her eyes. "'But what do you think? What does Van Nagel think? You surely can't think it's pleasant. Constance is our sister.' "'Our sister, our sister, if my sister misconducts herself.' "'Adolphine, Constance has been married to van der Velke for fourteen years, and there comes a time when one overlooks. "'But what are you going to do?' "'Will you have her at your house?' "'Yes, of course.' "'Adolphine had had it at the tip of her jealous tongue to say, "'And I suppose you'll ask her to your big dinners.' "'But she restrained herself. "'The younger nephews and nieces were also busily talking. "'Isn't she here yet?' "'No, she's coming later.' "'Is she old?' "'She's between Uncle Gerrit and Aunt Adolphine. "'How nervous Grandmamma is!' Oh, she doesn't strike me so. Why is she so late? To make a triumphal entry. Oh, triumphal, said Flutcher, Adolphine's daughter, 
That would be the finishing touch. There she is. Yes, I hear someone on the stairs. Granny's gone outside to meet her. And Aunt Doreen, too. I'm awfully curious to. Yes, but we mustn't stare like that, said Marianne van Nagel to the boys. Why shouldn't I if I want to? asked Pete Satsima. Because it's ill-bred, said Marianne angrily. Oh, indeed. It's you that's ill-bred. And you're a bore, cried Marianne, losing her temper. Marianne, said her sister Emily soothingly. It's those horrid boys of Aunt Adolphine's, muttered Marianne in her indignation. Then don't take any notice of them. Here comes Aunt Constance. Mrs. Van Loer had gone to meet her daughter in the passage. She embraced her there. The door was open. The brothers, sisters, nephews, nieces looked out and at once began to talk busily to one another in artificial tones. Then Mamma came in, leading Constance by the hand. On her face was a smile of quiet content, but she was trembling with nervousness. She remained standing for a moment, looking through the crowded room. Constance van der Velke, holding her mother's hand, also stopped. She was still a pretty woman, very pale, with hair beginning to go grey around her young and charming face, in which the dark eyes loomed big with anxiety. She still had the figure of a young woman, and she wore a black satin gown. There was a wait of a few seconds at the door, a pause just perceptible, yet poignant, as though a stubborn situation were being forced into the easier groove of polite manners and kind words, because of this sister's homecoming. But then Bertha came up and smiled, and found the kind word and the polite manner. She kissed her younger sister, said something charming. Mrs. Van Loer beamed. The other sisters and brothers followed, the nephews, the nieces. At last, one by one, they had all welcomed her. Constance had kissed them or shaken hands, and she was deathly pale, and her black eyes trembled, misty with tears. Her voice broke, her hands shook, she felt a sinking at her knees. A passion of weeping was rising to her eyes, and she found it almost impossible to control herself. She kept hold of her mother's hand like a child, sat down by her, tried to smile and to behave normally. Her words almost choked her, her breath throttled her, her black eyes started from their sockets, quivering in her deathly pale face, and she shivered as though in a fever. She tried to do her best, to talk as though she had only been away a year, but it was no use. She had not set foot in those rooms since the day, twenty years ago, when she married Distoffola, the Dutch envoy at Rome. Since then, so much had happened in Rome, oh, so much. Her life had happened, her life of mistake upon mistake. How could she talk the usual commonplaces now? She saw herself here, twenty years ago, coming back from church in her white bridal dress. She saw her father, now dead. She saw Testophila. She saw herself, after she had changed into her travelling dress, saying goodbye, going away with Testophila. Since then, since then, she had never been back. Since then her father had died. Since then she had only twice seen her dear mother for a moment at Brussels. Oh, since then! Since then all her brothers and sisters had become strangers to her, and she herself had been a stranger, never in Holland, always abroad, always an alien. Now, now she was back. Was it possible? Was it a dream? Her brother-in-law, Van Nagel, the cabinet minister, came up to her. "'We are very glad to see you at the Hague, Constance.' "'Thank you, Van Nagel. And shall we soon be making Van der Velke's acquaintance?' There was something in his words, as though he were forcing the situation, for Mama Van Loer's sake. "'He has some business to settle in Brussels. He will be here in a week.' It was very difficult to keep up the conversation, and he was silent. So one of your girls is engaged? she asked, 
tactfully diverting the talk from herself. Yes, Emily, the second. Emily. He beckoned to his daughter. Emily came up, bringing Van Raven with her. May I introduce Mr. Van Raven and Constance? Van Raven, and she gave him her hand. My best wishes for your happiness, Emily. Thank you, aunt. And there's another wedding in prospect, said Mamma. Florcher, a Dykerhof. And she beckoned to Florcher, who introduced Dykerhof. Meanwhile, the members of the family tried to behave as usual. They talked together, as though in ordinary conversation. Uncle Reuvener arranged the parties at the card tables. Carol, Tutti, Louise, Gerrit, Bertha, Cato, Van Satsuma, Ernst. His voice marshalled the troops. The younger generation were put to play round games at a long table in the conservatory. Constance gave a soft laugh. What a lot of us there are, Mamma, at just Sundays. What a lot of us. The word had a special charm for her. Meanwhile, Uncle Reuvener was teasing his two old sisters. Come, Brincha and Tincha, don't you want to play bridge? What? Herman wants to know if you're going to play bridge, screamed Aunt Tina in Aunt Irina's ear. Bridge? Yes, if you want to play bridge. She is so deaf, Herman. They won't remember me said Constance, speaking of the old aunts. They must have forgotten me in these twenty years. How old they have grown, Mamma! How old we have all grown! Bertha is grey. I'm going grey myself. And all those little nieces, all those young nephews whom I have never seen, do they always come, on Sundays? Yes, child, every Sunday. There's a great kindness and affection among them all. I always think that so delightful. We are a large family. I'm glad to be here, but they are still like strangers to me. How many of us are there here, Mamma? Oh, quite thirty. Let me see. Mamma van Loer counted on her fingers. Uncle and Aunt Reuvener, with Tootie and Dot and Poppy and Pete and young Herman. That makes seven. Then... Van Nagel and Bertha with the four girls and Carol. That's seven more. Fourteen. Constance listened to her mother's addition and smiled. Twenty years. Twenty years ago. She felt as though she could have burst out sobbing, but she controlled herself, smiled, stroked Mamma's hand. Mamma, dear Mamma, I'm so glad to be back among you all. Dear child. They have all received me so nicely, so simply. Why, of course, Connie, you're their sister. Constance was silent. Doreen, with two of the young nieces, poured out the tea, brought it round. Have a cup, Constance. Milk, sugar. How familiar and pleasant it sounded, just as though she were really one of them, as though she had always been one of them. Have a cup, Constance as if it wasn't the first cup of tea she had had there for years and years. Dear Doreen, Constance remembered her as a girl of seventeen, shy, not yet out, but even then caring, always caring for others. She was not pretty, she was even plain, ungraceful, clumsy, badly dressed. Yes, Doreen, I should like a cup. Come here, Doreen, sit down and talk to me. The girls can see to the tea. She drew Doreen to the sofa beside her and nestled between her mother and her sister. Tell me, Doreen, do you still look after everybody so well? Do you still pour the tea? Her voice had a broken sound, full of a melancholy that permeated her simple bantering words. Doreen made some vague reply. When I went away, said Constance, you were not seventeen. You were always cutting bread and butter for Bertha's children. Otto and Louise were seven and five then. Emily was a baby. Now she's engaged. She smiled, but her eyes were full of tears. Her breast heaved. My dear child, said the old lady. It's a long time ago, Connie, said Doreen. 
It was twenty years since anyone had called her Connie. So, you're thirty-six now, Doreen. Yes, Connie, thirty-six, said Doreen, uncomfortable as usual when anybody spoke of her, and she felt her smooth, flat hair to see if it was drawn well back. You've changed very little, Doreen. Do you think so, Connie? I'm very glad of it. Will you like me a little, Doreen? Why, of course, Connie. My dear child, said the old lady, much moved. They were all three silent for a while. Constance felt so much, was so full of the past years, that she could not have uttered another word. Why didn't you bring Addy? asked Mamma. I thought he might be too young. The two Marichas always come, and so do Adolphine's boys. We never sit up late because of the children. Then I'll bring him next time, Mamma. Doreen stole a glance at her sister and reflected that Constance was still pretty for a woman of forty-two. What a young and pretty figure, thought Doreen. But then it was a smart dress, and Constance was sure to wear very expensive stays. Regular features, she was like Mamma, a clear-cut profile, dark eyes now dimmed with melancholy, very pretty white hands with rings, and her hair especially interested Doreen. It was turning into a uniform steel grey, and it curled. Connie, does your hair curl of itself? Of course not, Doreen. I wave it. What a labour! Constance gave a careless laugh. Constance always had nice hair, said Mamma proudly. Oh no, Mamma dear, I have horrid straight hair. They were silent again and all three of them felt that they were not speaking of what lay at their hearts. Constance, what lovely rings you have! Ah, Doreen, I remember you used to admire me in the old days. When I went to a ball you used to stand and gaze at me. But there is nothing left to admire, Doreen. I am an old stick now. My dear, said Mamma indignantly, you needn't mind, Mamma. You're always young, a young grandmamma, and she pressed Mamma's hand with a touching fervour. Translator's Notes Nonna, a half caste. Rice table, the lunch or tiffin of the Dutch East Indies, consisting of rice with a great variety of spiced meats and vegetables. Kwe kwe, cakes. Allah. Lord. Cassian. Poor dear. End of chapter 2. Chapter 3 of Small Souls by Louis Couperus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Doreen, asked Constance, where is Papa's portrait? In the boudoir. Oh, so Mamma has moved it. I want to see it. She went with Doreen through the drawing room, past the card tables. She noticed that the conversation at once stopped at the table where Adolphine and Uncle Roivena were playing, and that her sister raised her voice and said, Did I deal? Diamonds. They were talking about me, thought Constance. She went into the boudoir with Doreen. There was a card table with cards and markers, but there was no one in the room. Decanters and glasses, sandwiches and cakes had been put out in readiness for later. Papa, said Constance softly. She looked up at the big portrait. It was not a work of art. It was painted in the regulation wooden style of thirty or forty years before, and it struck Constance as an ugly daub, dark and flat in spite of all the gold on the Governor-General's uniform, all the stars of the orders. The portrait represented a tall and commanding man, with a hard face and dark stony eyes. Aye, I used to think that portrait much finer, said Constance. Was Papa so hard? Her eyes were riveted on her father's face. She had certainly been his favourite daughter, 
her marriage to Distoffler, his friend. A man much older than herself had pleased him, because it flattered his ambition. But then, then he fell ill. He died soon after, soon after the thing that's happened. That, and her marriage to van der Velke. Oh, God, was it she who had killed him? She drew Doreen to her. Tell me, Doreen, was Papa ill for very long? Yes, Connie, very long. They were silent. They thought of their father, of his ambition, of his longing for the greatness which he achieved, of his wish to see his children also great, high-placed and powerful. I say, Doreen, how strange it is. There's not one of Papa's sons. What do you mean, Connie? Nothing. I don't know. Papa had always helped Van Nagel. Her thoughts ran on. Doreen, is Carol still a burgomaster? Oh, no, Connie. Carol and Cato have been living at the Hague for years. And Geritus, a captain? Yes, in the Hussars. I'm quite out of everything. And Ernst does nothing. Ernst has always been rather strange, you know. He really fights shy of people. He collects things, all sorts of things. China, books, old maps. And Paul? No, Paul does nothing. But how strange. What? That they have none of them done anything to distinguish themselves. None of Papa's sons. But, Connie, they're all quite nice, cried Doreen indignantly. Well, yes, Ernst is rather queer. And of course it's not right that Paul should do nothing. I oughtn't to have said it, Doreen, but Papa would have liked to see his children distinguished. Doreen felt annoyed, and at the same time confused. Distinguished, distinguished, and her thoughts muttered within her mind, while Constance stood looking at the portrait. Distinguished, distinguished, Constance did well to talk of being distinguished. True, she had made a great marriage. To Staffeler, the minister at Rome, an old diplomatist, a friend of Papa's. True, she had been distinguished, no doubt, and it had turned out nicely, her distinguished marriage. Distinguished indeed. Could Constance really be vain still? Perhaps because she was now Baroness van der Velke. A fine thing, that scandal with van der Velke. Distinguished. Distinguished. Well, no, they were none of them distinguished. But then everybody couldn't be Viceroy of the East Indies. Constance had always had that sort of vanity. But Constance, talking, or thinking unkindly of her brothers, whom she hadn't seen for years. That Doreen could not stand. No, that she couldn't. They were brothers. They were family, they were the Van Loers, and she couldn't stand it. She had always stood up for Constance, for Constance was a sister, was herself a Van Loer. But Constance must not start giving herself airs and looking down upon them, with her distinguished, her distinguished. Very well, the brothers were not distinguished, but there was nothing else to be said against them, never had been, and against Constance there was and Doreen's voice suddenly sounded very cold, as she asked, Shall we go back to the drawing-room? Constance, however, absorbed in thought, did not notice the cold voice, and took Doreen's arm. But, when she again passed Adolphine's table, she heard her call quickly, in a startled tone, No tramps! Sss! 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 Uncle Roivener, who was losing, hissed between his teeth. "'What a card-holder! Constance, won't you cut in after this rubber?' Constance was sure that they were still talking about her. "'No, thanks, Uncle. I really don't feel like playing tonight.' Her voice sounded faint, in spite of herself. She stopped for a moment, but, when nobody else spoke, she moved on aimlessly, leaning on Doreen's arm. She felt contented and yet strange in those rooms, in which she saw herself as she was on that last day, the day of her marriage with Distaffula. 
she could see herself at the wedding breakfast, and afterwards, when the time came to say goodbye. Since then, her own people had become strangers to her. Like a little child, she went in search of her mother, who was talking to Aunt Reuvener, sat down in a chair by her and took her hand. "'Well, Constance, it is nice to have you back again,' said Auntie, energetically laying a firm Indian stress on her words. "'So nice for Mamma too. Cassian! Where are you staying now?' At the Hotel des Andes for the present, Auntie. As soon as van der Velke arrives from Brussels, we shall look out for a house. I am so curious to meet your husband. Constance gave a vague laugh. Do you often go to India, Auntie? Yes, child, almost every year. Uncle likes going, because of the business, Taranginongan, the sugar, and then home again on our return tickets. It's so easy with the French mail, no trouble at all. And Alima, my maid, she knows everything, knows Paris, the custom office, does everything, helps uncle with the tickets. You should see her, dressed just like a lady, stays and all splendid. You laughed till you cried. How long did you live in Brussels? We were eight years in Brussels. Small Brussels, I think. Compared with Paris, what made you go to Brussels? Tell me. Well, Auntie, laughed Constance, we had to live somewhere. We used to travel a great deal besides. We were often on the Riviera, but suddenly I got terribly homesick for Holland, for Mamma, for all of you. Then I talked about it to van der Velke, about moving to The Hague, and he too was longing to get back to his country. And there was Adrian, my boy. He's thirteen now, and we wanted him to have a Dutch education. Does your son talk Dutch? Of course he does, Auntie. What is he going to be? Constance hesitated. He'll probably enter the diplomatic service, she said, in a low voice, thinking involuntarily of her years in Rome, of de Stuffela, of all that had separated her from her people. Really? asked Mamma, greatly interested. Yes, van der Velke would like it. She was still holding her mother's hand, and Mrs. van Loer sat very erect, looking pleased to have Constance back. Marie, said Auntie, do you know what I think so funny of you? You're mad on your children, mad on them, but when you see your daughter after all these years, you let her sleep at the Hotel des Andes. Why is that? Tell me. I saw Constance once or twice in Brussels, Mrs. Van Loer protested. Constance laughed. But, Auntie, Mamma's like that. She has her own ways, and Adrian, Addy, would be too much for her, though he's a very quiet boy. Mamma said nothing, smiled peacefully. Yes, she was like that. She had her own ways. I was saying to Uncle today, Auntie continued, if it didn't look too funny, I'd ask Constance myself to stay with us. There's that Marie, I said. She's got a big house and leaves her child at the Hotel des Andes. It's beyond me, Marie. Constance, you must come and eat rice with me and bring your husband and boy. Do you like Nassi? Yes, Auntie, we shall be delighted. Constance and Auntie stood up. Constance walked towards the conservatory. The young nephews and nieces were sitting at their round game, but had stopped playing, and Constance shrank from going farther and talking to them, for they hurriedly took up their cards again and went on playing. And she turned away and thought, They were talking about me. The servants came in with the trays. Who'll have a sandwich? Uncle, Shall I mix you a drink? asked Doreen, moving restlessly about the rooms. Translator's Note Nasi, Rice End of chapter 3「Chapter 4 of Small Souls by Louis Couperus This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Yes, she had longed for them all, for her home and for Holland. Oh, the passionate longing of those last years, ever and ever more passionate. Oh, how lonely she had been, and how she had pined for Holland, for the Hague, for her relations. During all those years she had been an outcast from her home, an exile as it were, during all those long hungry years. Twenty years she had spent abroad. For five of them she had been married to de Staffler, the five years in Rome, and then, oh, the one mistake of her life, and how she had pined since that mistake, incessantly. And, after the child was born, she had pined incessantly. Yes, for thirteen years she had pined. During all that time she had seen her mother twice, for a couple of days, because travelling was such an effort for Mamma, because she herself dared not go to the Hague, which was so near, so near. Her brothers, her sisters, her whole family had denied her all that time, had never been able to forgive the scandal which she had caused, the blot which she had cast on their name. She was a girl of twenty-one when she married de Staffler. He was an intimate friend of Papa's. They had been at the university together and belonged to the same club. Now de Staffler was Netherlands minister at Rome, a good-looking, haloed man, fairly well suited to his post. Not a political genius like Papa, she thought, but still full of qualities, as Papa had always said. She was Papa's favourite and he had thought it so pleasant, was proud that de Stuffler had just fallen in love with her, like a young man, and been unable to keep away from the Alexanderstraat when he came to Holland, to the Hague once a year on leave. She remembered Papa's smile when he talked to her about de Stuffler, hinting at what might happen. They had then been living for five years at the Hague, after Papa had been Governor-General for five years. She remembered the vice-regal period, three years of her girlhood from twelve to seventeen, remembered the grandeur of it all, the palaces of Batavia and Bautazorg, their country house at Chipanas, the balls at which she danced, young as she was, the races, the aide-de-camp, the great gold pajong, all the tropical grandeur and semi-royalty of a great colonial governorship. After that, at The Hague, a quieter time, but still their crowded receptions, their great dinners to Indian and home celebrities. Bertha back from India with Van Nagel, she herself presented at court. She loved that life, and from the time when she was quite a young girl, had known nothing but glamour around her. Papa, too, breathed in that element of grandeur, a man of great political capacity, as she thought never realising that Papa had merely risen through tact, through mediocrity, through a certain opportune vagueness in his political creed, which was curved and shaded with every half-curve and half-shade that the needs of the moment might dictate, through good breeding, through the eloquence of his meaningless, easy-flowing sentences, full of the high-sounding commonplaces of the day, through his suavity and suppleness, his smiling amiability, all of the personal charm of him. She had always seen her father important. She saw him so still, and she herself at that time longed for importance, for every sort of worldly vanity. She had it in her blood. As a young girl, she loved brilliancy, titles, loved spacious, well-lighted rooms, fine carriages, loved to see men in stars and ribbons, ladies in court dress, loved to curtsy very low before the king and queen. The little princess Wilhelmina was then still a baby. Thanks to de Stoffela, their receptions were sometimes attended by members of the corps diplomatique and of that particular set at The Hague which fastens on to the diplomatists, the little band of people who at The Hague are stared and gaped at wherever they go, who talk loudly at the opera, swaggering in all the arrogance of their smartness and conceit, looking down upon all and everything that does not form part of their own little set, and encouraged in their blatant self-assertion by the Hague public, 
with its flattering tribute of open-mouthed curiosity. She did not see all this, especially as a young girl. She thought it grand if a Spanish Marquis, or a German Count, a member of one of the legations, showed himself for ten minutes at her parents' receptions. And if Mrs. This, or the Freule That, of the set, came for only five minutes, Constance would brag about it, with an assumption of indifference, for the next three months. Vanity was born in her blood, and had been nourished at Batavia and Bautazor, where she was made much of as the young daughter of the Governor-General. Now, at The Hague, full-fledged, she struggled above all to be invited to the drawing-rooms of The Set. It was very difficult. Though Bertha and she had been presented at court, though her parents still had ever so many connections, she was constantly encountering coldness on the part of the set, coupled with great incivility which she had to swallow. But she had some of papa's tact, and she went on struggling. She left cards on Mrs. This to all eternity, with a snobbishness for which she came to blush later. She bowed and talked pleasantly to all eternity, to the Freule that, receiving nothing in return but a snub. She had found that the Hague was not the same as Batavia, that though you had been the highest personage at Batavia, you were not so easily admitted into that very high circle of the Hague, the Set. Now she laughed softly at all this, after that first family evening, sitting in her room at the hotel, while her boy slept. Yes, papa had always smiled because de Stoffela was so much in love with her, and she herself had thought it delicious to be wooed by this diplomatist, with his ribbons and stars, by this smiling, courtly man of sixty, who did not look a day more than fifty. And when he asked papa for her hand, she accepted him, very glad and happy, a little flushed and triumphant, rather inclined to preen herself in the delectable atmosphere of congratulation. She was now, thanks to de Stoffela, decidedly a member of the set, and at the same time did not need the set so very much, now that she was going to Rome, to spend her life in circles such as that of the Quirinal and the white Roman world. She had attained her aim. She had a charming husband, not young, but none the less passionately in love with her, and vain, in his turn, of his young and pretty wife. She had a title. She had money enough, even though de Stoffela's affairs were somewhat involved. She found the court balls at Rome more splendid than the routs at The Hague. She was introduced to all sorts of great names. The Italian aristocracy, it is true, was even more exclusive than that of The Hague but she moved in a brilliant circle of diplomatists and foreigners. Only she was struck by the fact that abroad the members of the corps diplomatique were not stared at so much as in the opera at The Hague, or on the terrace at Scheveningen. It almost annoyed her. She would have liked to be stared at in her turn, but in the society of a big capital like Rome, the wife of the Netherlands minister, even though she was young and pretty and well-dressed, was not so important a person as the Marquesa this of the Spanish legation, or Mrs. this or the Freule that of the set was at The Hague. People did not stare at her in Rome, and this was almost a disappointment. Besides, her increasing and often wounded vanity left a certain void within her, a sense of boredom. De Stoffela, ever courtly, present and in love with the apprehensive love of an old man for the young wife whom he is afraid, lest he should soon cease to attract, ended by irritating her and upsetting her nerves. But this at the time was nothing more, nor anything more serious, than boredom and vague discontent. Since then, life had set its mark on Constance, often now as a woman of forty-two, she felt a dull melancholy in pondering on her life. She let her life, one woman's life, glide past her gaze once more. She began with her childish years in India, saw once more the splendour and grandeur of Boitazor, 
criticised her own vanity during her girlhood at The Hague, saw her marriage as a great mistake of her life, saw, as the second irrevocable mistake of her life, all that had happened with van der Velke. Her life had been warped beyond remedy. She had gone from vanity to wantonness, to reckless play-acting with that life, big with fate, which she had first seen only as a dazzling reflection, a reflection of mirrors, candles, satins, jewels, titles and orders, the setting of the play, a little flirtation, a little jesting, not even always witty, with smart men of the world, refined and elegant in their dress clothes, who assumed airs of mysterious importance about the great affairs of kings and countries, affairs which were settled by just two or three supermen in Berlin, London or St. Petersburg, while most of the others, the exquisites, gave weighty decisions on a matter of ceremony, a visit, a card with or without the corner turned down, a little matter of etiquette, trivialities around which their whole existence and that of their wives revolved. She too had given weighty decisions in all these matters. A three weeks' mourning for this Royal Highness, an eight days' mourning, very light with a touch of white, for that Royal Highness. And her life was so full of all this ado about nothing that she had hardly had time to reflect. In Rome, as the wife of the Netherlands minister, with some pretensions to lead the cosmopolitan circle, which here and there touched upon that of the exclusive Roman aristocracy, she was so busy with her hairdresser and her tailor, with shopping in the morning, half a dozen visits and a charity matinee in the afternoon, a court ball at night, followed by a little supper, so busy that it affected her health, and often left her tired and pale, but she had grudged none of it, so long as she saw her name mentioned with the others in the newspapers. And when, in the midst of all this empty glamour, in the midst of all this empty bustle, she met van der Velke, the new young secretary of the Netherlands legation, and of course saw him nearly every day, she had allowed him to make love to her, just because a couple of her friends declared that he was making love to her, and because a serious flirtation, a passion formed part of the game as it were. And then, in very elegant language, she had complained to van der Velke of the void in her life, and said all sorts of fine things about soul hunger and life weariness, without knowing anything about soul hunger or life weariness, and remembering that she had to go to her dressmaker that afternoon, and to two receptions, and that she had her own reception in the evening. Then she parroted bits out of a French novel, acted a scene or two after the same model, thinking it time to bring a little literature into her life. He, a good-looking fellow, short and well-knit, sturdy without being clumsy, with a pair of boyish blue eyes, a shapely round head with lightly curling short brown hair, like a head of Hermes, and still exceedingly young, thought that it would look well for him to make a little love to his chief's wife, without going any farther, of course. But it was impossible for them to play with fire, unscathed, in an atmosphere like that of Rome. They saw so many French novels acted around them, that, quite involuntarily, they began to feel not only like a modern hero and heroine of fiction, or a pair of fashionable actors, but what they were a young man and a young woman, she the wife of a man old enough to be her father. What had started with a compliment and a laugh, because of what her friends had told her, led to a warmer pressure of the hand, not once, but many times, the abandonment of a waltz, a kiss and the rest. They both glided towards sin gradually, as though inevitably. She was at first greatly surprised at herself, and annoyed, and for the first time in her life, felt the danger of playing with life, especially when she, who had never loved, fell in love with the man who had acted with her in this drawing-room comedy, and turned it to earnest. In her soul, choked with vanity and false glamour, one genuine emotion now sprang up. She fell in love with van der Velke, 
She did not love him for any quality of soul or heart or temperament, but she loved him all the same, loved him as a young woman loves a young man, with all the blind impulse of her womanhood. Her feeling for him was primitive and simple, but it was whole-souled and true. Until now, she had cared for nothing but Mrs. This or Froyle That, of the set, the ceremonial splendour of the court, dinners, dresses, decorations, and all sorts of important matters concerning visits and visiting cards. Now she cared for a human being, a man, not for the sake of a wedding ceremony or stars and ribbons or visits of congratulation, but simply so that she might hold him in her arms. She felt something real blossoming within her, and the feeling was so strange to her that it made her anxious and unhappy. Their love was anxious, their love became unhappy as though it had a foreboding of all their hidden fate. They both heard it, the heavy footfall of their fate. It was as though, at their meetings, in their most passionate embraces, they listened outside to the rustle of one spying on them, and to that heavy footfall of their fate. And from the French novel, with its seasoned intrigue, that seemed to suit them so well, their love turned into the real tragedy of their lives. She had envious enemies, jealous because she had given a finer dinner than they, jealous of a handsomer dress. Testophila was first warned by anonymous letters, then a footman, whom he had occasion to rebuke, flung it in his face that Mafrau was carrying on with Menea the secretary. He traced their place of assignation. He found van der Velke there, while Constance had just time to escape down a back staircase, and this damning confusion, van der Velke's denial, was tantamount to a confession. Of course the scandal was spread abroad at once, in Holland as well as in Rome. A divorce followed. Constance was condemned by her family and cast out, left as it were homeless. She always fancied that the scandal had been Papa's death. A year later, he pined away, died, slowly from the effects of a stroke, broken-hearted over the stain which his favourite daughter had cast upon all the blameless decorum of the aristocrat and statesman that he was. She was left as it were homeless, with a small allowance from de Stoffela, which she refused as soon as she was able to do without it. Then she saw van der Velke come to her, to Florence, where she had, so to speak, taken sanctuary. But he did not come to her of his own accord. He came sent, forced to go by his father, for his father would not suffer him to go his own way and leave this woman to her misery. As she had given herself up to him, his father ordered him, in his turn, to give up all to her, his name and his career. Henri van der Velke had been brought up from childhood to yield unquestioning obedience to his parents. His father and mother were both descended from those strict, religious, doughty, aristocratic Dutch families to which the Hague set is a thorn in the flesh. And they had judged the matter thus, with rigid and scrupulous justice, as a duty before God and man. And their heir, as this, the supreme moment of his life, once more showed himself a dutiful son. He obeyed his parents' command. He resigned his post, broke off his young career. He went to Constance, telling her that his parents had sent him. But, in their mutual misery, they still seemed to find some love for each other in what remained of their first passion. She was too desperate to indulge in long reflection, or to decline the way of escape which he offered her. As they could not be married at once by Dutch law, they were married in London as soon as it was possible. Constance wrote to Henri's parents to express her gratitude, but they did not answer her letter. They refused to know her, refused to see her. They had sacrificed their son to her because they thought it their duty before God and they had made this heavy sacrifice because they were religious people, honest, righteous people. 
but their hearts were bitter against Constance. They would never forgive her the sacrifice which their honesty, their righteousness had required of them, the parents. Henri and Constance had lived in England, travelled in Italy, and ended by settling down in Brussels. Their son was born, the years passed. Slowly, in Brussels, they made acquaintances, made friends, and, in the course of years, those acquaintances and friends dispersed. Twice, amid heavy emotion, they had seen Mamma van Loer in Brussels for a couple of days at a time. The other members of the family never. The lonely years dragged on. They both came to look upon their lives as one great mistake. Constance's vanity, moreover, resented the dull existence which they led. Henri, who was four years younger than his wife, was forever regretting that he had sacrificed his future to this woman at his parents' behest. They were fettered to each other in the narrow prison of marriage. Passion dead, the despairing illusion of love killed, they had never been able to accommodate themselves to each other, and without mutual accommodation there is no happiness in marriage. Whatever they thought or said or did led to discord, their lives were never in step, but stumbled and shambled and shuffled along. Every word spoken by the one was an offence to the other. They could not endure each other's going and coming. Latterly, they could not speak, but their speech caused a quarrel. Between them stood the child, still the child of their love. But the child did not unite them, was a cause of jealousy to both. They grudged each other their offspring. He could not bear to see his son in her arms. She could not bear to see her boy on his knee. He turned pale when she kissed the boy. She cried with envy when he took him for a walk. Yet they did not think of a separation, deeming the thought ridiculous. Not so much for the world as, above all, for themselves. They would continue to bear their fetters together until their death, in hatred. The intolerable nature of their existence was enough to give Constance a feeling of homesickness for Holland. The last few years in Brussels, now that their acquaintances were scattered, had been so lonely, so melancholy, so forlorn, so bitter, so full of dislike, hatred, envy of Henri, that she yearned for consolation for some sort of love that would come to her with open arms and understand and pity her. There were days when she did not utter a word after a scene with Henri until Adrian threw his arms about her while she burst out sobbing on his childish breast. The boy, in other respects a sturdy lad, had his nerves so much shaken by this open conflict between his parents that he often fell ill. Then, both Henri and Constance, greatly alarmed, would suggest parting from Adrian for the boy's own good, so that he might not be a witness to their inevitable disputes. But they were both too weak. In their intolerable life, Adrian was the only alleviation, and neither of them had been able to resolve upon this parting. Both merely promised themselves to exercise restraint in future, so that the boy might not suffer. Gradually, Constance had talked more and more about Holland, confessed that she was yearning for all those whom she had left behind. She longed for them all, her mother, her brother, her sisters. She yearned for affection, for family affection, for the fostering warmth and love and sympathy of a large circle of relations, who would show her the kindness which she had known of old at Bautenzorch, at the Hague, and van der Velke also began to feel that strange nostalgia which urges a man towards the land of his birth, of his own tongue, of his kindred. Weary of living abroad, he fell in with Constance's view, really because of a chance word from Addy, who also often had the word Holland on his lips. The father was now thinking of his child's future, but they must first learn how the family would receive them. Van der Velke wrote to his parents, Constance to Mama van Loer. 
they wrote with all the humility of exiles, once more asked for forgiveness, after those fourteen years, said that they were longing to see their country again, their parents, brothers, sisters, to enjoy the sweet happiness of living where they would be at home. Both had felt the old inviolable bonds drawing them towards Holland, as though there were something which they needed before they could grow old and be a father and a mother to their son. Henri's parents had not yet written, did not at once reply to his question whether they could not forgive him now that those long, long years were past, whether they would not receive his wife, who, after all, was their daughter-in-law, who, after all, was the mother of his son, their grandchild. But Mamma van Loer had sent Constance a sweet and loving letter, a letter which Constance had kissed, which had made her sob with happiness. Mamma had written that her child was to come to her, that all was forgiven, all forgotten, that the brothers and sisters would receive her with open arms. And she had expressed her own delight as the old mother, who found it so difficult to get about, who disliked travelling, though it was but a two or three hours' journey to Brussels, and hated being so far from her child, for Constance was her child, in spite of all. Then Constance could restrain herself no longer, and, without waiting for the letter from Henri's father and mother, had gone on ahead with Adrian. Henri remained behind to settle a few matters of business. He was to follow in a week. And Holland, yonder, so near and yet so long unattainable, was to them as a land of promise, a land of peace, of happiness long deferred, where they would find for themselves and for their son all that of which they had been starved for years and years, parents and relations, old friends and acquaintances, and as the very essence of it all, that fragrant Dutch atmosphere, so indescribable, and yet, as they now realised, craved for by their parched and famished souls. Both, as with one thought, had suddenly, for all the discord of their lives, known as a certainty, both for themselves and their son, that to grow old and be a father and mother to their boy, they must return to their country, to which they were attached by those strange, mysterious, and long unsuspected bonds, which may be denied for years, but which end by reasserting themselves, irrefragably, for ever and all time. Translator's Note Pajong Umbrella or parasol. Freule, the title borne by noblemen's unmarried daughters. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of Small Souls by Louis Couperus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was Sunday afternoon. We must really, Carol, pay a couple of visits this afternoon, drawled Cato van Loer. Carol assented. It was visiting day. Where? he asked. She named one or two acquaintances. And then we must also go to Aunt and Uncle Roivener. It's their turn. And then, Carol, to your sister, to Constance. Hadn't we better wait till van der Velk is there? Otherwise we shall have to go again. I don't think it looks friendly to wait till van der Velke comes. Mamma did set us the example, Carol, you know. Then wouldn't it be better, Cato, for you to go alone first? Then I can call on van der Velke later. Or do you think I ought to wait until van der Velke has been to see me? We won't calculate it quite so closely as all that, said Cato generously. It looks as if we were not friendly. It would be better if you came with me today, Carol. So they decided both to call on Constance that afternoon, and they were on the point of starting when the bell rang, and Adolphine van Satsuma entered. What a nuisance, thought Cato. Now the carriage will absolutely have to wait. It was raining, and this meant that the broom would get wet, 
the horse was jobbed. The coachman did not count. He was only a man. Ah, Adolphine, this is nice of you. I see your carriage is at the door. Are you going out? Yes, presently, to pay a visit or two. So am I, but don't let me keep you. I am going to Constance this afternoon. So are we. Oh, are you? I would really rather have waited till she had called on me. Oh, said Cato, it looks as if we weren't friendly to calculate it so closely. Don't you think, Adolphine? Do sit down, Adolphine. Adolphine sat down, for she was paying Carol and Cato a visit, and if she had not sat down, the visit would not have been paid, would not have counted as a visit. Perhaps that was also the reason why Carol and Cato urged Adolphine to sit down, otherwise she would have been obliged to come back another day. They all sat down, the brother, the sister, the sister-in-law. Outside the rain was pouring in torrents, and already the broom was glistening with the wet. Cato's saucer eyes watched every drop through the curtains. The usual drawing-room talk began. What terrible weather, isn't it, Adolphine? Terrible. Adolphine was thin, angular, envious, badly dressed. Beside the prosperous, opulent respectability of Carol and Cato, sleek with good living, heavy with comfort, radiating money and ease, Carol in his thick frieze greatcoat, Cato in a rich silk dress and a rich fur-trimmed jacket with a rich toque, crowning her round pink and white full moon face adolphine looked shabby peevish and pretentious the stuff of her clothes could not compare with cato's which were eloquent of money good substantial money and yet adolphine had certain pretensions to fashion and elegance a thin straggling boa wound its length around her neck her fringe out of curl because of the wet hung in rat's tails from under a shabby little hat, draped in a limp veil. It was as though Adolphine felt this, for she said, enviously, I didn't trouble to put on anything decent in this beastly rain. Cato looked meaningly at the carriage outside. So, you're going to Constance also? Yes, but when will van der Velke be here? Satsma is waiting to pay his visit until van der Velke comes. You see, said Carol to Cato. Oh, asked Cato, drawling her words more than ever. Is Satsuma waiting until van der Velke comes? Oh, I told Carol to come with me, because perhaps it wouldn't look friendly. What do you think of Constance Adolphine? Carol thinks his sister so altered, so altered. Yes, she's altered. She has grown old, very old, said Adolphine, who, herself, four years younger than Constance, looked decidedly older. Oh, I don't know, said Carol, trying to defend his sister. You would never say she was forty-two. Oh, is she forty-two? drawled Cato. I will tell you what I think, said Adolphine. I don't think Constance looks a bit distinguished. When Adolphine was envious and jealous, and that was generally, she said the exact opposite of what she thought in her heart. Not a bit distinguished, she repeated with conviction. There is something in the way she does her hair, in those rings of hers. I don't know, something not quite respectable. Yes, something foreign, said Carol, feebly, by way of an excuse. I think said Cato. Constance has something about her that's not quite proper. Oh, said Adolphine, but propriety isn't her strong point. Never was, grinned Carol in his turn. If only she had stayed in Brussels, snapped Adolphine. Ah, said Cato, opening Big Owl's eyes. Do you think so too? Yes, and you? So do we, really drawled Cato, more cheerfully, forgetting the broom waiting in the wet. Yes, said Adolphine with conviction. What are we to do with a sister like that? 
whom you can't let anyone meet, growled Carol under his breath. Oh, dear, whined Cato to Adolphine, do you think so too? And, said Adolphine, mark my words, you'll see, she's full of pretensions. You know the sort of thing, with an envious wave of the hand. Society, pushing herself, perhaps even going to court. No, drawled Cato, surely for that, even Constance would have too much tact. I'm not so sure, growled Carol. Unlike Bertha and Constance, Adolphine had not been presented at court, because, after Constance's marriage, Papa and Mamma van Loer, feeling old and tired, had taken to living more quietly. She could never forgive them for it. No, droned Cato, but then you are such a regular, good, Dutch wife and mother, Adolphine. That's what I always say to Carol. Adolphine looked flattered. Yes, but, said Carol, by way of excuse, you mustn't look to Constance for what she has never been. She went straight to Rome after her first marriage. Those court circles are always fast, Adolphine declared. And then, in Rome, cried Cato, clasping her fat hands, such things happen. Adolphine rose. Her visit was paid. She had a great deal more to talk about, among others, the way in which Bertha had, so to speak, forced her daughter Emily into her engagement with Van Raven. But it was growing late. She took her leave. Carol and Cato went straight to the broom. Oh dear, said Cato in a startled voice, how wet the carriage has got. They drove to pay their visits. First they drove to the Roiveners. Carol rang. Fortunately, uncle and aunt were out. Cards for uncle and aunt. Next, Cato consulted her list to Mrs. Van Frieserstein, an old friend of Mrs. Van Loer's, at home. A cantankerous, shriveled little old lady, always alert for news. Glad to see you, Cato. Sit down, Van Loer. So, Constance is back, I hear. Yes, drawled Cato. It's very unpleasant for us. And how is Constance? Oh, she's all right, said Carol casually. You see, Mefrau, droned Cato, she's Carol's sister, isn't she? So, you're all receiving her? Yes, because of Mamma, you know. And Bertha, too? Yes, Bertha, too. And will she go to court again, do you think? Well, Adolphine said that she'd be sure to go to court again. I think that's wrong of Constance, said the old lady, sharply, inquisitively, eager for a bit of scandal. And Bertha's Emily is soon to be married. Yes, and Adolphine's Florcher too. I hear Emily is to have a splendid trousseau, said the old lady. Florchers will be much less grand, I suppose. Not so fine, drawled Cato, but still very nice. What terrible weather, my Frau. Come, Carol, we must be going on. In the broom again. Next visit to Mr. and Mrs. Eichstra, cousins of Cato, who was born an Eichstra. How do you do, Pete? How do you do, Anna? How do you do, Cato? How do you do, Carol? So, Constance is back. Yes, what do you think of it? And they all say everywhere that she is going to court. Oh, nonsense. Yes, Adolphine said so, and so did Mrs. Van Friesestein. How mad of Mrs. Van der Velke with that past of hers. Perhaps it's her husband who wants to go. Oh, no doubt it's her husband. And how does she look? Oh, so, so. Of course, she's Carol's sister but I think her not so very distinguished. Oh, well, I think her rather smart, growled Carol a little crossly. Oh, Carol, well, smart, if you like, but not what I call good taste. Rather foreign, I suppose, 
asked Anna Eikstra. Yes, and so many rings. That's what I don't like. And her hair, all curled and waved, puffed right out, you know. So ridiculous, because she's very grey, you know. Oh, really? Yes. What terrible weather, Anna. We ought to be going on, Carol. Where? growled Carol. To the Van Ravens. Oh, no, muttered Carol. It's raining so, and I have to get out all the time and ring the bell. But haven't you a footman? asked Anna, pretending not to know. I say, what next? muttered Carol. A footman, indeed. But, Carol, in that case, let us just go on to Constance. Oh, are you going to Mrs. Van der Velke's? Yes, we must really pay her a visit today. Well, come along then, growled Carol, who was irritable without knowing why. And they drove to the Hotel des Andes. The porter left them in the hall for a moment, then showed them up. How nice of you to come, said Constance. She was genuinely pleased. And in this awful weather, but as you see, you have to come up to my bedroom. I have no sitting room, and the drawing room is such a bore. Really, it's very nice of you to come, she repeated, and in this rain too. Adrian. Yes, Mamma. Here are Uncle Carol and Aunt Cato. She beckoned for the boy to come from his room. She was smiling with happiness, glad to see the faces of her brother and her sister-in-law, longing for the sympathy of family affection, though she had not known Cato in the old days. Ah, is that your boy, Constance? Well, he is a big boy. How do you do, Aunt? How do you do, Uncle? said the lad, a little coldly and haughtily. Is he like his father? asked Carol. Yes said Constance, grudgingly. Carol and Cateau looked at Adrian. The boy stood bolt upright before them. A strikingly handsome lad, he certainly resembled his father. He had van der Velke's regular features, his round head, his short, soft, curly hair. At thirteen, an age when other boys are overgrown, gawky and clumsy in their ways, he was not tall but well-proportioned and rather broadly built, with a pair of square shoulders in his blue serge jacket, with something about his gestures and movements that denoted a certain manliness and self-possession, uncommon in so young a boy. He tried to be polite, but could not conceal a certain mistrust of this unknown uncle and aunt. His small mouth was firmly closed, his eyes stared fixedly, dark blue, serious and cold. Constance made her sister-in-law and brother sit down. Forgive all this muddle, she said with a laugh. I was taking advantage of the rainy day to arrange my trunks a bit. Cateau gave a sharp glance round. There were dresses hanging over the chairs and from the pegs. A couple of hats lay on a table. Oh, Constance, said Cateau and she felt a little impertinent at saying, Constance, just like that. She had married Carol after Constance's marriage to de Stoffele, and this was only the second time that she had seen her sister-in-law, and had it on her lips to say, Mefrau, instead. Oh, Constance, what a lot of clothes you have. Do you think so? Things get so spoilt in one's trunks. I haven't as many dresses as that. Have I, Carol? But what I have is really good. But yours are good too, Constance. I like really good clothes. Only such a lot of lace would fidget me. Bertha dresses well too. But Adolphine, oh, what a sight she always looks. Does she? asked Constance. But she has to consider the cost of things, hasn't she? I have only two dresses every year. But those are really good. And will van der Velke be here soon? asked Carol. On Tuesday, then we shall look round for a house. I do think it's so delightful to be back at The Hague, among all of you. I see Mamma every day. 
Yesterday I was at Bertha's. A busy household, isn't it? I came plump into the middle of all sorts of rehearsals for the wedding. And I was at Kerritt's. Adeline is a dear. And oh, how I laughed. How I laughed. What a lot of children. I can't tell them one from the other yet. But how charming and delightful that fair-haired little woman with that fair-haired little troop. And she's expecting another baby this summer. And Doreen is nice too. Oh, you don't know. You don't know how glad I am to see you all. We are a big family, and life at The Hague is so busy. Look at Bertha. And Gerrit and Adeline too are busy with their little troop. But I do hope to take my place among you all again. It is so long since I saw you all. Ah, I didn't want to force things. Mamma did come to see me twice in Brussels. But my brothers and my sisters... No, it wasn't kind of you. But I dare say it had to be. Things were as they were. You couldn't very well respect me. You had to disown me. It couldn't be helped. I suffered tortures all those years. I never had anyone to talk to, except him, my little son. It wasn't right of Mamma, was it, Addy, to be always talking to you? But I couldn't speak out to Henri, to van der Velke. Oh, we are very good friends, quite good friends. I can't tell you how, all of a sudden, I longed for The Hague, for my family, for the people I used to know, for all of you, for everything. I always wrote to Mamma regularly, and Mamma gave me all the news, sent me the photographs of my little nephews and nieces, and yet my brain's whirling. Now that I am seeing you all, there are such a lot of us. I don't think there can be many families as big as ours. Bertha's alone is a big household. Fancy, Bertha, a grandmother. It's dreadful how old we're growing. I'm forty-two. Oh, I couldn't have gone on living in Brussels. We had no one left there. Our friends were scattered, gone away. Van der Velke, too, was beginning to long for Holland, for Addy's sake, as well as his own. Addy speaks very good Dutch, though. I always made him keep it up. He has a bit of a Flemish accent, perhaps. What do you think, Addy? We had a Flemish servant. Oh, what a lot I have to tell you. She laughed happily. Nothing interesting, you know, but I feel as if I must tell you everything. Talk and talk and talk to you, to all of you, my brothers, my sisters. She suddenly got up. Carol, do you remember in India how we used to play in the river, behind the palace, how we walked on those great stone boulders, you and I and Gerrit? We three always played together. Yes, Bertha had been married a year or two, while we were still children. Is Bertha fifty yet? She's quite grey. I'm going grey myself. Dear Bertha, and Louis and Gertrude, who died at Bautersorg. Do you remember, Carol? It was we three, who were always together. You used to carry me over the water on your back. How naughty we were! And I was thirteen or fourteen at that time. And things are so funny in India. Next year, I was in long frocks and going to the balls. I thought it delightful, all that grandeur, the aide de camp, the national anthem wherever we went. I used to imagine they played it for me, the viceroy's little daughter. Yes, Van Nagel was at the bar then, at Summerang. Bertha didn't come in for any of it. Oh, it's past now, my vanity. That shows you how a person changes. You were changed too, Carol. You have become so sedate, so dignified. What a pity you are no longer a burgomaster. You're cut out for it, Carol. She tried to speak lightly, suddenly feeling that she was talking too much about herself, letting herself go while Carol and Cato sat staring at her. And yet she cared for them. Was not Carol her brother? who had always been bracketed with Gerrit in her childhood memories. And was not Cateau his wife, though she had not a sympathetic face, with those great round eyes of hers? Were they not members of the family for which she had longed so? She tried to speak playfully, after her all too spontaneous outpouring, but she suddenly felt that this was out of tune too. She felt that, after all, she had not seen her brother for twenty years, not since the day of her marriage to de Stuffler, 
and that they had become as utter strangers to each other. She felt that she did not know Cato at all, and so, though Carol and Cato were her brother and sister, they were also strangers. But that was just what she did not want. She wanted to win them all, the whole family, to feel that they were all warm-hearted and indulgent towards her. And she spoke of Mamma, of the Sunday evenings, of Mamma's mania for the family, which she herself now felt so strongly, intensified, as it had been in those lonely, joyless Brussels years. She asked their advice about taking a house at The Hague. "'The best thing you can do is consult an estate agent,' said Carol. "'There's one close by. He'll know about all the houses to let.' "'It will be difficult to find the right thing,' said Constance. "'We had a pretty flat at Brussels, and I really prefer a flat to a house. "'But there aren't any in Holland.' "'Oh, Constance,' said Cato, round-eyed, "'don't you find a flat very stuffy?' "'Not at all, and I love to have everything on one floor. "'I don't care for maids running up and down the stairs.' "'Yes, but the place must be kept clean.' "'Well, it was, only in a flat, abroad. "'The bell doesn't keep ringing as it does at one's front door in Holland.' The cook goes to market in the morning. And does she just buy everything? She buys enough for a couple of days, vegetables and eggs and whatever she wants. Do you leave that to the cook? Oh, yes. Imagine if I didn't, laughed Constance. She simply couldn't understand it. I used only to give her a few instructions. Well, I must say that I don't think that's at all a proper way of housekeeping. "'Do you, Carol?' "'It's the way of the country,' growled Carol, under his breath. "'Were you thinking of looking for a house in one of the new districts? "'Downord, for instance?' "'I'd rather not be so far from all of you.' "'Dear Constance,' laughed Cato, with her round face, "'but we all live more or less far from one another.' There was a knock at the door. The porter showed Adolphine in. "'Ah!' Adolphine, how nice of you to come, all the more as we are to meet at Mamma's this evening. You're a good sister. And she kissed Adolphine. This is my boy. I brought him to see you the other day, but you were out. How do you do, Aunt? said Addy, stiffly. Forgive the muddle, Adolphine. I was just unpacking my trunks. We ought really to be going on, Carol. Are you going so soon? Yes. "'It's raining so, and the broom is getting so wet.' "'Constance,' said Carol, "'did you say that van der Velke would be here on Tuesday?' "'I expect so.' "'Well, then, give him my kind regards, and—and and would you give him my card? "'Then that'll be all right.' He took a visiting card from his pocket-book and laid it on a corner of the console table. Constance looked at him, in momentary perplexity. She could not speak for a second or two, did not understand. She herself had been brought up and had lived according to very punctilious rules of card-leaving, but yet she failed to understand how one brother-in-law could leave a card on another brother-in-law before that other was in town and, during a visit paid in his sister's bedroom, amid all the muddle of her unpacked trunks. But she had been so long away from Holland and The Hague. She did not wish it to appear that she did not understand, and, as a woman of the world, she did not, above all, wish it to appear that she thought Carol's performance with the card not only stiff, but intensely vulgar. She said, with a gentle smile, Thank you, Carol. Van der Velke will appreciate your call greatly. Her voice sounded friendly and natural and neither Carol nor Cato had any idea that Constance had controlled herself, as she had sometimes had to control herself in Rome, in a diplomatic salon full of intrigue and polished envy. In the broom, Cato said, You did that very cleverly, Carol, with that card. Yes, I thought it the best way, said Carol, in a burgomasterly manner. End of chapter 5
Chapter Six of Small Souls by Louis Couperus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Adolphine looked enviously around her. What a lot Constance must spend on her clothes! And it was not as if they were well off either, for all they had to live on was an allowance from Papa and Mamma van der Velke, the money which Constance had inherited from her father and the little that van der Velke could scrape together at Brussels as a wine and insurance agent. Nothing to speak of, all told. That Adolphe knew for a fact. She admired in particular a magnificent fur bolero, and wondered what two kinds of fur it was made of. But she said nothing. She never praised anything in another, not his raiment, nor his intellect, nor his virtues. Even if she had anything to gain by it, she could never have brought herself to say, Constance, what a pretty bolero that is. But pale with envy she kept looking at the fur as it hung over a chair, and the sight of it caused her almost physical pain, because it was not hers, and she did not know how one like it ever could be hers. Constance was rather tired. First she had been unpacking trunks with Addie, then Carol and Cato had come, and she had talked copiously in the pleasure and excitement of seeing them. But that visiting card of Carol's had depressed her, and now she talked listlessly. So your girl is going to be married soon, Adolphine? In May? I haven't seen either of them since Sunday. A couple of days ago I found their cards, and Dykerhoff's. How quickly a week passes. I didn't find any of you at home either. We are so busy shopping all day long, for the trousseau. Is Dykerhoff a nice fellow? Yes, and they are a very good family. As it happened, the Dykerhoffs were not in quite the same set as the Van Loers, and Mamma Van Loer was not over-enthusiastic about the engagements. Constance was silent. She was tired. She had a headache, and she thought that Adolphine had better keep the conversation going. But Adolphine was too much distracted by the bolero to be in form. She cast about for a subject, and yet there were plenty, for she was dying of curiosity to know all sorts of things. For instance, what Constance thought of Bertha and Cato, if only that wretched bolero were not there. At last she began, So you're looking for a house? Constance answered at random, and because of her headache, her expression became stiff and haughty, and her lips were tightly compressed. Adolphine thought her arrogant, and reflected that Constance had always been stuck up after her marriage to Distoffler and all the smart society in Rome. Adolphine suspected Constance of looking down upon her, and Constance merely had a headache. And shall you call on many people? No, Constance thought not. Won't you go to court? No, Constance hadn't given it a thought. Is your boy going to the high school? No, he was to pass his examination for the grammar school. Van der Velke wanted him to go to one of the universities later. What photographs are those? Friends of ours in Brussels. Had you many friends there? Not so many, latterly. Suddenly, Constance's eyes met Adolphine's and Constance did not see Adolphine's hateful hostility. Constance saw only her sister, four years younger than herself, but worn out by a tiresome, difficult life, a life full of money bothers, full of trouble with spoilt, disagreeable children, receiving no assistance from her husband, Van Satsuma, who was chief clerk at the Ministry of Justice. Constance saw her sister, thin, yellow, eaten up with worry and bitterness, in her almost shabby and yet pretentious clothes, and, notwithstanding her raging headache, she was filled with pity because Adolphine was her sister. She rose and went to Adolphine. Fiend, she said frankly, don't be angry if I'm not very talkative, but I have such a headache, and I really do think it nice of you to look me up. Come often. Let us see a lot of each other. I only came to The Hague because of you all. I wanted you so badly. I have dragged through so many dreary years. I have no one in my life except my boy, and he is still so young, 
and I tell him too much as it is. I have been very unhappy, Adolphine. Fiend, be nice to me. Be a little fond of your Constance. She did not always behave as she should. She did not always behave as she should. But forgive her, forgive her the past, she whispered, more softly, so that Addy should not hear. Forgive her that past which is always there, which has never become the past, for good and all. Forgive her, and love her a little. She burst into nervous sobs, and impulsively knelt down by her sister, and laid her head on her breast, and felt how poor and thin Adolphine was in her arms. A damp smell of rain was steaming from her muddy dress. "'Dear Constance,' said Adolphine, really touched, "'certainly I care for you, and that past was so long ago, we have all of us forgotten about it.' But Constance sobbed and sobbed. Mamma said Addy. She drew him to her also, held her sister and her boy in a close embrace. "'Come, Constance.' Mamma. Don't cry. You always have such a headache, Mummy, after crying like that. She controlled herself, stood up, and Adolphine found a few kind words. Adolphine was certainly touched, but she was cross about that bolero, and besides, she found Addy better looking, more taking almost, than any of her own three ugly, lubberly boys. However, she kissed Constance and arranged for Constance to come and take tea with her next evening. When Constance was a little calmer and had laughed a little through her tears, Adolphine took her leave with a warm kiss. And I'll just leave Van Satsuma's card, shall I, Constance? Here, by Carol's, for Van der Velke. Then he'll get it when he arrives. She put down the card and, suddenly unable to restrain herself, went, as though in passing, to the bolero, looked at it and said, in a voice that bore no resemblance to the envious thoughts that still smouldered in her heart, "'But, Constance, do you still wear those short little jackets?' "'Oh, they've been the fashion so long,' answered Constance, still thinking of the visiting cards. "'Well, I don't know. They'd be too short for me. At my age, I think.' Seeing that she was younger than Constance, the remark was not only unkind but dishonest, and Adolphine, now satisfied, went away. Constance stared at the two visiting cards, and suddenly burst out sobbing again. Addy took her in his arms. He was already nearly as tall as she was. Mamma, he said gently, with his resolute lad's voice, don't cry so, and go and lie down a little. You have to go to Grandmamma's tonight, and you'll be too tired if you don't rest first. And he helped her to take off some of her things and settled her pillows for her. She lay on the bed, sobbing convulsively, without really remembering why. The boy sat down by the window near the console table and took up his book, A Story of the Boer War. A movement of his arm sent the two cards over, he just glanced down at them, at those two pieces of pasteboard formalism, lets them lie on the carpet, and went on reading. End of chapter 6「Chapter 7 of Small Souls » by Louis Couperus This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. That evening, Constance played bridge though her head was still very bad. At Mama Van Loer's request, she had brought Addy with her, and he had joined his boy and girl cousins in their round games. Constance was playing with Bertha, Gerrit, and Uncle Reuvener. Constance, said Bertha, you mustn't think me unkind for only coming once to see you, and when you were out too. But I am so busy. I have sent you your invitation today for the wedding functions. You'll come, of course, won't you? Bertha was the eldest daughter, Mrs. Van Nagel van Vorder. Her husband was secretary for the colonies. In their house, Constance had at once felt something of her father's house in the old days. A big family, 
a circle which took a faint colonial tinge from the presence of the great Indian officials home from Java. Van Nagel had made his career through the protection of his father-in-law, the late Viceroy, and their set also just grazed the edge of the diplomatic world, and, of course, included a number of the chief officials of the home government as well. Although Constance had been only once as yet to their house in the midst of the bustle of rehearsals for the wedding theatricals, she at once felt something congenial there, something that was familiar to her, something of her former home, an atmosphere of distinction, of importance, which she had not known for many years past, but to which she yet felt herself drawn through the innate, instinctive vanity which she imagined was dead in her. Constance was happy, though she still had a headache. Uncle Reuvener was fussy but gay, because he was winning, with Gerrit for his partner. Bertha and Constance, their thoughts both far from the cards, went on talking, played badly. Bertha was almost entirely grey, greyer even than Mamma Van Lua. She had a rather ceremonious face and resembled her father. She had his hard, stiff features his hard, dark eyes, his thin lips. Her eyes were always blinking, as though she had a difficulty in seeing, and in her manner of talking there was something abstracted, as though she were always thinking of something else. She was well-dressed, simply, in good taste. "'I think it's so nice that your house is a sort of replica of our old house, when we were children,' said Constance. "'Yes,' said Bertha. What are trumps? You went diamonds yourself, said Gerrit, the cavalry captain, tall, broad-chested and fair. Attend to your game, sis. And you have a very busy home, I suppose, Bertha? Yes, said Bertha, very busy, and she played the wrong card. I've known all that bustle myself, said Constance. It was like that in Rome, terribly busy. Four or five things every day which you couldn't possibly avoid. Bertha smiled vaguely, and Constance suddenly felt that she mustn't talk about Rome. She winced. She could not mention de Staffler's name, must ignore all that period of importance. It suddenly upset her nerves, for she had not reflected that even among her brothers and sisters she would have to be careful to exercise tact. She had come to them, just because she wanted to be able to let herself go, to be frank and natural, but she felt strongly that Bertha disapproved of her for venturing to refer to Rome. She would have liked to talk about Rome, partly from vanity, to remind her sister, the wife of a minister, who was in the movement, that she too had known greatness and lived in the midst of it. But she felt that she must be humble, that she was nothing more than Mrs. van der Velke, the sister who had made a false step in life, who had married her lover, and who years after had been taken into favour by the charity of the family. This was clearly expressed in Bertha's hard, ceremonious Van Lua face, with the blinking eyes, even though Bertha spoke not a word. Constance was silent, went on playing. Uncle Reuvener was noisy, cracked his jokes. The Queen falls, he said in his fat voice. One more unfortunate, he shouted clamorously, and, playing his ace with a wide sweep of his hand, he gathered in the trick. Constance went pale, and Bertha blinked her eyes till they closed entirely. But Bertha was too much used to Uncle's astounding vulgarities to be much disturbed by them, and she answered her partner's call correctly. Constance kept her presence of mind, played her cards. She could have burst into one of her nervous fits of sobbing, but she restrained herself, knowing that Uncle was tactless, noisy and common, but that he would never hurt her willfully, and she was grateful to Gerrit when he came to her assistance. "'What a nice lad that boy of yours is, Constance!' "'My Addy, yes!' A bit dignified for his years, but otherwise a fine little chap. He's always very good to me. We both dote on him. You must let him come to us often, 
Our house is one big nursery, and he'll keep young among that troop of mine. Very well, Gerrit. Gladly. It's very kind of you. What is he going to be? Van der Velke wants him to go to the university first, and then into the diplomatic service. Is that his line? I don't know. He's a little too stiff, perhaps, but he's so young still. Send him to lunch with us on Wednesday, and then he can go for a walk with my crowd. Very well, I'll tell him. Yes, said Bertha, more cordially, as though waking from a dream. He's a charming boy, only a little stiff. He's still rather strange here. He is very polite, said Bertha, but distant. He has very nice manners. But when he says, how do you do, aunt, it sounds as if he were talking to a stranger. Oh, Bertha, he is meeting such a lot of new uncles and aunts all at once. He's a very nice boy, a handsome little fellow. Is he like his father? Yes, said Constance grudgingly. She felt again that the past had cropped up once more. She felt that Bertha was thinking that van der Velke was a very good-looking man. She had seen his portrait at Mamma's, and that was why Constance had fallen in love with him. But Gerrit laughed. Why do you say that in such a funny way, Sissy? Did I? One would think that you did not approve of your son's taking after his father. Constance was very grateful. Gerrit was so easy, so natural, and she laughed. What nonsense! Do you think I can't hear? Is he like his father? Yes. Of a sudden she became very sincere with Gerrit. Did I speak like that? Yes, it's silly of me, but I am a little jealous of van der Velke, where Addy is concerned. Silly of me, isn't it? Bertha looked severe, blinked her eyes. Uncle gathered in trick after trick. Game and rubber to us. We'll carry on the stakes, shall we? The sandwiches and drinks went round. Gerrit, said Constance as she moved her chair beside his. You're happy, aren't you, in your house with your little wife and your children? Gerrit looked surprised. Why do you ask? I had the impression. But why do you ask? Well, aren't you? Yes, of course, of course, of course I am, of course I am. Adeline. He beckoned to his wife, a plump, fair-haired little doll, a dear, sweet little woman of twenty-eight. She had seven children already, because Gerrit, who had married rather late in life, said that he must make up for lost time and get a whole troop together. Constance wants to know if we're happy. Silly Constance, why of course we are, said Adeline. You have a dear little troop of children. Your boy is a darling too. They smiled, happy in their offspring. Gerrit, restless, moved his big limbs almost violently. Children, that's the one thing in life, he shouted. We don't mean to leave off till we have a dozen, do we, Lean? Gerrit, you're quite mad. Oh, but I say, Constance, why leave that lad of yours all by himself? It's not good for a child. No, Gerrit, it's best as it is. It would not make us any happier to have a lot of children. I say, you were indiscreet enough to ask if we were happy. Now it's my turn. I don't believe that you and your husband get on so very well together. Oh, well, we understand each other. Perhaps not even that. But Addy keeps us together. We both dote on him. Van der Velke dotes on his boy. So do I, so do I. He is everything, both to him and to me. Her eyes filled with tears. We are nothing now to each other. She was sitting between Gerrit and Adeline. I did so want all of you, she continued, taking each of them by the hand. Be nice to me, will you? I am simply pining for affection. My child is all to me, but he is still so young, and I tell him too much as it is. Heavens, what a life I have had these last few years. No, you were not kind. Why did you never, never once come to me in Brussels? But Constance, dear, said Gerrit, if we had only known that you would have liked us to. Remember, 
you never sent us a line. You only wrote to Mamma, and she did go to see you once or twice. Own up. We had become strangers. Let us be friends again, then. Be nice to me. Your dear little wife. I don't know her, but you are my sister too, Adeline. Are you not? Be a little fond of me. Yes, of course, Constance, and let us see a lot of each other. Tell me, Gerrit, what is Bertha like now? Bertha is very nice. Bertha is an exemplary mother, an excellent wife. Bertha has a busy life. They do a great deal of good. They live for their children. They see heaps of people. They are in the upper ten, or rather, the upper two or three of The Hague. We are not, you know, and we never go to their big dinners. We are not in their set at all. I don't even go to Bertha's at homes, said Adeline. And yet we are very good friends, and Bertha is very nice. And when Adeline is expecting a baby, which is the usual state of affairs with us, Bertha is just like a mother. But she and her husband live in their own circle, which is very big and busy and important and smart and all the rest of it. So, Adolphine and Van Setsema? Oh, you needn't ask. They don't go to their dinners, at homes, balls, etc. either, and that makes Adolphine furious. But we don't care in the least. And aunt and Uncle Roivener? They go to the at-home days, laughed Adeline, but not to the dinners, and they have their own little Indian clique, which is very lively, but of course a thing quite by itself. Yes, reflected Constance. A big family like ours necessarily has all sorts of sections. And that is why Mamma is so devoted to her family group, in which all the different elements meet. Sometimes we don't see one another for weeks and months at a time, except on those Sunday evenings. And tell me, Carol and Cato? Carol and Cato, said Gerrit, mimicking Cato, live very comfortably and have very nice little dinners, all by their little selves, don't they, Adeline? They laughed. I was always fond of Carol, said Constance, of Carol and you, Gerrit. Do you remember in the river behind the palace at Bautazorg? He looked at her long, seeking their childish past in her eyes. Yes, you were a pretty child then. You used to act all sorts of fairy tales with us, among those great spreading leaves, stories of a princess and fairies and knights, and I don't know what. You were a darling of a child, such a dainty pale little elf in your white cotton budget, and your brothers were in love with you. But two years later, when I was a boy of sixteen and you fifteen, you suddenly became a stuck-up girl in a long ball dress, and you refused to dance with anyone except old staff officers and the secretary-general. And what am I now? she asked, smiling, with her soul full of sadness. The lost sister, found again. Yes, the lost sister, indeed. Come, sissy, not so gloomy. My life has been hard to bear. But you have your boy, your child. Children are everything. My life has been nothing but mistake upon mistake, and I'm so afraid that I shan't bring up my boy properly. Then leave that to your husband, said Gerrit, manlike. Oh, really? said Adeline. Is she to leave that to her husband? Yes, Adeline, just as we do. I the boys, you the girls. Oh, really? But, Gerrit, if I leave Addy to van der Velke, I shall have nothing left, nothing. Then be bolder, and have no fear. Oh, life is sometimes so difficult. So, Adeline, Gerrit, you will care a little for your lost sister who has been found again? Adeline kissed Constance. Mamma van Loa approached, radiant as always, at the family group which she had brought together. Mamma, I am so glad, so happy, to be among you all murmured Constance. The maids entered with the coats and wraps. Translator's Note Badget, a diminutive of kabai, a native jacket with sleeves. End of chapter 7
Chapter 8 of Small Souls by Louis Couperus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Two days later, Addy went to meet his father at the station. Daddy, Daddy, he shouted as van der Velke stepped from the train. They embraced. Van der Velke was much moved because it was fifteen years since he had been in Holland. Addy helped papa with his luggage like a man and they drove away in a cab. My boy, it's ten days since I saw you. What kept you so long, Daddy? Everything's settled now. And are we going to hunt for a house? Yes. He looked at his child with a laugh of delight, threw his arm over Addy's shoulder, drew him to him, full of a strange, oppressive sadness and content, because he was back in Holland. They pulled up at the hotel. Constance was waiting for them in her room. How are you, Constance? How are you, Henri? I've done everything. That's good. Your room is through here. Capital. He rang, ordered coffee. His face at once became stiff and drawn. Addy poured out the coffee. Here you are, Dad. Thank you, my boy. And how do you like your Dutch country, my lad? How do you like all the little cousins? Oh, I haven't seen much of them yet, but I'm going to Uncle Gerrit's and Aunt Adeline's on Thursday. How many children have they? Seven. By Jove! Is Mamma well, Constance? Yes, very well. I've... I've... Uh, had a letter from Papa, he stammered. They want us to come and see them soon at Driebergen. He was at last bringing her the long-expected reconciliation. She looked at him without a word. "'Here's the letter,' he said, handing it to her. She read the letter. It was couched in the groping words of an old and old-fashioned man who wrote seldom, an attempt at forgiving, at forgetting, at welcoming, laboured, but not insincere. The letter ended by saying that Henri's parents hoped soon to see him and Constance and Addy at Driebergen. Her heart beat. "'So?' They're condescending to take me into favour, she thought bitterly. Why only now? Why only now? My boy is thirteen, and they have never asked to see their only grandson. They are hard people. Why only now? I don't like them. But all she said was, It is very kind of your parents. She had learnt that in Rome, to say one thing and mean another. And when do you want to go to Driebergen? she asked. Tomorrow? We were to have gone to tea after dinner at the Van Satsumas, Adolphine and her husband. I am longing to see my father and mother. Very well. Offend my family for the sake of yours, and write and refuse the Van Satsumas. There is no question of offending anybody. I am longing to see my parents, and we must show them that we appreciate their letter. Appreciate? she asked bitterly. What am I to appreciate, that it took them thirteen years to say that they would like to see their grandchild? Your family weren't pining to see you either, all those years. That's not true. Mamma came to see us at Brussels. He laughed scornfully. In thirteen years, twice, for two days each time. She stamped her foot. Mamma is an old woman. She never travels. My parents also are old and they have had a hard struggle with their principles and convictions. So am I to be grateful to them? He looked at her fixedly. Grateful, he echoed. You've never been that, not to them nor to me. She clenched her fists. Again, she screamed, always again and again, nothing but reproaches for ruining your career, for, for... She sobbed aloud. Mamma said Addy. The boy was between them. He was everything to both of them. He never understood the cause of these quarrels, the ground of these reproaches, and until now he had never reflected how strange it was that his father's relations and his mother's were always so far away, so inaccessible. But he did not ask, even if he did not understand, and yet, though he did not understand this particular thing, he was no longer a child. He was a little man by now, and his heart was all the heavier 
because he did not know and did not understand. But he shouldered his burden like a hero. She kissed the boy. Ah, oh, she wept. You like him better than me, Addy. Go to him, go to him. Mamma, he said, I love you both the same. Don't cry, Mamma. Don't be so quick, so impatient. Van der Velke drank his coffee. She clasped the child to her, kissed him fiercely. I'm going out, Addy. You're very good, but I'm going out. I want air. Shall I go with you? No, stay with Papa. She could not bear to see them together at this first moment of his return, after the past ten days. She must harden herself to seeing him caress the child, and now she was running away so that she might not see it. She put on her hat, kissed Addy once more to show him that she was not angry with him, was never angry with him, and went out. Papa, said Addy. Van der Velke looked gloomy, apprehensive. Why do you say those things to her, Papa? My boy, he drew a deep breath, embraced his son. Addy, he said, you've grown bigger than ever. How broad you're getting. You're quite a big chap, Addy. Almost too big for your father to kiss and take on his knee. No, Daddy, I am your own boy. He sat down on van der Velke's knees flung his arms about his father's neck, laid his soft, childish face against his father's close-shaven cheek. My little chap! Van der Velke pressed the boy to him, felt calmer now, with that soft cheek against his. What do you start quarrelling at once for? It's Mamma, And you answer her. Mamma's nerves are all on edge. Then don't answer her. What are Mamma's people like? I think they're rather nice. Granny is very kind, and so are Aunt Bertha and Uncle Gredit and Aunt Adeline. Mamma is very glad to see them all again. Are you glad to be in Holland and to be seeing Grandpapa and Grandmamma soon? Yes, my boy. Then let us arrange when we shall go to Driebergen. Not tomorrow, for then you and Mamma are going to Uncle and Aunt van Satsuma's. Thursday I promise to go to Uncle Gerrit's, but I can see the children any day. So let us go down on Thursday, and then tomorrow you can begin to look for a house. Very well, my boy, that will do. Shall I tell Mamma it's settled? Yes. He clasped the child to him. My Addy, my boy, my darling, my darling. Silly old father. He remained on van der Velke's knee, cheek to cheek. Outside in the Vorhout, the rain pelted on the bare March trees, and grey mists loomed out of the distance, pale and shapeless, while the damp evening fell. End of chapter 8「Chapter 9 of Small Souls by Louis Couperus This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. That evening, after dinner, van der Velke, Constance and Addy went to Mrs. Van Loer's, where they found Doreen, who wanted to meet her brother-in-law. "'I was thinking of you today,' she said. "'I had lots of errands to do for Bertha, and so, as I was going through the town, I thought to myself, "'I'll go on to Downord, and see if there are many houses to let. I'm simply worn out.' "'But, Doreen, how sweet of you!' said Constance. Van der Velke too was surprised. That's really extremely kind of you, my new sister. Here is a list I made, with the rents in most cases. Only, Doreen, Downord is so far from Mamma. Yes, but Connie, said Mamma, you can't get anything in this neighbourhood for eight hundred guilders. What's the use of living at The Hague? said Constance impatiently. It being an hour away from you, I want to live near you. Well, we shall see, van der Velke ventured to put in. See, 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 said Constance angrily. I want to have my own house quickly. The hotel is expensive and I dislike it. By the time the furniture has come from Brussels, by the time we are settled. Oh, well, mummy, 
said Addy decisively. Rome wasn't built in a day, you know. She smiled at once. Every word spoken by her child was a balm, an anodyne. The old grandmother smiled. Doreen smiled. Addy, said Mamma Van Loer, you must do your best to help Papa and Mamma with the house. Yes, Granny, it won't be plain sailing. The child was more at his ease than on the Sunday evening. Granny was very kind, so was Aunt Doreen, to trot about like that after those houses. Aunt Doreen, do you always run errands? Everybody laughed. It was a mania of Doreen's to traverse the Hague daily from end to end. She was a very willing creature, and she was particularly busy just now for Bertha and Adolphine because of the two weddings. Ernst and Paul entered. We heard that van der Velke was at Mamma's, said Paul, and we've come to be introduced. These, at least, are not visits in optima forma, thought Constance to herself. Ernst resembled Bertha and blinked his eyes, but in addition he was odd, shy, always timid, even in the family circle. There was something bashful about him, as though he wanted to run away as soon as he could, but he made an effort and suddenly asked Constance, "'Are you fond of China?' "'Delf, do you mean?' "'Yes. Are you fond of vases? I love vases. I have all sorts of vases.' Have you ever thought of a vase? The shape, the symbol of a vase? No, you don't know what I mean. Will you come and see me one day in my rooms? Will you come and lunch, you and your husband? Then I'll show you my vases. Constance smiled. I should love to, Ernst. Have you so many rare vases? Yes, he said in a proud whisper. I have some very rare ones. I'm always afraid they will be stolen. They are my children. And he laughed, and she laughed too, while shrinking a little from him and from coming to those rooms filled with vases that were children. She did not know what more to say to Ernst, and now she told Mamma softly that old Mr. and Mrs. van der Velke, her father and mother-in-law, had asked them to Driebergen. Mrs. van Loer beamed and whispered, Child, I am so glad, I am so glad they have done that. It's been running in my head all this time what attitude they would take up to you. After all, Adrian is their grandson as well as mine. For thirteen years, Constance began bitterly. Child, child, don't bear malice. Don't bear malice. Make no more reproaches. All will come right, my child. I am so glad. They are different from us, dear. Not so broad-minded very orthodox and strict in their principles. And when, at the time they insisted that van der Velke should marry you, that was a great sacrifice on their part, child. It shattered their son's career. Why? exclaimed Constance in a whisper, but vehemently. It shattered his career. Why? Why need he have left the service? Dear, it was so difficult for him to remain after the scandal... Constance gave a scornful laugh. In that circle, where there is nothing but scandal, which they hush up. Hush, child. Don't be so violent. Don't be so irritable. I'm so glad, Connie, I could kiss those old people. I will call on them too when you have been, to embrace them. Mamma was in tears. Constance pressed her hands to her breast. She was suffocating. Very well, Mamma, she said, softly and calmly. I will be grateful, all my life long, to Papa and Mamma van der Velke, to Henry, to you, to all of you. Child, don't be bitter. Try to be a little happy now among us all. We will all try to be nice to you, and to make you forget the past. Mamma, she embraced the old woman. Mamma, don't cry. I'm happy, I really am, to be back, back among all of you. End of chapter 9、Chapter 10 of Small Souls by Louis Couperus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Two days later, van der Velke, Constance and Addy were in the train on their way to Driebergen. The boy, to whom Holland was a new country, was interested in the vague, dim, low-lying expanses bounded on the mist-blurred horizons by straggling rows of trees, with here and there a village steeple. The windmills flung out their sails like despairing arms to the great jaundiced clouds, whose gloomy masses, driven by a rainy wind, scurried across the lowering skies. The boy asked, question after question, sitting with his hand in his father's, and, to avoid the sight of that caress, Constance gazed out of the opposite window in silence. They had been to the Van Satsumas the evening before, and though Constance felt irritated at first, she ended with a passion of pity. Good heavens! How was it possible that Adolphine had become so common? Whom on earth did she get it from? Mamma, so refined and distinguished. Papa, her poor father, such an aristocrat, a gentleman of the old school, and yet, perhaps from the Roiveners, you would never have taken uncle for a brother of Mamma's. Was it from the Roiveners, perhaps? Great heavens, how common Adolphine was. Her husband was a bore. Her house pretentious and slovenly, her girls, the two elder, pretentious, priggish, envious, Marie, the youngest girl, a sort of Cinderella, but a sweet, shy, downtrodden, quiet child. But then there were the three boys, so repulsive, so slovenly, so rude. What a crew, what a crew! They had gone to take tea there quietly, but it turned out to be a sort of little evening party, a regular rabble, as van der Velke, who was furious, had said. Two men in dress coats and white ties, the others running through the entire scale of masculine attire, frock coats, dinner jackets, tweeds. Adolphine seemed always to send out ambiguous invitations, and people never knew what they should wear, nor whom they would meet. Florcher in a dirty white, low-necked dress, if you please, Caroline and Maricha, in walking dress, Van Satsuma himself looking like a fat farmer, carrying on in his noisy way with Uncle Roivener. It was all so vulgar. Aunt Roivener was always good-natured, and the girls, though very Indian-looking, were pleasant and natural and simple. But for the rest, the evening, with all sorts of strangers, was a snare, especially for van der Velke, whom, as brother-in-law, they might surely have welcomed in a more intimate and heartier fashion the first time they saw him, after refusing for years to recognise him as a member of the family. At once back in the hotel, she had had a violent scene with her husband, he abusing that rabble of a family of hers, she defending her family against her own conviction, until Addy woke, got out of bed, and begged them to be quiet, or he wouldn't be able to sleep. The darling! How prettily he had said it, in that dear little decided way of his, like a regular little man. Oh, where would they be without him? She sometimes thought, if he died, if they ever had to lose him, she would do away with herself. He was not their child, he was their treasure, their life, and she gave a glance at him. But when she saw him sitting hand in hand with his father, while van der Velke tried to make out the distant village steeples after all those years, she turned round again, quickly, with a jealous pang at her heart. Oh, she felt sorry for Adolphine. She saw in Adolphine a struggle to be in the swim, a desperate struggle, because van Satsuma had nothing but a fine-sounding name. In everything else he was an insignificant person who had great difficulty in obtaining his promotion after long years of waiting, married to Adolphine, no one knowing why she had taken him or he her. First trying to set up as an advocate and attorney at The Hague, later receiving a billet in the Ministry of Justice, but never liked by Papa and never helped on by him as Van Nagel had been, never thought much of by his superiors, now pushed into all sorts of little jobs and committees by Adolphine, trying to botch up some kind of political creed in order to stand as a candidate for the municipal council, because Adolphine, 
always jealous and envious of Bertha's importance, wanted to see her own husband coming more and more to the front, and had so little chance of realising that ideal. Yes, Adolphine must be inwardly furious when she thought of Bertha's household. Her husband, colonial secretary, after making money at the bar at Samarang, their house, a replica of the dignified, stately, paternal home of the old days, the same big dinners, the same good society, just verging on the diplomatic set. And so Adolphine gave those impossible little evenings, all sorts of persons dragged in anyhow, diversified elements that knew nothing of one another, never saw one another, were astonished to meet one another in those cramped drawing-rooms, full of faded specimens of amateur needlework and dusty macart bouquets. A rubber, a jingling duet by the girls. Next, the tables pushed aside, and suddenly, by way of a dance, a mad romp, which sent a cloud of dust flying from the carpet. Everything, everything in the same execrable taste, uninviting, and especially common, with the thick sandwiches and the sluttish maidservant, who shrugged her shoulders impertinently if the girls asked her to do a thing. Oh, Constance felt sorry for Adolphine, who was, after all, her sister, and she became aware, after years, as though it had been slumbering, of a warm family affection for all her brothers and sisters and their children. Did she inherit it from her mother, a warm family affection? She would have loved to have a friendly talk with Adolphine, to advise her to separate the different elements a little at those evenings of hers, to make her invitations less heterogeneous, and to tell Florcher not to wear a soiled ball dress on an occasion like that. And then those three boys, with their dirty hands, rushing about the crammed drawing-rooms without any idea of manners, so badly brought up compared with her Addy, who perhaps had not been brought up at all, but who was such a nice little fellow of himself, so polite, stiff though he might be, and who talked properly, and not with a splutter of low Hague slang. Oh, it was dreadful, and she was so afraid that Addy might catch some of it. Poor Adolphine, what a struggle, especially with all Bertha's unattainable perfection before her eyes. For they all suffered from jealousy in their family. She had it herself and Adolphine had always had it, very strongly developed from a child, jealous of her elder sisters and brothers. Would she ever be able to give Adolphine a word of advice? Now that Florcher's wedding was near at hand, couldn't she be of use to Adolphine? She thought it such a pity that her sister, a Van Loa after all, was becoming so common, and, after last night, she was so afraid of that wedding and it would be all the worse because Bertha's Emily was to be married about the same time, in May, a couple of months hence. In any case, she would talk to Mamma about it, not for the sake of interfering, but because Adolphine was her sister, because she cared for her as a sister, and because she had a feeling of pity for her, genuine, heart-rending pity. Mamma, what are you looking at? It was Addie's voice and she saw that the boy had come to sit by her, because it was her turn now. He always divided his favours like that, between his father and mother, for van der Velke at once took up the new Rotterdamer, and buried himself in its wide pages in his corner. "'Oh, so you've come to sit by me at last,' she whispered. "Mummy, don't be so jealous. Do you want me to chop myself in two? He talked to her, amused her. She always admired the way in which he talked, prettily, sensibly and divertingly, with a sort of talent for small talk. Very likely he had acquired it because, without him, his father and mother would have been silent when they were not quarrelling. He talked of a couple of houses which they had seen yesterday. He talked of the landscape, said it made him feel a Dutch boy at once. Wasn't it funny? And kept his mother amused like a gallant little cavalier and yet he had nothing of a dandy about him, a broad, short, firmly built little man, in a coloured shirt, a blue greatcoat and knickerbockers. He wore a soft felt hat, 
shaped like a boar hat. She did not like that hat, but he insisted on having one. But, even with that hat, how handsome he was! Oh, what a good-looking boy he was! His frank blue eyes, a little hard and grave, his fresh-coloured firm cheeks, with those refined, clear-cut features, Henry's features, his small mouth, which he loved, his square shoulders, his pretty knickerbockered legs with the square knees and the slender rounded calves. Her child, her child, he was her all in all. He was the happiness, the grace of her life. Because of him, her life was worth the living. He talked, but she saw a grave look in his eyes, a look graver than usual. Yes, she felt it. It was because of what was awaiting them in an hour's time the reception by the grandparents down there at Driebergen. Van der Velke also was nervous, did not speak a word, folded his newspaper this side and that. Constance's heart beat in her throat, which was dry and parched with nervousness, and Addie's look became more fixed, more serious than ever. Yes, she felt it. There was a tenderness in the child's voice, as though he wanted to say, Mind you, bear up, mummy. Presently. And, the nearer they approached, the quieter they became, Henry in his newspaper, she staring through the window, while Addy himself found nothing more to say, and sat quite still, with his hands in the pockets of his little greatcoat. No, she could never forget those two old people had taken thirteen years, not to accept her as their daughter, but to look upon her child as their grandchild. During all that time, not a letter, not an attempt at reconciliation, a complete silence, an absolute death towards their only son, towards their only grandson. She was not thinking of herself. She asked for no affection from them, only for cold civility. She felt so much resentment, so much resentment, that, when she thought of it, she almost choked. And... Over and above came the crushing consciousness that she had to be grateful because those parents had sacrificed their son to her, as they had once said, because they had insisted that Henry should marry her, even though it shattered his career. And that, that was what she could never forgive, because it had always wounded, because it still wounded her vanity. She would have been grateful, for her son's sake, if they had decided that Henry after a retirement of some years, relying on his influential connections, should resume his career with her by his side. De Stuffela had left the diplomatic service, was living at his country place near Harlem, and they could never have met him abroad, except by some extraordinary coincidence. No, that she would never, and never could forgive them, because of her wounded vanity. It was that which caused the bitterness that almost choked her, the sacrifice, Henry's career, shattered through her. Had she not for five years been the wife of the Netherlands minister at Rome? Had she not filled her position with tact, with grace, even with consummate knowledge of the world, until the Dutch colony praised her salons above those of the other Netherlands legations abroad? Had she not taken pride in that reputation, taken pleasure in the fact that the Dutch colony and Dutch travellers found something in her dinners and receptions that reminded them of Holland and home? How often had she not been told, Mefrau, with you, in Rome, everything is most charming, especially when compared with this place and that. Her countrymen used often to complain to her of the dullness and stiffness and exclusiveness of so many of their legations. Would she not have been in her right place by van der Velke's side, even though people might talk and cavil at first, because she, the divorced wife of a minister plenipotentiary, had afterwards married the youngest secretary in the service? But she would have shown tact. It would have been forgotten. It would have subsided into the past. She refused to believe, but, that all this would have been possible, not for anyone else perhaps, but certainly for her. And this was her grievance, that those two old people, and Henry with them, had never been able to see this as she did. 
that they had given her their son with an allowance that meant poverty, two arms for which she was expected to be grateful, but had left her and him and their child in Brussels, in a corner, like some unnameable disgrace. No, that was a thing which she could never forgive, never, never, never. She was so deep in her thoughts that she did not notice that the train had stopped and that they had arrived at Zeistriebergen. Mamma, said Addy softly. She started, turned pale, but she was resolved to control herself, to be dignified, to show those old people she was not a worthless woman, even though she had committed a mistake, a false step in her life. Very well, a sin if they pleased, because she had loved. Addy helped her to alight, and her gloved fingers trembled in his firm little hand. But she was resolved not to give way. She must keep quite calm. Yes, she would be calm and dignified above all. There's the carriage, said Henry in a stifled voice. He recognised the old carriage of years ago. He even recognised the old coachman who looked at him and touched his hat. The footman who opened the carriage door was a youth whom he did not know, and the coachman, as an old servant, bent over to him, and in a quavering voice, using the old title, said, "'Morning, Yanka. Good morning, Mefrau. "'How are you, Dirk?' said Henry, in a dull voice. They settled themselves in the carriage, and Constance saw that Henry was setting his lips, gritting his teeth, and clenching his jaws, as though with a violent effort to stop himself from crying like a child. Now and then he shivered, nervously, and stared out of the window. He recognised the villas on either side of the road, looking so melancholy in the middle of the bleak March gardens that stretched hazily in the damp mist. He noticed how much had been pulled down to make way for new houses. How changed it was! What a lot had been built lately! But there was something under those grey cloudy skies, heavy with eternal rain, in that road, in the gardens of those villas, something of the old days, something of his childhood, something of the time when he was young. He felt like an old man coming home again, he, scarcely eight and thirty. It was as though he were ashamed in the presence of the familiar, and, very secretly, too weak to accuse himself, he accused her the woman sitting beside him, the woman four years older than himself. He too was thinking of Rome now, of the rooms of the Netherlands legation, of her, then Mrs. de Staffeler, the wife of his chief, of their love affair, first in jest, then in earnest, until that terrible moment in the room where they used to meet. De Staffeler in the doorway, Constance fleeing through another door, and his interview with the injured old man who had been good to him in a fatherly fashion. And he blamed her for it. It was her fault. He was a young man then, with hardly any knowledge of the world. She, a woman of twenty-eight, married for over five years, had enticed him, had been the temptress. It was she, it was she, he blamed her for it. He had not loved her at first, during the first stages of the flirtation. There had been a chat, a waltz, a jest. Yes, then it had turned to passion, but what was passion? The flame of a moment, flaring up and then extinguished, and he knew it. From that day, when he stood as a culprit in the presence of that dignified old man, from that day the flame was extinguished, and from that day he began to see the life that lay before him, the scandal which filled all Rome, the despair of his pious parents, far away at home, in Holland. Constance in Florence, their first interview there, himself yielding to his parents' wishes and asking her to be his wife, to marry him in England as soon as the divorce was granted. Since then, he had always seen his fate hanging before him, and it had crushed him, so weak, so small. Amid the wretchedness, amid the ruin of his young life, beside that woman in whom he, who did not take blame to himself, never lost sight of the worldly wise temptress four years older than he, beside that woman, the eternal obstacle, 
and amid that wretchedness the only grace had been the child. That which might have increased the misery had been the mercy. From the first moments that he set eyes on it, little red morsel that it was, the darling child, the child that was his, though the fruit of their misery, the child that, as it grew older, became his comfort, the child that felt, with its little hands over his face and in his hair, the child that said, Daddy, the child that he smothered in his arms, the child, her child it was true, but his child also, his child, his son, growing up and soon becoming the little moderator between them, and the reason also why they remain together, the child, growing up to boyhood, and, without understanding or knowing, still feeling the eternal struggle, the eternal misery, until its eyes became more grave, and it felt that it was the moderator and the comforter. The child, there it sat, opposite him, his handsome, sturdy boy, who looked like him, with the fixed, earnest, gentle eyes. And he was now going to show him to his parents. Her child, it was true, the fruit of their misery, but his child, and their grandson. The boy glanced from his father to his mother. They both sat opposite him, and both silently looked out of the window, half turning their backs upon each other. The boy would so gladly have taken their hands, the hands of both of them, and said something, a word to unite them at this moment, which he felt to be very serious. But he did not know the word, cleverly though he knew how to talk as a rule. He glanced from his father to his mother, from his mother to his father, and they, they did not look, dared not look at him, feeling his glance, and filled to overflowing with their own thoughts. Then the boy felt life sinking very heavily, like a weight upon his small breast. He drew a very deep breath under the heavy weight, and his breath was a deep sigh. They both now looked up, looked at their child. Henry would have liked to throw out his arms, to feel his child at his heart, but the carriage now turned through a gate and drove along a front garden of rounded lawns in which the rose-bushes, swathed in straw, stood waiting for the spring. End of chapter 10Chapter 11 of Small Souls by Louis Couperus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. They stepped from the carriage. The hall door opened. The curtains of the front room shook slightly, as though with the trembling touch of an old hand. But there was no one in the hall to receive them, except the butler who had opened the door. Then Constance said, Henry! You go in first. I'll come presently with Addy, when you call me. He looked at her, hesitating to say that he himself wished to go in with Addy. But she had laid her hand on the boy's shoulder and looked at van der Velke so steadily that he understood that she would not consent. And he went in, staggering like a drunken man, went into the room where the window curtains had trembled. The butler retired, not knowing what to do, and Constance sat down on the oak settle and drew Addy beside her. So she was meekly waiting in the hall, waiting the pleasure of her father and mother-in-law, but it was of her own will that she waited now, after waiting nearly fourteen years for a word that would have called her to them. With a woman's delicacy, she had let Henry go in first to his parents, but... She had set her mind upon taking her boy to his grandparents herself. It was for her to do that. She insisted on her privilege, her right. Henry's hesitation had not escaped her, but she had laid her hand upon her son's shoulder, as though taking possession of him. She did not know how long she waited, but it seemed very long, and she had time to see every detail of the hall, the oak wainscoting, the three or four family portraits, a couple of old engravings of city views, the Delft jugs on an antique cabinet, the staircase leading to the floor above, the oak doors of the rooms which remained silent and closed. 
She saw the pattern of the tiles in the passage and the colours of the wide strip of Daventer carpet. Then at last the door of the front room opened and an old man appeared. Constance rose. The old man had Henry's features, but more deeply furrowed, and his clean-shaven upper lip fell in. His straight nose was more prominent, and his ivory forehead arched high above a scanty fringe of iron-grey hair. His eyes looked out blue and hard, as Henry's eyes looked out. He was tall, Henry was short. His shoulders were broad and bent in the long dark coat, Henry was square and straight. His hands were long, wrinkled and bony, and they trembled, and Henry's hands were short and broad. She made her comparison in two or three seconds, standing with her hand on her son's shoulder. Then the old man said, Come in, Constance. She went, gently pushing Addie before her, and they entered the room. She saw an old woman with a large face that in no way reminded her of Henry. The grey hair, parted in the middle, was set severely in a silver stiff frame. Her complexion was yellow and waxen. Her dark grey eyes were full of tears and peered painfully through that misty haze. Her figure was bent in the dark stuff dress. Her legs seemed to move with difficulty and her stooping body was almost deformed. She was holding Henry's hand. Constance, the old woman began, and her trembling hands were raised as though for an embrace. Here is your grandson, said Constance stiffly. She pushed Addy a little nearer. The boy looked out of his steady eyes, which were the eyes of Henry and of the old man, and said, How do you do, Grandpapa and Grandmama? In the large sombre room, his voice sounded dull and yet firm. The old woman and the old man looked at the boy, and there was an oppressive silence. They looked at the boy, and they were so struck with amazement that they could not find a word to say. The old woman had taken Henry's hand again, and the tears flowed from her eyes. Henry's jaws grated, and he shuddered nervously. "'That's my boy,' he said. So that is Adrian, said the old woman, trembling, and her embrace, which had not reached Constance, now closed upon the child. He kissed her in his turn, and then the old man also embraced him, and the child kissed him back. Hendrik, said the old woman, Hendrik, how like, how like Henry when he was that age? The old man nodded gently. The past was coming back to the old people, and it was as if they saw their own son when he was thirteen. They were so much surprised at this that they could only stare at the boy, as though they did not believe their eyes, as though it were some strange dream. Constance stood stiffly and said nothing, but the old woman now said, "'It's a great pleasure to us to see you here, Constance.' Constance tried to smile, you are very kind, she said pleasantly. But do sit down, said the old woman, trembling, and she pointed to the chairs. They all sat down, and Henry made an effort to talk naturally about Dreebergen. The past that lay between them was so high-heaped that it seemed as though they were never to approach one another across this obstacle. So many words that should have been spoken had remained unspoken, for the sake of an harmonious silence. That silence itself became a torture, and so many years were piled between the parents and the children that it seemed impossible for them now to reach one another with words. The words fell strangely in the sombre room which looked out upon the March garden and upon the road paling away in the vague mists. The words fell like things, strangely, like hard round things, material things, and struck against one another like marbles, clashing together. It was the painful talking on indifferent topics that was almost impossible, for the words constantly struck against things of the past, things painful to the touch, and there were no indifferent topics. 
when henry said that treebergen was very much changed he was referring to his many years of absence when constance made a remark about brussels she was referring to her long residence there during which her husband's parents had refused to see her and looked upon her as a disgrace when they spoke of Addie's life as a small child it was as though they too the father and the mother were reproaching the grandparents there were no indifferent topics and a despairing gloom hung between the old people and the child because they could not reach the child across their son and their daughter-in-law outside the wind rose howling the heavy grey clouds descended upon them like a damp mist and the rain clattered down henry had thought of asking his father to take him into the garden to see if he still recognised it but the pelting rain prevented him and he saw nothing but his mother's tears in his heart he laid these to his wife's charge the past was piled up as a wall between each soul and its neighbour the boy felt it he felt his breathing oppressed with all that gloom and again and again he wanted to sigh but he kept back his sighs he did not know what to say and he gave his grandparents the impression of a quiet subdued child who was not happy they spoke to him too as old people do to a child with condescending kindness pointing out the little things in the room the boy who was accustomed to be a man standing between his two parents answered nothing except in shy monosyllables henry and constance avoided looking at each other and each of them even in the same conversation talked as it were separately to the old people they were to stay to lunch the old-fashioned dutch coffee drinking and return at five o'clock to the hague the butler came to say that luncheon was served and pushed back the sliding doors the dining-room lay on this side of the great closed conservatory a gloomy shadow in the pale daylight that streaked in through the rain and the mahogany furniture gleamed with reflected lights the table shone white and glassy they sat down difficult words fell now and again and sounded hard in the somewhat chilly room the old woman with much ceremony offered a soft-boiled egg or a tongue sandwich which lay neatly arranged with its fellows on a tray she herself filled the small china coffee cups it all lasted very long was all very solemn and proper with much formality about the egg and the sandwich Addie felt as if he could easily swallow both the egg and the sandwich in one gulp and he had to restrain himself in order to eat the egg slowly and neatly in little spoonfuls and to chew the sandwich with little bites so as not to finish too soon nor deprive the table of its excuse for being so elaborately laid he was not sure whether he was still hungry or not when grandmamma offered him a second sandwich but he took it because otherwise he would not have known what to do with his hands he sat like a small stiff little boy shyly and when he looked up at his father it seemed to him that he too was sitting as if he had eaten his sandwich too fast grandmamma herself buttered his bread for him and offered it to him ready cut into strips he ate the narrow fingers with a great effort at self-control it lasted endlessly long and the table remained white bare and neat now that the sandwiches were finished the empty coffee cups gave the only touch of untidiness the broken yellowy eggshells grandmamma had put away on the sideboard when they rose grandpapa asked henry to come and smoke a cigar in his study grandmamma stayed in the sitting-room with constance and addy on the road outside the rain splashed in the puddles constance felt a stranger in this house nevertheless her mood became softer because the old woman's eyes in the stiff silver-framed face were still sad and constantly filled with tears she was very sensitive to any emotion in another and though she fought against it she herself felt moved she wanted to talk to this grandmother about her grandson and so she said how clever he was how good to his parents 
Mrs. van der Velke nodded good-naturedly, but continued to look upon Addy as a child, while Constance was talking of him as man. The old woman did not fully grasp the meaning of Constance's words, but the sound of them increased her emotion. She called Addy to her side, said that he must come and stay with them in the summer. It was delightful in the country then for games. The boy had it on his lips to say that his parents could not do without him, but he felt that his words would sound strange and elderly and priggish, and he only said very prettily, I should like to, Grandmamma. He played at being a little child, because Grandmamma happened to look upon him as one. Really, he was thinking of something very different, thinking of the houses which he had seen yesterday with Papa and Mamma, and which his parents could not agree upon in any particular, the neighbourhood, the division of the rooms. Because he knew that the hotel was expensive, and that both Papa and Mamma would become less fidgety once they had a house, he thought of cutting the Gordian knot and going by himself to the owner of a nice house near the woods, not so very far from Granny Van Lower's. If he didn't interfere, it would be weeks and weeks before Papa and Mamma made up their minds. He knew that to take a house was a very serious matter, but he also knew that Papa and Mamma would never agree. He must needs, therefore, risk something, and he would hope for the best, hope that all would turn out well. A couple of houses farther on. There are two very nice little boys. You shall see them when you come in the summer, Adrian. Yes, Grandmamma. His voice sounded very refined and soft, and Constance had to smile. But while he sat there stiffly, with his shoulders squared and his legs close together, he was dividing the rooms of the house near the woods. Mamma, meanwhile, was exchanging toilsome words with Grandmamma. He portioned out the rooms. Downstairs, the drawing-room and the dining-room, more or less as at Uncle Gerrit's. Those two rooms always communicated in Holland, with folding doors between them. And the little conservatory. And the little garden was quite nice. Upstairs, the large room for Mamma and the smaller one for Papa. And it was jolly that he himself could have that sort of turret-room with a bow-window in between their two bedrooms so he would be between papa and mamma. Above that, there was still a sort of attic floor, but that did not concern him. Mamma must manage that. It was rather risky, perhaps, to go to that fat man tomorrow, a contractor papa called him, and tell him that papa had sent him to say that he would take the house. Perhaps that house in the something van Nassaustraat was better, bigger, but it was dearer also. Perhaps Papa would be angry if he acted just like that of his own bat. But, of course, there would be nothing settled in black and white. Only if Papa and Mamma once knew that he had been to the fat man, well, they might be a little angry at first, might squabble a bit more, and then both of them would look at him and laugh, and they would take the house, and everything would be all right. If they did not decide a bit quicker, if they went on squabbling... Their Brussels furniture would suddenly be there in front of their noses, and they without a house to put it in. It was true, Granny Van Loa had said, be careful about taking a house. That was all very well when people agreed. But that's what Papa and Mamma never did. They had come to Holland because he had said, why, I'm a Dutch boy, aren't I? Then let's go. Well, they would take the house after he had been to the fat man. There was nothing else to be done though it was risky. Papa came downstairs with Grandpapa, looking more cheerful. Perhaps he had been talking to his father. They sat on a little longer, and Papa took out his watch once or twice. Then the carriage drove up. The old coachman, who had known Papa as a small boy, drove them to the station, where they arrived twenty minutes too soon. Quietly, without speaking, they walked up and down, waiting for the train. End of chapter 11。二十一日、今日は、アディ・ウェンツ・プレイ・ウィッド・アンコル・ヘリッツ・アンタ・アデリンズ・チルドレン
and thought it very jolly to romp about like that with six or seven little boy and girl cousins, the oldest a girl of eight years, and the youngest a baby ten months old. He amused himself in a fatherly fashion with all these youngsters, inventing new games and causing a certain sensation as a big new strong cousin of thirteen. The whole morning, however, he was thinking of the fat man to whom he had been very early to say that papa would probably take the house and would like him to call at the Hotel des Andes at seven o'clock that evening. He had gone on to Uncle Gerrit's from there and in his heart thought it rather a bore, for after all, he must prepare papa and mamma for the visit of the fat man who was to bring a draft of the lease with him. So, after eating a sandwich at Aunt Adeline's, he played a little longer with the children who were not going out because it was raining, and, soon after, hurried to the Alexanderstraat to Granny Van Loer's, where he knew that he would find Mamma. Constance was sitting with her mother and telling her about Papa and Mamma van der Velke and how they had received her. Uncle Paul was there. Addy, a little nervous, asked where Papa was, where Papa had gone that afternoon. Papa went to look at a couple of houses in the nassau dillenburg Straat. Did you enjoy yourself at Uncle Gerrit's? Oh, yes. They are nice little things. What are you doing this afternoon, Mamma? I shall stay on a little with Granny, and then we are both going to Uncle and Aunt Roivener's. Will you come too, Addy? Well, I really want to talk to Papa. She was jealous at once. You can never be a moment without your father. What does it mean? I haven't seen you the whole morning, and the first thing you do is to ask for Papa. I don't know where Papa is. Papa has an appointment, I believe, at the Vitter Club, where he was to meet some old friends. But you can't go to the Vitter. Isn't Papa coming back to dinner at the hotel? I believe Papa intended to stay and dine at the Vitter, but I really don't know. I'm not in the habit of controlling Papa's movements. He looked at her thoughtfully. I must absolutely see Papa before seven o'clock, Mamma. But why before seven o'clock? Is there anything you want? Won't I do? Don't I count at all? Yes, he said, when you're not so cross. The owner of the house in the Kirkhoff Lahn, near the woods, is coming to call before seven. How do you know? I went to him this morning on my way to Uncle Gerrit's. Well? And I told him Papa would probably take the house and asked him to come to the hotel at seven o'clock and bring a draft of the lease with him. He suddenly became very uncomfortable because his grandmother and his uncle sat staring at him. But, Addy, said Granny Van Loer, not quite understanding, how did you come to do that? Did Papa tell you to go? No, Granny, Papa said nothing about it, but it's a very nice house indeed, and if Papa and Mamma could only agree, I wouldn't interfere. But, as it is, I really must. Otherwise the furniture will be here from Brussels, and Papa and Mamma still looking for a house, each in a different part of the town. He talked fluently, but he was very uncomfortable, and his face was as red as fire, for it was plain that Granny did not yet understand, and Uncle Paul sat shaking with laughter and trying to pull him between his knees, and this was no moment for romping. Oh, don't, Uncle Paul, please. But Paul laughed and shook him by the shoulders, and Grandmamma frowned, and yet it was really very simple, and Mamma thought so too, for she said calmly, Oh, you went to that house, did you? The one near the woods. How many rooms did we say there were? There are two rooms opening on to each other on the ground floor, said Addy, standing with a serious face between Paul's knees. Upstairs you can have the big bedroom, and Papa the smaller one, with a little room next to it as a smoking room, and then I should like that turret room, with the bow window, you know. Yes, but, Addy, the house in Emmerstraat has bigger rooms. It is farther from Granny, and two hundred guilders dearer, so put the house in Emmerstraat out of your mind. Granny Van Loer sat, looking before her, in dumb amazement. Paul listened attentively, and Constance and Addy continued to discuss the merits and demerits of the two houses. 
There's a big cellar in the house near the woods, and a nice little garden. Do you remember? And I think it jolly to be close to the woods. Yes, but, Addy, it seems to me that in the Emmerstraat... Do put that house out of your mind, Mamma. It's damp. And the contractor is coming, you say? Yes, at seven o'clock. Mamma van Loer could only sit and stare at her daughter and her grandsons by turns. Paul burst into a fresh roar of laughter at the sight of his mother's face. Yes, mother, these are the times we live in. I never dared take a house for you. Now did I? Constance, for the first time, appeared to realise that Addie must seem a little queer to her mother. Oh, he's always like that, she said. He helps us. He's a man, aren't you, my man? He now went up to her and kissed her to please her. So you see, I must find papa before seven o'clock, or he'll be angry, he said, keeping to the point. Well, shall we go round to the Vitter together? asked Paul. Oh, uncle, that would be awfully good of you. But I can't take you in, old chap. No, uncle, I'll wait outside, if you'll just look for papa and tell him I want to speak to him. "'About a house you've taken for him. "'No, don't be silly, Uncle. "'Good-bye, Constance. "'Good-bye, Mamma. "'I'm going with my nephew Addy to the Vitter. "'And Paul stood up, choking with laughter, "'while Addy, afraid of missing his father, "'urged him to hurry. "'But, my dear,' asked Mrs. Van Loer, "'does your boy always take the law into his own hands like that?' Oh, Mamma, he's such a help to us. But what a way to bring him up. That's not a boy of thirteen. He's a very uncommon child. Where should we be if he didn't help us? So you think van der Velke will take the house near the woods? I'm sure of it, and I'm quite sure, too, that if Addy hadn't interfered, in another six months we should still be at the hotel. Next day... Van der Velke, Constance and Addy went to have one more look at the house near the woods, and the house was taken on a five years lease. End of chapter 12「Chapter 13 of Small Souls by Louis Couperus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. While Constance went in and out of the shops on her numberless errands, Paul never left her side. "'You see,' he said, glad to have someone to listen to him for the first time in his life, "'what I call human wretchedness is not confined to the social question, but exists everywhere, everywhere. Look around you, in the street. It's raining, and people are walking under dripping umbrellas.' Look at those women in front of us. Wet skirts, muddy shoes, worn at heel, splashing through the puddles. That is human wretchedness. Look at that man over there. Fat stomach, squinting eyes, gouty fingers clutching a shabby umbrella handle. That is human wretchedness. Everything that is ugly, squalid, muddy, drab, abnormal from any one point of view is human wretchedness. Look at all those shops where you buy, or don't buy, trashy manufactured things that have blood clinging to them, things which you are now pretending that you need for your house. That is human wretchedness. It is all ugly, and the trail of a morbid civilization shows through it all. Look around you at those big lying letters, those gaudy posters. That is human wretchedness. One cheats the other, and the whole thing has become such a matter of system that nobody is really taken in. It's the same with politics and religion as with a pound of sugar or a box of throat lozenges. It is all humbug and human wretchedness, and it drags on, piecemeal through any average human life. It is all squalid, vulgar, insincere, selfish, ugly, and full of human wretchedness. You think me a pessimist. Far from it. I am an idealist. In my own mind, I see everything in a rosy light. My power of imagination is so strong 
that I see everything white and gold and blue, like the marble statues of ancient temples with their blue sky and golden sun. But when I take leave of my imagination, then I see that everything is human wretchedness. Wars, politics, the fat stomach of our friend yonder, the rain, and those pots and pans which you're wanting for your kitchen. All life, high and low, general and individual, in the masses and in the classes, is squalid, ugly, insincere, and full of human wretchedness. Look at that creature over there. What a miserable object. She's knock-kneed, her nose is a yard long, and the reason why she's in this filthy street is absurd. You think I don't know what I'm talking about, but I do. You never see anything beautiful except at the theatre, or in a book, or in a picture, or an etching, or in a great writer taking up his pen in defence of some outcast, as Zola did. But even then, there is very little, and I at once see the human wretchedness through it all, the pose, the affectation, even that of soberness, the ambition to succeed or to imitate someone or other. No one has a pure thought for purity's sake, except a fellow like Zola. There's no beauty anywhere. Have you ever noticed, in a train or in a tramcar, or at a theatre, all those stupid, ugly faces, those crooked bodies, either too fat or too thin, one with a blink like this, another with a squint like that, this one with little hairs in his ears, and that one with hands that make you sick? I don't know if you understand me, but all of this, with politics and the social question, and those swarms of fat stomachs like our friends just now. All of this is what I call human wretchedness. I may write a book about it some day, but perhaps my book itself would be merely human wretchedness. In the meantime, he had been following his sister into three shops, one after the other, and she had managed to make her purchases in between his philosophizings. Whenever he saw his chance, he went on speaking, walking aslant beside her, and talking into her ear, constantly having to move off the narrow pavements of the Hochstraat and Venestraat, losing her for a moment, because they were separated by a couple of carriages going at a footpace, but soon catching her up again, and he never lost the thread of his thoughts. I see that you have never reflected much, just like most women. What I say is quite new to you. You have not even observed much. You should observe. You should note all the queer things and people about you. Not that you and I ourselves are not queer and behave queerly. We can't help it. We too stumble along in our human wretchedness. But in your boy, it was quite attractive. I saw something funny, and yet he was very serious. Much too serious for a child. Your boy, your boy is certainly a man of the future. Sometimes you see a thing like that in a child. Then you say to yourself, he'll be this, he'll be that, he'll be the other, later on when he grows up. Do you follow me? No, I see you don't follow me. It's just your motherly vanity that feels flattered. Oh, how small you are. That is your human wretchedness. Don't you see the sunniness in your boy? No, you don't see it. I saw it at once. It was most attractive. Not one of Bertha's or Gerrit's or Adolphine's children has it. I can't explain it to you, you know, if you don't understand. Yes, Sissy, life is not gay. You are forty-two, and I am only thirty-five, but I find it's no gayer than you do. I see through everything too clearly. I should never be able consciously to join in anything that's had to do with human wretchedness to join in rushing after an unnecessary object. That is why I do nothing except observe. I'm a dilettante, you see. My income is enough to live on, and I loathe myself for playing the capitalist with a bit of money like that, like the middle classes. But I can't help it, you know. I ought to have been rich, very rich. I should have planted a castle on a mountain top, amid the whiteness of the Alps and I would have done a great deal to mend human wretchedness, but I would not have had it around me. I hate it so. 
I turn sick at the smell of a beggar, and meantime my heart breaks, and I feel it a physical compassion for the poor devil. It's the fault of my stomach or my nerves. They simply turn. It's very unfortunate when you're built that way. How do you like my new overcoats with the velvet turn-back cuffs? They're rather neat, aren't they? Pity they're getting wet. But it's good velvet. It doesn't spoil. And yet yesterday, I was really alarmed when I saw my back in two looking-glasses. I had no idea that I had such a rotten back, a back full of human wretchedness, in spite of my fine overcoat. The line went like that, with a sort of hump. It was terrible. It upset me for all the rest of the day. Then, in the evening, I sat down at my piano and played Isolde's Liebestod, and then it all passed. You can't make your little brother out, eh? A mad chap, you think? What? Yes, I am. Almost the maddest of the bunch. Bertha is very well balanced. Only her eyes are always blinking. Carol, what he might have become, I don't know. But now he is a round naught, kept in equilibrium by the roundness of Cato with her owl's eyes. Then you have a credit. He looks well balanced, but isn't, puts on a jovial and genial air, and is a melancholy dreamer all the time. You don't believe it. You'll see it for yourself when you know him better. Next come you. Well, you yourself tell me you've had a strange life with your two husbands. After that, they all go downhill. Ernst behaves very oddly. Doreen, too, is sometimes queer, with that everlasting trotting about. And I look at all their queerness, and have a tile loose myself. So you think we are a very sensible family. My dear Constance, we have a great crack, running right through us, slanting like that. But we are nice people, and we don't let the world know. You wait, you'll see. And now, Sissy, here's your tram, and here I leave you. He helped her in, and she saw him walk away under his umbrella, carefully drying with his handkerchief the velvet turn-back cuffs of his new overcoat. End of chapter 13「Fourteen of Small Souls by Louis Couperus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Those were busy days at the Van Nagels, full of all kinds of excitement. Emily was to be married in three weeks, and in a fortnight Van Nagel and Bertha expected their son Otto back from India with his young wife and their two children. Otto had taken his degree early married and gone to Java at twenty-four with a billet in the civil service, but he was unable to stay because his wife had fallen ill on the day of their arrival at Batavia, and she had been ill ever since. It annoyed Van Nagel to see his son's career interrupted, even though he was still young, and Van Nagel could easily find him another appointment in Holland. But he had always been against this match, a delicate Dutch girl with no money, they would have to take charge of the children in Holland, and though he was well off, though his wife had some money of her own, though he had his salary as a minister, it was, all told, scarcely enough for the very expensive establishment which they kept up. The eldest son on his way home from India, with his wife and two children, two boys, France and Henry, who had been at Leiden for over two years, and who were obviously in no hurry to take their degrees, three girls who were all out, the second of whom was now going to be married, another boy of sixteen, and a girl of fourteen, their salon, to gratify Van Nagel's ambition, an official salon, a meeting-place for members of the higher government circles, while the diplomatic set just passed through it. So expensive an establishment from first to last, that Bertha had to work miracles of economy to keep things going on fifty thousand guilders more or less a year. And everything was growing dearer. The two boys, France and Henry, cost almost three times as much as Otto had cost. Emily and Marianne, 
of whom the former had been out three years and the other just one, had much grander ideas in every way than Louise, who had been out six. The boys at Sliden were both to take part in the mask this year. Emily was receiving a trousseau that cost three times as much as the one which Bertha had had in her day from Papa and Mamma Van Lure. Marianne must have her simplest dresses lined with silk. Carol, the schoolboy, a tall, thin, weakly lad, but nevertheless a member of all sorts of football, cricket and tennis clubs, had an allowance for pocket money that was positively ridiculous, and Bertha saw tendencies in her youngest girl that made her anxious for the future. And so, outwardly, it was a great house full of movement. Papa a minister, the girls presented at court, the boys spending money lustily, and inwardly there was many a despondent conversation between Van Nagel and Bertha as to how they could possibly economise. Of course, Otto must be helped first. The boys, of course, must take their degrees first. The girls, of course, were bound to go out, and Carol, of course, was obliged to keep up his football and cricket clubs. They might give one dinner less each winter, but that was really the only thing, and, if the boys, after taking their degrees, were to cost as much money as Otto was costing now, if Louise and Marianne also got married and had to have the same trousseau as Emily, if it was to go on like that, always and always, with never a moment for taking breath and saving a little, then they did not know what they were to do, for, let Bertha calculate as much as she pleased, the thing was not to be done on fifty thousand guilders a year. Then, if Van Nagel lost his temper, he reproached Bertha, saying that it was all her fault, that she was a Van Loer, that the Van Loers had never been able to calculate, that the Van Loers' own housekeeping had been run on much too extravagant a scale in the old days. But Bertha, blinking her eyes unmoved, reminded him that he owed his career to Papa Van Loer, to Papa's connections in the years following upon his term as Governor-General, when he still had a great deal of influence in Holland, and she showed him her housekeeping accounts, in which she had carefully made the different entries, telling him that, if he absolutely insisted upon living on the scale they did, it could not be done for less, with the best will in the world. And, seeing no way out of it, they made friends again and did not mention the subject of money for another month. And outwardly, it was the regular household of a minister of state, full of solid Dutch comfort, with a tinge of modernity superadded, the children very much up to date, but the parents, nevertheless, sensible people of weight and distinction, quite aware how far they themselves could go and how far they could let the children go. The real position was not even suspected by a soul. Bertha never spoke to anybody, not even to her mother, of anything that had the faintest connection with money. To their relations and friends, the house in the Bezoudenhout spread its broad fronts with such an air of solid dignity, the staircases, the drawing-rooms and dining-room with their stately handsome furniture, the children's rooms, more modern in style, but still with no flimsy affectation of tawdry elegance, all made so great an impression of imperishable prosperity that no one could ever have suspected that the two parents sometimes sat reckoning up for hours at a time to see whether they could reduce their expenses by as much as a thousand guilders that month. In this house of theirs, notwithstanding all the bustle, the dinners, the approaching wedding, the approaching homecoming of the eldest son, for whom a set of rooms was being prepared on the top floor. Everything seemed to go so methodically, without any trouble, busily it is true, but quite harmoniously, that no one would ever have suspected the least difficulty. Mamma Van Loer was constantly at Bertha's during these days, and even neglected Constance a little, but she loved this bustle, the alterations on the top floor, the fuss about the trousseau, the rehearsals of the wedding theatricals, the long tables to be laid, the flowers to be arranged, the visits to be discussed. 
dresses brought home, the undergraduates constantly at the Hague, noisy, merry and young. The old woman loved all this. It reminded her of her own house in the old days. It was like a repetition of her young life. Only, she thought, she herself had often worried about money, even though Van Loa had been able to save during his term as Governor-General. And Bertha was so entirely without financial cares. How delightful that was! And she, as the grandmother, also interested herself in Emily's trousseau. She gave her advice, and never thought about money. She slowly climbed the stairs to the top floor to see the nursery which had been got ready for her two great-grandchildren on the way home from India, proud of that fourth generation, delighting in that large family, that busy household, all that movement which she missed so greatly in her own house, where her quiet life was interrupted only by those family gatherings every Sunday evening. Yes, she loved being with Van Nagel and Bertha. She loved to see her son-in-law take a prominent place in society, as her husband had done in his time. She loved the solid, dignified official house, and the modernity of the children, although now and again she would shake her head in disapproval, made her smile for all that, because she thought that people must go with the times and that Van Nagel and Bertha were very sensible not to hold the reins too tightly. It was true, there were manners which she did not like, that going out of young girls alone, letting themselves in at night with their latch-keys. But then, it was only to a few personal friends, said Bertha, and it was impossible to make other arrangements. Yes, the old woman loved being here, in the house of her eldest daughter, and though she cared for all her children, because they were her children, she felt more in her element at Bertha's than in the comfortable, middle-class, selfish house of Carol and Cato, whom she blamed for having no children. And though she also liked Gerrit and Adeline's younger household, with the children ranging from eight years down to ten months, a troop of fair-haired mites, things were too simple and every day for her there did not remind her of her ancient splendours. She could not stand Gerrit sometimes, when he made fun of his old mother for mentioning, quite casually, that she had met the Russian envoy at Bertha's. And going to Adolphine and Van Satsuma's always vexed her. It was as though she did not recognise her child in Adolphine, with her badly arranged common house, and Adolphine so bitter and so envious and jealous of Bertha, especially now that Florcher was engaged, and her trousseau, of course, could not be as fine as Emily's. Yes, she went to Adolphine's and discussed the trousseau there also, but she did not care about it, not because it was simple, a trousseau could be very nice in spite of that, but because Adolphine was always so spiteful, with her perpetual, yes, that's good enough for us, but of course it's Bertha's. She felt herself a mother to all her children. Had she a favourite? She thought not, but she was very fond of going to Bertha's, because she found her own past there. And what the old woman loved above all things in Bertha's house was the mutual sympathy, the family affection which she had always fostered in her own house, which she still fostered, thanks to the institution of those Sunday evenings, to keep the children together at all costs. Yes, in Van Nagel and Bertha, that sentiment, that constant thought for the children was very strong, and there was one thing which Mamma Van Loa had not done, and which Bertha was doing, which was to receive the son again, after he had once left the house, now that he was returning with a sick wife and two little children. It touched her. Oh, how good they were to their tribe! and what a thousand pities that that little dull wife was so ill. And the children, too, had that same family affection among themselves. Otto had always kept up a busy correspondence with his eldest sister, Louise, who was twenty-five, and came next to him in age. The two Leiden boys were exceedingly nice to their three fashionable little sisters, and Henry was even a little bit jealous because Emily was engaged. 
only carol was perhaps rather too much out of doors and away from the family circle for so young a boy with all his clubs and his importance and because of that maricha the youngest girl of fourteen was left a good deal alone and yet they all liked maricha her big brothers the other girls yes that was the charming thing with all those children the family affection the fondness for one another the pride in the names of van loa and van nagel the refusal to suffer any outsider to say a word against a member of the family even though criticism was not spared within the home itself but that any acquaintance should dare to reflect upon a member of the family that they would none of them permit they had felt that fondness that tenderness even for constance because she was a sister and the old lady remembered in so far as concerned constance the philosophical reflections of her youngest son paul the trouble which doreen had taken to assemble all the brothers and sisters on that first sunday evening the ready compliance of all her children for out of respect to her none of them had criticised that erring sister in front of her she saw it in all of them the family affection for one another they all felt themselves to be brothers and sisters they stood up for one another even though there were differences of opinion sometimes and even jealousy they felt united within the family circle that was the crowning glory of her old age as a mother and grandmother it represented to her a beautiful idea a natural ideal an illusion attained a comfort for the peaceful declining years of the lonely woman in her big house that she preferred to be lonely in her big house and would not have doreen nor ernst nor paul to live with her was an eccentricity which in no way detracted from her cult of the beautiful idea from her perfect happiness at seeing the ideal realized the illusion attained she had a happy old age she had also had much sorrow in her big household in spite of all her splendour but not more than her natural share money troubles because neither van loer nor she was economical two children lost one after the other while constance's false step was certainly a very heavy blow under which she suspected that van loer had really succumbed suffering silently and incessantly because of the grief which his favourite daughter had caused him but she though she too had suffered had shown greater elasticity had not counted all that sorrow for more than her human lot such as might befall any large household and that she now in her extreme old age had all her children gathered about her in the same town in a close family circle in an affectionate family life this she considered a great happiness she thanked god for it she had no more religion of the church-going kind than was held to be correct in her circle which was very different from the orthodox calvinistic circle of a few old hague families but she was grateful to god in her heart she thanked god for her happiness for her happy old age all was well now that she had constance back also back with the others at the hague next to boutensoch the hague had always been to her the ideal place of residence the court was there and her husband had taught her to love splendour there was an atmosphere of official eminence in their circle in which she took pleasure as in an element that had become natural to her and in which van nagel and bertha had also attained their distinction and their high position carol had returned to the hague after burgomastering elsewhere and in him she had her son back although in her secret heart she did not like cato gerrit who had been a subaltern at deventer and venlo was now a captain at the hague and the other children had never left the hague she had always been able to keep them round her she was happy and she was not unthankful she was even thankful that otto was returning although the reason his wife's illness was a sad one because she would see her great-grandchildren they were her first she felt a new joy because of them an unknown emotion 
She had felt something like it when Otto himself was born, her first grandchild, but now that feeling was almost more intense, perhaps because it was a fourth generation, a continuation of the family, even though they were Van Nagels and not Van Loers. She was a woman. She did not care so much about the name. Bertha was her daughter, Otto her grandson, his children, her grandchildren. She traced them back in this way to herself, and the sound of the name mattered less to her. They were her children, her grandchildren, her great-grandchildren, and she loved them all, with one great love, with a clannish love. That she lived alone in her big house was because she was old, and could bear bustle only when it was expected, when she could prepare for it. The Sunday evenings were bustling, but they did not tire her. But to have Paul or Doreen living with her, to be for ever hearing them going in and out, would have worked on her nerves. She wandered daily through all the rooms of the big house to see if everything was tidy and in its place. Doreen was slovenly, and Paul was anything but easy to get on with. And Ernst, with his collection of curiosities, she would never be able to have with her, because she was afraid of all the microbes that hang about those old things. But nevertheless, she loved them all, and she was glad that they lived at The Hague, and that she saw them regularly. She was like that, and no otherwise. And she now came, every day to Bertha's, waiting for Otto and his children, until Constance grew jealous and reproached her, saying that she never came to her new house near the woods. End of chapter 14「Chapter 15 of Small Souls by Louis Couperus – This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Van Nagels gave an evening party at the Oude Doolen Hotel, two days subsequently to the signing of the marriage contract between Emily and Van Raven, a dinner for relations and intimate friends of nearly a hundred covers. After that the young people were to do some theatricals and after that there was a dance. Dinner was over, and Adolphine asked Uncle Roivener, "'Were you at their dinner party two nights ago?' "'What dinner party?' "'The day before yesterday, after the contract. They gave a dinner at their house. About sixty people. Only their smart friends and their court set. We were not asked. Mamma went, but none of the brothers and sisters.' "'I did not even know there was a dinner.' We called in the afternoon to congratulate the bride and bridegroom. Well, that evening they gave their grand affair. Tonight is only a small party for us and the ragtag of their acquaintance. The other night Bertha wore a low-neck dress and a train. Tonight she has a high frock. Uncle laughed. Yes, he said. These parties at hotels are always scratch affairs. The dinner was only so-so. Regular hotel food. Hmm, the champagne was good, said Uncle, who had drunk his fill. How badly Van Nagel spoke. Does he speak as badly as that when he introduces his Indian budget? And what a figure Van Raven's mother cuts. She looks like I don't know what. Still, they're smart people. Yes, of course they're smart, or Bertha would never have seized upon him for her daughter. He's a fast creature, that future nephew of mine and how Emily hangs on to him. If Lorcher hung on to Dykerhof like that, I should give her a good talking to when we got home. Emily behaves just like a street girl. Uncle was in a good humour because he had had plenty to drink. He was puffing a bit and would have liked to undo a button of his waistcoat. That dress waistcoat of his was getting rather tight for him. How pretty Florcher is looking, Adolphine. That white suits her. She laughed happily. She felt flattered. Yes, doesn't it? It makes Emily look so pale. Mama Van Loer passed on Otto Van Nagel's arm. Is Francis better, my boy? Yes, Granny. She's pretty well today, but she gets tired so soon. He was tall and thin with a scowl above his hard Van Loer eyes. 
his grandfather's eyes. His two years in Java had made him so bitter that it was painful for his grandmother and his parents to listen to him. What a pity, Otto, that you had to leave India. Oh, bah, Granny, what a country. It's all very well for you to talk. You know India as the wife of a resident and as the wife of the Governor-General. But for young people, starting life. Papa would have helped you, you know. A lot of help Papa could have given. A beastly country. A dirty, wretched country. But Otto, I thought it delightful. No doubt in your palace at Bautenzor. That goes without saying. But were you ever clerk to the magistrates at Rankas Betong? No. No, of course not. And that's with a wife who topples over like a ninepin twice a week with the heat, flat on the floor. Otto. Oh, come, Grandmamma. It's the most confounded, beastly, filthy country I ever was in. We had much better sell those colonists to England. She'll only take them from us one day if we don't. Otto. Really, I'm not used to this language. Oh, yes, Granny. I know all that official bombast about India, but we can't all be Governor-General or Colonial Minister. If I ever become that, I shall begin to worship India at once. You are upset because Francis is ill. Ill? Ill? It takes a woman to be ill. She's not even that. She's a reed. If you blow upon her, she breaks. She was a delicate little thing as a girl, Otto. Well, but look here, Granny. I can't turn her into a robust little thing, can I? For shame, Otto. Don't be so bitter. You've got two darling little children. Yes, children. I wish I hadn't. I'm sorry for the poor little devils. Is the show beginning now? Tableau vivant, arranged by dear old Louise. A play without words by France and Henri. Stale things, these wedding parties, always. I thought I was insufferable. My dear Otto, you're in an intolerable humour. I'm always like that now, Granny. Then I strongly advise you to exercise a little self-control, or you will never have any happiness in life, in your own, or your wife's, or your family's. The family doesn't affect my happiness. What do you mean, Otto? Why, I don't live and move and have my being in my family, Granny. Oh, really, my boy, you're too horrid. Take me back to my seat. I see your mother beckoning to me. She wants me to sit between her and Aunt Reuvener. The performance is beginning. Yes, Cato was whining to Van Satsuma, Van der Velke and Karel. An evening party of sixty people, and the Russian minister was there, and the mistress of the robes. Well, after all, if they have so many acquaintances, said Karl under his breath, by way of excuse. Yes, but Karl, none of the family. Van der Velke, were you invited by chance? No. Oh, not you either. Well, I should have thought that she would have asked Constance. Why? asked van der Velke coldly. Well, because she used to go to courts in the old days. And you too, didn't you, van der Velke? Yes, I too, said van der Velke dryly. Van der Velke, said Karel, did you get that card of mine? What card? Why, when you were expected in town, I called and left a card on you. So did I, you know, van der Velke, interrupted van Satsuma. Oh, yes, said van der Velke. It was very civil of you fellows. Well, I'll leave a card on you one of these days. Oh, I didn't mention it for that, said van Satsuma. I didn't mention it on that account, echoed Karel, swelling with geniality. Only I should have thought it a bore if it had been mislaid. Yes, whimpered Cato, because then... It would have looked as if we weren't friendly. How red the bride looks, Satsuma. That white makes Emily look so very red. Yellow, rather, said Van Satsuma. Yes, droned Cato. Now your flaucher, Satsuma, looks so sweet in white. And what a nice fellow Dykehove is. Such a thorough man. 
but how pale Bertha looks. Green, rather, said van der Velke, very seriously. Cato looked up with her owl's eyes. Green, she repeated cautiously. Do you really think Bertha looks green, van der Velke? Yes, she is tired, no doubt. Tomorrow, thought van der Velke, all the Hague will know that I thought Bertha looked green. A tableau was discovered in the distance. The idea was Paul's, and he explained it to Constance. You see, it represents luxury. The great wheel crushing down upon Maricha and Carolincha is industry, and Florcha is luxury, standing in a dancing attitude on industry, and scattering golden ropes of pearls at tuppence a rope. It's not quite clear, perhaps, luxury standing upon industry and crushing Marianne and Carolincha. Florcha is fidgeting and giggling. Oh, I must tell you, Adolphine was delighted when she heard that Florcha, her Florcha, was to be luxury, and to crush Bertha's Marianne. Constance, surrounded by all her family, was in a gentle, happy mood. Oh, Paul, it's a very nice motherly feeling on Adolphine's part to like to see her child happy before another. Paul spluttered with laughter. So you think that Florcher is happy as luxury on the top of Marianne, and that Marianne suffers badly underneath? Connie, how sentimental you are tonight, and what silly things you say. But you're looking very nice. Come, let's go and sit down here. Your hair is turning grey, but I have an idea that you leave it untouched for some coquettish reason, because it goes so well with your young features. It's a very pretty shade of grey. It's not old hair, but you're young still, you know, and you're looking nice, very nice. I believe you're making fun of me. I love good-looking people, and one sees so few of them. Just glance round the room, all ugly people. One walks crooked, another has a stoop. This one's bust sticks out for miles. That one has a fat stomach. I can't stand parts of the body that bulge. It makes me sick to look at them. Yes, to be accurate, nearly everybody's ugly. Do you know, if you were to take all the heroines out of all the novels in the world, you'd just get one heap of pretty women. No novelist ever dares to take an ugly, squinting, crooked or hump-backed heroine. If I were a rich man, I'd offer a prize for a hideous heroine. Yes, look at Aunt Lot and he imitated Mrs. Rivener's Indian accent, glittering with diamonds, and her two hands patting her brown satin stomach, another stomach, and I can't stand stomachs. But good-natured all the same is Auntie. Look at Uncle. He's unbuttoned his waistcoat, the rude fellow. Have you noticed my waistcoat, Connie? It's white drill. It's very smart. I say, Connie, look at Mamma. What a grand old woman, the way she walks, laughs and talks. Now that's something like. You see at once that she's a great lady. Look at old Mrs. Friesa Stein beside her. Common, noisy, spiteful, a figure like a charwoman's. Hideous, hideous. Look at Ernst, Connie. Would you ever believe that he was a brother of mine? Just like an old Jew. And what a dress coat, what a dress coat. Where on earth did the beggar get it cut? He spends all his money on jugs and vases. Look at Gerrit, Connie. He's pretending to be gay again. The jolly hussar, with a broad chest all over lace frogs. Poor fellow, he's dying of melancholy. You don't believe me. It's true, I assure you. Look at Adolphine, Connie. Just like a bird talking slander. Pip, pip, pip. How Bertha's ears must tingle. Great heavens, those eyes of Bertha's, always blinking. She ought to have something done to them. Look at Doreen, Connie. She always looks repulsive. As a matter of fact, Connie, there are only two good-looking people in the room, Mamma and yourself. And you, Paul? Your husband has a good figure too. He has an attractive back. I have an eye for nice backs. I don't like my own back, and yet my coat sits well, doesn't it? A dress coat is a very tricky thing. Nowadays there is hardly a tailor who can cut a good dress coat. Yes, 
My waistcoat is very smart. Just look at it. The buttons are smart, aren't they? They are uncut sapphires. Yes, you have a smart little brother. Come, take my arm and let's walk round the room. Have you heard? They're all furious, the Reuveners, the Satsumas, Carol and Cato, because they were not asked to the first party. The idea was to give it before the signing of the contract, but Otto's arrival came and upset it. He's another failure, that Otto, with his little tissue-paper wife. Look at those Van Ravens, Connie. They're hanging on for all they're worth to Van Nagel and Bertha, lest they should be degraded at being seen with the Satsumas. Tell me, Connie, are you glad to be back? Are you really fond of all these relations? I don't believe I have that family affection which you and Mamma have, and Bertha and Doreen. Bertha has it in her own house. Doreen and Mamma go scattering kindnesses broadcast over all the children and grandchildren. I say, Connie, this is what people call enjoying themselves, because two of them are going to get married. But look all around. There's not a soul really enjoying himself. And that's what Van Dachel and Bertha spend a couple of thousand guilders on, giving them some dinner and a dance and letting them gaze at my luxury, with Florcher dancing on top of Marianne. Look at those faces. No one is naturally cheerful. Nature, nature, Connie. There's no such thing as nature among people like ourselves. We have not a gesture, not a word. Not even a thought that is natural. It is all pose and humbug with every one of us, and nobody is taken in by it. Really, it's a disgusting business, a society like ours, what one calls good society. Can't you understand an anarchist loving to fling a bomb into the midst of us? For instance, at Uncle Reuven's stomach. No anarchist likes a stomach. The stomach is the trademark of the bourgeois. Now they're going to dance. Look how hideously they're spinning round the room, just like palsied sparrows. We human beings are much too solemn and heavy to dance with any grace. Look, it's almost ghastly. Through all that pretense at elegance and smartness and dancing and gaiety, you can see that one has a stomach ache and another a headache, that Van Nagel is thinking of how they went for him in the chamber yesterday, and Adolphine wondering how she shall make her wedding parties seem only half as grand as Bertha's. She let him talk, and he never ended. He could go on prattling for ever. His mother, sisters and nieces often told him to stop, moved away and left him in the midst of his outpourings. But Constance liked him, saw indeed a good deal of truth in what he said, in spite of all his humbug. He saw through the people around him with an insight which surprised her, and which he was startled to find was not wholly inaccurate. It was certainly true that these people were not simply natural and merry. They had come there from politeness to Bertha and Van Nagel, but in reality, one was tired, the other envious. Auntie, said Emily, who was walking round the room on Van Raven's arm, if Paul once gets hold of you, he'll never let you go. She called her youngest uncle by his Christian name. She was really a pretty girl, though Paul did not see any good-looking people there, and, by the side of her, her future husband was such a pale, insignificant person that people wondered why she had accepted him. She was rather thin, but there was something dainty, uncommon and original about her in her cloudy white frock. She had a pair of charming eyes of a strangely twinkling gold-grey, like an unknown jewel. Her hair was reddish with a glint of gold in it, and there were a few tiny freckles on the clear white complexion which often goes with that hair. She had a pretty laugh, a soft voice, a coaxing way of being nice and saying pleasant things. And, above all, she possessed an innate distinction, and, as she passed, white and gleaming, she had something, one would almost have said, of a very beautiful alabaster ornament, or of a snowy azalea in the sunlight, a luminous fairness, dainty and transparently veined with palest blue. Constance knew that Emily had a talent, something more than the usual girlish accomplishment, for painting, 
but that in her busy life as a young society girl she had never had the opportunity to develop it. And Constance wondered at Van Raven, pale, thin, stuttering, stammering, spruce and yet awkward, with one shoulder higher than the other, and his three hairs of a moustache twisted up towards his eyes. He was at the foreign office, and he belonged to a family whose rigid Dutch orthodoxy was shocked by much in the Van Loers, in the Van Nagels, and especially in the Indian elements of the Ruyveners. Nevertheless, in view of the general reputation for wealth enjoyed by the colonial secretary, they had considered his daughter a suitable match for their son. Van Nagel and Bertha were making her a handsome allowance. When Emily and Van Raven passed on, exchanging civilities with the guests, Constance expressed her surprise to Paul. Can she really be fond of him? She? Not a bit of it. Then why is she marrying him, you ask? That's just the mystery. Van Nagel and Bertha are not husband hunters, like Adolphine. Louise has had three proposals and refused them all. And why Emilicia, that delicate, white little thing, who really has something nice about her, something artistic, something dainty, something exquisite, and, I should say, almost something natural. Why she accepted that weedy ass who puts on German ways on the strength of a fortnight in Berlin, with his moustache twisted a la Kaiser, and his stiff military bows, I really cannot tell you. Bertha, who was very glad when Otto got married, cried when Emilicia accepted this chap. The fellow's as stupid as my foot. Those are neat socks of mine, aren't they? Yes, Connie, why do some people get married? Adolphine and Satsuma, why? I ask you, in heaven's name, why? Otto and Francis, why? She felt that he had it on his lips to say, And you and van der Velke, why? But he did not, and he ran on. Marriage is a terrible thing, I think, to pick out one among hundreds and say, I'll marry you, I'll live with you, I'll sleep with you, I'll eat with you, I'll have children by you, I'll grow old with you, I'll die with you. Are you willing? Great God, Connie! How is it possible that people ever get married? It's a toss-up always. I shudder when I think of it. Paul, tell me, who are all these people? She knew hardly one of the acquaintances. Some sixty people lost among the forty members of the family. This was the first time that she had gone out again at The Hague, and although many of the guests had asked to be introduced to her, she had not talked much had forgotten the names at once. Paul, greatly in his element, explained to her where the people had come from, to what set they belonged, people who did not know, or never saw one another, or else did not bow, although they knew one another, brought together at this wedding party because one family knew the Van Nagels and the other the Van Ravens. It was doubtless because of these foreign elements that the party was so stiff, that the conversation was constantly flagging, that the people who did not dance wandered aimlessly around, watching the dancers with a look of resigned martyrdom. Emilice moved about among them, white, diaphanous, and very charming. With Van Raven at her heels, she exchanged a word with everyone. Van Nagel and Bertha were also quietly busy, as host and hostess, as society people who are used to that sort of thing and who go through it mechanically, really thinking of what they will have to do next day. The members of the family kept on popping up among the mere acquaintances, and, in the midst of them all, the most fidgety was Doreen. She was very fussy as usual, worked herself into a fever collecting things for the cotillion, did not dance, but just trotted about. Paul christened her the camel. It was strange, perhaps, but Constance felt happy and contented at Paul's side. She had seen nothing of the sort for years, and she felt a certain peace and satisfaction at being in the midst of her own relations. Tears were constantly coming to her eyes. She did not know why. At the first Sunday evenings at Mamma's, she had not felt this family affection so intensely, 
perhaps because she was still too timid. Oh, how had she ever managed to live through those fourteen lonely years at Brussels? For years she had felt the delight of love, sympathy and friendship only for her child, and now she felt it for all of them. Through her there passed once more that feeling which was so strong in Mamma, an inward glow which she had not known for years, a good, comfortable feeling that she could now grow old, that henceforth she could devote herself to her child in the familiar atmosphere of home and domesticity, and she did not notice, did not suspect, that the family and the acquaintances were stealthily examining her, judging her, and condemning her. She's a fast woman, said Mrs. Van Raven, Emily's future mother in law, to Mrs. Frieza Stein. It's a great trial for the Van Nagels to have this sister turning up from Brussels. After fourteen years, said the old lady sharply, eager for news, for scandal. After fourteen years, to give occasion for rooting up all these old memories and Mrs. Frieza Stein was delighted that Constance had done so. She killed her father. I knew de Staffler. No one ever had a word to say against him. During all those years, her husband's people refused to know her. I hear that she's intriguing like anything to go down to them now. The child is not van der Velkes. No, his father was an Italian. She's really a most improper person. Marie is her mother, after all. One can't blame her. But the family ought to have stopped her from coming to The Hague. That's what I think, my Frau. Yes, so do I. She's living on her husband's people. Well, the Van Loers all got something from the father, you know. It wasn't much. No, not much. It's a very unhappy marriage. Yes, and the boy is shockingly brought up. They let him do as he likes. Just think, Mefrau, the boy took the house for them. You don't mean it. Yes, really. What a state of affairs. It's all so immoral. What did she come to The Hague for? She was bored in Brussels, and she wants to thrust herself forward here, at court. So I heard. Yes, that's so. Old connections, you see. The Van Nagels and so on. She wants to go to court. Oh, but the Van Nagels will take good care that she doesn't. At least, they will if they're wise. What an example for the girls that aren't of theirs. You know, the Staffeler found her in Van der Velke's arms. The two old ladies whispered, no. Yes, really. He's a low fellow, too. Yes, there's a woman in Brussels. If only they had stayed there. How very select Aunt Constance is tonight, said Florcher to Dykerhoff. She's been sitting with Paul the whole evening, he answered. Of course, no one is good enough for her. No, when you've been the wife of a diplomatist... And afterwards, Baroness van der Velke, what did they come to the Hague for exactly? Mamma thinks because she is afraid that when Grandmamma, who doesn't look far ahead, dies, well, what then? Well, that she won't get her full rights. Oh, nonsense. I tell you, she doesn't trust us. But surely there's a will, and in any case, the law. Yes, but she doesn't know that by Dutch law all the children share and share alike, and, to make sure of what she's to get, she wants to be on the spot when Grandmamma dies. They owe a heap of money. And does he do nothing for a living? No, he used to sell wine at Brussels. Nice people, those relations of yours, though they are barons and diplomatists. Oh, we don't look upon them as relations. Mamma said so distinctly. And so, said Mr. Van Raven to Van Nachel and Van Satsuma, you think they came to live here merely because they were feeling very lonely in Brussels. But the family were against it. 
I myself discussed with Mamma Van Lower whether it would be better to advise them not to. And? Well, Mamma is the mother, you see. When all is said, Constance is her daughter. We all of us gave way. And then, it is so very long ago that... I must say, said Mr. Van Raven, emphasising his words, that it was very generous of you all. Yes, Van Nagel took a very generous view of the case said Van Satsuma, who looked up greatly to his brother-in-law, a minister, an excellency, flattering him, keeping on friendly terms with him. And we all did, all of us, as Van Nagel thought right. Still, one never knows, said Mr. Van Raven thoughtfully. But forgive me, she is your sister-in-law, and it is very generous, most generous of you. Two aunts of Adeline's stopped the fair-haired little mother. Adelincha, yes, auntie, that new sister of yours, do you like her? Is she nice? Yes, auntie, really very nice. But she's been an improper woman. Oh, auntie. Yes, yes, my girl, we know all about it. You be careful. But don't become hand in glove too quickly. You're so thoughtless, Adelincha. Inherit is so good-natured. Take care, both of you. A woman like that can do him harm in his career. Oh, come, auntie, if the Van Dargels receive them. Yes, but the Van Dargels disapprove of them strongly. Still, she's their sister. Everybody's talking about them. People say, what? That Constance is not. Well, that she's not her father's child. But, auntie, that's a frightful thing to say. Because the Van Loers were always so respectable. She can't. No, she can't be a daughter of... of old Van Loers. I say, auntie, this is scurrilous. Adelincha. Auntie, I won't listen to another word. Cousins of the Van Satsumas, talking with the Eichstras, relations of Cato's. Poor dear Adolphine. She's furious. What art? Oh, all sorts of things. First, because the Van Nagels gave a party at which the whole family were ignored. Oh, well, that certainly was rather. Then, because Adolphine has no room in her house to give a party at which she could ignore the family in her turn. And because of the seats which she was given at dinner this evening. And because of Emilicia's two witnesses, her uncle Van Nagel, the Queen's commissary in Overijssel, and Carol Van Loer, whereas she says that Van Satsuma is older than Carol, and therefore... And also because of Emilicia's frock, because that flimsy white thing came from Brussels, and cost three hundred francs. What a heap Van Nagel must be spending on the wedding! No, it's Bertha! It's the Van Loos who always throw money about. Exactly, that's what I say. Adolphine does the same thing, just as though she could afford it. That's because all of those Van Loos are eaten up with pride and conceit. Yes, since the father became Governor-General, they've always acted like megalomaniacs. The old lady is a regular peacock. And Bertha with her smart acquaintances. And then, that Mrs. van der Velke, she's got a nice past to look back upon. And she behaves as though she were the queen. They're quite an ordinary family, the van Loers. Yes, they're nobodies. Their grandfather was a grocer. No. Yes, I assure you. And that mad Ernst, who's always studying the family papers, to discover if they are not of noble descent. Oh, he is mad, if you like. In fact, they're all a little bit mad. Yes, there's a strain of it in all of them. A strain? Something more than a strain, I call it. And it's continued in the Van Nagels. Adolphine's the best of the lot. She's a megalomaniac, though, for all that. I say, this Mrs. Van der Velke, what does she come here for? Well, she thinks the whole thing has blown over. It was fifteen years ago, you see, and she's married to van der Velke. Not according to Dutch law. 
No, but she can get married again. Yes, but they are not. They are not married according to Dutch law. Well, in that case, I don't look upon them as married at all. Not according to Dutch. No, but yes. No, yes. The party ended and the guests departed. End of chapter 15「Chapter Sixteen of Small Souls by Louis Couperus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Next day, Emily and Marianne van Nagel were hard at work in their boudoir. They shared a sitting room between them. Louise, the eldest sister, had one to herself. Emily was taking down watercolours from the wall. The room was so bright and cheerful, she said softly and put the drawings together. Marianne suddenly burst into sobs. The room was all topsy-turvy, because Emily was collecting her belongings, and the wallpaper now showed in fresh, unfaded, rectangular patches. "'What on earth do you want to marry that horrid man for?' cried Marianne, sobbing. "'We were so happy, the two of us. We were always together.' "'With you married, I shall have no one, "'and I hate the idea of arranging my room all over again.' "'Emily seemed to be staring blankly into a blank future. "'Oh, come, Marianne, I shall still be at The Hague.' "'No, I've lost you,' sobbed Marianne passionately. "'What did you see in that man? "'What did you see in him?' "'She embraced her sister violently and insisted, "'Tell me, tell me, what did you see in that man? "'In Edward? I love him.' "'Oh,' said Marianne, "'is that all it means, loving a man? Is that love?' A maid entered. "'Froyla, there's a box come from Brussels with your dresses. "'My frau wants to know if it can be brought up at once, "'so as not to make a litter downstairs. "'Yes, they can bring it up.' "'Overwrought.' Marianne had sunk into a chair and closed her eyes. She was in a state of nervous excitement, while Emily, with strange calmness, was collecting boxes, portraits, ornaments. "'Emily,' said Marianne resignedly, "'what a mess you're making. "'Never mind, I'm just taking it all away. "'Yes, that's just it. "'Everything's going away. "'Everything's going away. "'Marianne, do control yourself.' Two maids came, dragging along a packing case. "'Where shall we put it, Froyla? "'Leave it there, in the passage.' Bertha came upstairs. "'Unpack it at once, Emily, or the things will crease. "'Do you think it's my wedding dress? "'I expect so. "'Then it can go on the bed. "'No, it had better be hung in the wardrobe.' The servants opened the packing case and produced cardboard boxes. A third maid entered. A bill from van der Laan's, my frau. Marianne, here's my key basket. Just pay it, will you? It's sixty-six guilders. The two Leiden boys came upstairs. Jolly beastly, I call it, said Franz. You never find anyone in the drawing-room when you come home. Either it's a party or else everything's upside down. Bless my soul, girls, said Henry. Look at the state your room's in. I say, shall I help you unpack? Mefrau, I can't understand what the young Mefrau's babu says. Mawapa, Alima. Nyonya Muda asks if Nyonya Bessa would mind coming upstairs, said the babu in Malay. Yes, I'll come at once. What are you all doing here? asked Maricha at the door. Mamma, has Emily's dress come? May I see? If you please, my frau, the old my frau and Mrs. van der Velke are downstairs. Shall I ask them to wait in the drawing-room? Granny, shouted Franz over the balusters. Half a moment, said Henry, rushing down the stairs. I'll fetch Granny and Auntie. Marianne began sobbing again. My dear child, what's the matter now? exclaimed Bertha. I'm going mad, cried Marianne. Emily kissed her. 
Old Mrs. Van Loor came slowly up the stairs, gallantly escorted by her grandson, and was met on the landing by her other grandson. "'Granny, Emily's wedding dress has come, and she's going to try it on,' cried Maricha excitedly. "'Am I in the way?' asked Constance. "'No, of course not, Constance,' said Bertha. "'Come in.' All the doors of the boudoir and bedroom were open. Louise came in. She usually kept out of the way at busy times, and together with Bertha and the lady's maid, shook out the white dress which straightway filled the whole room with a snowy whiteness. "'What is it, Babu?' asked Mrs. Van Loer. "'Nanya Muda asks if Nanya Pessa would come upstairs,' repeated the Babu. "'But perhaps, if the Kanjeng Nanya Bessa could come,' she added piling on the titles out of respect for the old lady, who had once been the Nyonya Bessa Bogor. "'Then I'll go up,' said the old lady. "'Constance, will you come too?' Very slowly, a little tired after the stairs, the old lady climbed up with her hand on the baluster rail. Constance followed her. On the top floor there was a sudden draught. Doors slammed. "'Babu!' "'Is there a window open?' "'The Babu ran about stupidly, "'unfamiliar as yet with Dutch doors and windows. "'In a sitting-room they found Francis, "'Otto's wife, with the two children. "'But, Francis, you've got a window open.' "'Oh, Grandmama, I was suffocating.' "'Babu, shut the window at once. "'Francis, how could you?' "'I can't, Kanjeng,' sighed the Babu, "'pressing with the strength of a gnat on the bars of the solid Dutch window. "'Constance helped her, pushed down the window. "'This is Aunt Constance who has come to make your acquaintance, Francis. "'But, Francis, you're still in your sarong and cabaya. "'Isn't that allowed, Granny? How do you do, Aunt? "'Child, how Indian you've become in these few years!' cried the old lady, angrier than Constance remembered ever seeing her. "'How is it possible? Have you forgotten Holland? In March, with the window open, in a tearing draught, with both the children, you in sarong and cabaya, and Hauch in a little shirt? Do you want to kill yourself and the children? Babu, put a badger on, signor. Francis, I spent years and years in India.' but even in India I was nearly always dressed, and when I came back to Holland, I had not forgotten Holland in the way which you, a purely Dutch girl, have forgotten it in these few years. The old woman had taken the child on her own lap, and was dressing it more warmly. Grandmama, how you're grumbling! It'd be better if you told Cook to make Ottolinches bubor properly. The child can't eat that starch they give her and she told Babu that she had no time to cook it differently. The whole house has gone mad because Emily is getting married. We really can't stay here on the top floor at Papa and Mama's. Frances, dress yourself first, or I shall get really angry. Allah, Grandmama, cried Frances irritably. But when Constance gave her the same advice, she flung a wrapper over her sarong and cabaya and remained like that with her bare feet in slippers. "'No wonder you are always ill,' grumbled Grandmama, still busying herself with the child. "'Oh, Aunt Constance, I wonder if you would run down to the kitchen and tell Cook that Ottolinja can't have her boo made like that.' "'My dear Francis," laughed Constance, "'the Cook has never seen me, nor I her, and if I went to her kitchen—' and talked about the bubur, she would only turn me out. "'What a country to live in, Holland!' cried Francis. "'My child is starving for food. "'I'll go down to Mamma if you like. "'Yes, do, would you?' Constance went downstairs. In the boudoir, Emily, in her wedding dress, was standing in front of a long glass. The heavy white satin crushed her, looked hard and cruel upon her, now that her hair was not done, and she tired and pale. "'The bodice doesn't fit. It will simply have to go back to Brussels,' said Bertha. 
"'It's sickening,' said Emily, and the word sounded almost like a curse between her lips. "'Marianne, will you write the letter? I'll pin the dress up. Oh, no, I had better write myself. Constance, do look.' "'There's a crease here,' said Constance. "'But it's not very bad. Did you have it altered here?' "'Upon my word, I'm paying,' Bertha began, but she checked herself and did not say how much. And "'To have it fits badly into the bargain. "'Bertha, Francis asked me to come and see you. "'What about? "'There's some trouble about Otto Lynch's boobor. "'I'll go up,' said Bertha, worn out though she was. "'The maid, holding up Emily's train, followed her into the bedroom.' Marianne and Constance remained behind alone. Constance saw that Marianne was crying. "'What is it, dear?' "'Oh, Auntie, what is it? "'Is life worth all this bother and fuss? "'Getting married, moving your things, dancing, giving dinners and parties, "'ordering dresses that don't fit and cost hundreds, "'being ill, having babies, eating boobor? "'Auntie!' Is it really all worth while? Why, Marianne, I might be listening to Paul. Oh, no, I'm not so eloquent as Paul. But I'm suffocating with it all. I'm stifling, and I'm terribly, terribly, terribly unhappy. Marianne. The young girl suddenly burst into nervous sobs and threw herself into Constance's arms. Around her, the room was one scene of confusion. The doors were all open. Marianne, let me shut the doors. No, auntie, don't mind about that, but stay with me, do. It's more than I can stand, more than I can stand. I'm so tired of this rush, of this unnecessary excitement, of the party yesterday, of those tableaux vivants, of Florcher's jealousy, of Aunt Adolphine's spitefulness. I'm tired, tired, tired of everything. I can't stand it, auntie. I'm so fond of Emily. We've always been together. It was so nice, so jolly. And now, all at once, she's getting married to that hateful man. And she's taking away her sketches. It's all over. And now everything's gone. Everything's gone. And Henry, too, is so upset about it. He dotes on Emily just as I do, and he can't understand either what she's doing it for. She's very happy here. Papa and Mamma and all the rest are fond of her. We had such a nice life, even if it was a bit overdone, and I don't care for that everlasting going out. But now it's all over, all over. I sat crying with Henry yesterday, and at the party we had to be gay, and everyone thought that he was gay the gay undergraduate, and the poor boy was miserable. And yesterday I had to appear in that tableau, and Florcher was so horrid and spiteful, and Henry and Franz had a dialogue to do, and the poor boy couldn't speak his words. And I ask you, auntie, why all this unhappiness when we were so happy together? She clenched her fists, and through her sobs suddenly began to laugh aloud. Oh, auntie, <laughs> oh, auntie, don't mind what I say. I am mad, I am mad, but it is they who are driving me mad. Mamma, the boys, the servants, the babu, Francis and the children. It is one great merry-go-round. Ha, <laughs> ha, did you ever see such an everlasting rush as we have in this house? She was now sobbing and laughing together and suddenly she remembered that she had let herself go too much with a strange aunt, and that Mamma did not like these spontaneous confidences to strangers. And because she wanted to recover herself, she suddenly became rather dignified and asked, "'Did you enjoy yourself fairly yesterday, Aunt Constance?' "'Yes, Marianne. I thought it very nice to be back among you all. "'Don't you like Brussels better than The Hague?' It was so quiet for us lately in Brussels. Rome, I should like to see Rome. Yes, Rome is beautiful. 
They were now silent, and they both felt that things of the past parted them. The new strange aunt who had come back from the past, and the young girl who was suddenly afraid of it. And, without understanding why, Marianne sighed in the midst of this shrinking fear. Oh, for a joy, a real joy that would fill me entirely. No more dinners and dresses and excitement about nothing, but a real joy, a great joy. She felt so strange, so giddy, but she still found strength to say, It's a pity that you were away from us so long. We should always have liked you and Uncle very much, but now you are both so strange still to all of us. Yes, replied Constance very wearily and she did not understand why she suddenly felt very sad, as though, after all, for manifold reasons, she had not done well to come back, though there had been that hunger for her own people, her own kith and kin. A joy, a great joy, Marianne again sighed softly, and she pressed her hands to her breast, as though distressed by her strange longing. Translator's Note Babu, maid, nurse. Bao apa, what is it? Nyonya muda, the young mistress, as who should say, the young mem sahib. Nyonya basa, the great mistress or great mem sahib, used of the wives of residents and other high officials. Kanjeng nyonya basa, the old great mem sahib. Nyonya basa bagur. The Governor General's Mem Sahib. Bogor is the native name of Bautenzorg in Java, which contains the Governor General's palace. Sarong and Kabaya, the native skirt or garment wound tightly round the loins, and sleeved jacket, forming a costume which is worn pretty generally as an indoor dress by European ladies in Java. Signor, the young gentleman. Bubur. Broth, pap. End of chapter sixteen. Chapter seventeen of Small Souls by Louis Couperus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The furniture arrived from Brussels, and Constance found it delightful to arrange her house near the woods. She had never expected to be so happy, just because she was back in her own country and among her family circle. It was April, but it was still winter, a chill, damp winter which seemed never to have done raining. Above the woods and the Kirchhoff Lahn, the heavy clouds were forever gathering, sailing up as though from a mysterious cloud realm, spreading the sorrowful tints of the lowland skies over the atmosphere hanging everlastingly like a beautiful leaden-hued melancholy of lilac grey, sometimes with the coppery glow of a light that always gleamed very faintly, and never conquered, but just shone like copper in between the grey. And the endless rain clattered down, the endless wind howled through the bare trees, the endless clouds pushed and drove along, borne on the stormy squalls, as though there were an endless combat overhead, a cloud life of which men below knew nothing. It was a melancholy of day after day, and yet, strangely enough, it stirred Constance gratefully. She smiled at the clouds, the clouds of lilac streaked with glowing copper, as though a distant conflagration were shining through a watery mist and very soon her house grew dear to her, and she was glad that she lived in it. Addy was not going to school yet, but was working hard to pass his examination in July for the second class in the grammar school. He was having a few private lessons, and for the rest, studied zealously in his room, which, built out with a bow window and a little leaden peaked roof, he grandiloquently called his turret room. He had helped Constance to get settled, he had helped van der Velke with his room, and now he worked and slept between the rooms of his parents, and separated them, and, whenever it became necessary, united them. Strange this family life in the little house, 
whether parents, through grudges and grievances heaped up for years, could hardly exchange the least word, could hardly even be silent, without attention in both their faces and in both their souls. For every detail of domestic life, a piece of furniture displaced, a door opened or shut, at once led to a discord which turned the tension into an offence. The very least thing provoked a bitter word, a reproach flashed out on the instant. Resentment was constantly boiling over, and amid it all was the boy, adored by both with a mutual jealousy that made their adoration almost morbid, each hoping simultaneously that the boy would now speak to him or her, and award his caress to her or him, and, if this hope were disappointed, at once an averted glance, uncontrolled envy, a nervous discomfort that was almost a physical illness. And, by a miracle that had become a forbearing and compassionate grace, the boy, who was still the child of their love, was only a little older, for all this everlasting discord, than his actual years, had only grown a little more serious, feeling himself at a very early age to be the mediator. And, now that he was a couple of years older, now that he was thirteen, accepted this mediation, almost unconsciously, as an appointed task and a bounden duty, with only very deep in his childish heart the ache of it all, that things were so, because he loved both his parents. At table, at both meals, the child talked, and the two parents smiled, although they avoided each other's glances, though to each other their words were cruel and pitilessly cold. After lunch, it was always, Addy, what are you doing this afternoon? I have to work, Mamma. Aren't you going out with me? Well, then, at three o'clock, Mamma. After dinner, it was, Addy, my boy, what are you doing this evening? I have to work, Papa. Aren't you coming for a cycle ride with me first? For an hour, Papa, that's all. And it was always as though the parents, almost stupidly, kept the child from working, happy as long as he sat with him or her, walked with her, or cycled with him. It was so many favours that he granted, and he granted them not as a spoilt child, but as a man. He divided his precious time systematically between his work and his father and mother, conscientiously allotting what was due to each, and Constance would have a moment of faint, smiling pride, as though in a victory gained, when the boy went out with her in the afternoon. Addy, must you always wear that hat? Then, to please her, he did not wear his boar hat, but a bowler, so as to look nice when walking with Mamma. And she relaxed, talked to him, and he laughed back, and she could just take his arm and walked with evident pride on the arm of her little son. Paul always said that she flirted with him. Then, van der Velke, having nothing to keep him indoors, went out, went to the Vita, looked up his old friends, young fellows of the old days, but now for the most part portly gentlemen filling important posts. He no longer felt at home with them, even when they talked of the days long past. Leiden, their youthful escapades, their young years. He felt, when with these men who filled important posts, that his life was spoilt thanks to an irrevocable fault, and, disconsolately, he came home from the Witter or from the Platz, and was a little gloomy at dinner until Addy succeeded in cheering him up. Then, looking more brightly out of his frank young blue eyes, van der Velke asked, Addy, my boy, what are you doing this evening? He asked it as one asks a grown-up person who makes an appointment or has an engagement, and the lad answered, I have to work, papa. Aren't you going for a ride with me first? For an hour, papa, that's all. Then van der Velke's face lighted up, and Constance reflected that she would be alone, all alone, sitting drearily at home while the evening drew in. But the bicycles were brought out, and, like two schoolfellows, they spurted away, van der Velke suddenly brighter-looking, younger-looking, both father and son, 
not tall but well built, sturdy yet refined, their two faces, under the same sort of cap, resembling each other in that slightly heavy cast of feature. The short nose, the well cut mouth, the square chin, the short curly hair, and the eyes of a happy blue, looking steadily along those roads in the woods which sped under their devouring pedals. And they were like two brothers, they talked like two friends. And just as Constance had done that afternoon, van der Velke now let himself go in the evening, feeling oh so young and happy with his son companion. On returning home, Addy would look in for a cup of tea with Mamma, and afterwards go to his turret room to work. And then van der Velke always had a pretext, just like a schoolboy, to go and sit with his son instead of staying in his little smoking room. Addy, my fire's gone out. Shall I be disturbing you if I come and sit in here? No, papa. Or else, Addy, that wretched wind is blowing right against my window, and there's a frightful draught in my room. Then come and sit in here, papa. The boy was never taken in, but remained very serious and went on working, and van der Velke settled himself quietly in the easy chair, the only one in the room, with a book and a cigarette, and smoked and looked at his son. The boy, one-idead and persevering, worked on. He's an industrious little beggar, thought van der Velke, and he hardly dared move for fear of disturbing Addy. He'll get through this summer, though he was a bit behindhand. One couldn't go on as we were doing at Brussels with that outside tutor. It's just as well the boy came to Holland. He'll get through, he'll get through. Four years at the grammar school, and then Leiden, and then he must enter the service. It's lucky that Constance doesn't object. But will he himself consent? I should like to see my son make his way in the career which I... Oh, it was a damned business, a damned business. However, without Constance I should not have had Addy, my boy. And Papa, too, would like to see him go in for diplomacy. Papa was pleased with him, too. I could see that. He will have money later. Papa and Mamma are still hale and hearty, but he will have money one of these days. Just look at the boy working, and he is so serious, poor little beggar, owing to this confounded life at home. Still, he's fond of us. Look at him working. I never worked like that. He gets it from his grandfather. That seriousness also. He makes straight for his object. I was always more superficial. Younger too. The poor kid doesn't know what it means to be young. He will never be young. Never go off his head. Perhaps though. Who knows? Later, at Leiden. Perhaps he will be really lively. Really go off his head. I wish it in him with all my heart, my boy, my little chap. I wonder what he thinks of his parents. He knows that his mother married before she married his father. But what does he know besides? What does he think? Does he judge us yet, that boy of mine? Will he condemn us later on? Oh, my boy, my boy, never throw up your life for a woman. But it was a matter of honour. My father wished it. Oh, Addy. May it never happen to you. But it shan't happen to you, my boy. There's something about him which makes me see that that sort of thing can never happen to him. He will go far. Wait and see if he doesn't. What does he get from me, and what from Constance? Difficult, this question of heredity. I always think of it when I look at him like this. He takes after me physically. That seriousness is his grandfather's. Now what does he get from the Van Loers? Perhaps that tinge of melancholy he sometimes has. But he's a Van der Velke. He's a regular Van der Velke. He's singularly well balanced, that boy. What is harsh and rugged in Papa is ever so much softened in him. Perhaps that's from the Van Loers. It's enough for me to sit and look at him working. Constance doesn't know I'm here. She thinks we are sitting apart, each in his own room. How can the boy stick it? Working so long on end. What is he working at? Greek? Yes, Greek. I can see the letters. I always used to get up a hundred times. A fly was enough to put me off, and I never really studied. I just crammed. 
prepared for my examination in a fortnight, helped by Max Browse. Browse? What's become of that chap, I wonder? Oh, one's old friends. I simply could not study. Without Max Browse, I should never have got there. Yes, what's become of him? But this beggar studies so peacefully, so industriously. He's a dear boy. Oh, if he only had more young people about him, bright, cheerful youngsters. If only it doesn't do him harm later, this gloomy boyhood between parents who are always squabbling. I restrain myself sometimes, for his sake, but it's no use, no use. Heavens, how the fellow's working. I think I'll just ask him something. Or no, perhaps I'd better not. He always puckers up his forehead, so solemnly, as though I were the child, disturbing him, and he the father. Well, I'd better have another cigarette. And van der Velke, through the clouds of his fourth cigarette, watched his son's back. In the light of the lamp on the table, the boy's curly young head bent over his books and exercises, as fervently as though the Greek verbs were the world's salvation. And van der Velke, a little irritated by all the industry, all this peace, all this quietness for two hours on end, became jealous of the Greek verbs, and, rising at last, unable to restrain himself, said suddenly, with his hand on Addy's shoulder and something parental in his voice, though it was not very firm, Don't work too long at a time, my boy. End of chapter 17「Chapter Eighteen of Small Souls by Louis Couperus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Or else Constance would say, after dinner, "I'm going to Granny's. Will you take me, Addy?" But he was very just. It was Papa's turn. "Mummy, I was out with you this afternoon. Well, what of that? I'm going for a ride with Papa." Then she turned pale with jealousy. Oh, so you dole out your favours. He gave her a kiss, but she pouted, said she would go alone in the Schreveningen and tram, which would take her to Granny's door. But he drew her down upon his little knees. Let's play at sweethearts first, then. No, let me go. But he held her tight and kissed her with very short, quick kisses. Let me go, Addy, I insist. But he kissed her with a rain of quick little kisses, which tickled her till she smiled. Look pleasant now. No, I won't. Come, look pleasant. No, I won't look pleasant. But she was laughing, saw that her jealousy was really too silly. And van der Velke, after dinner, was glad that it was his turn. He had come back very gloomy from the Platz, and Addy had cheered him up during dinner. Sometimes even, Addy went quite mad. Then he wanted to romp with his father, and van der Velke did not object until Addy discovered a little spot between Papa's brace buttons where he was very sensitive and tickled him furiously just on that little spot. Addy, that's enough, van der Velke shouted, playing the father, trying to inspire respect. But Addy, quite mad, caught Papa round the waist tickled him on that sensitive spot. Addy, I'll give you a thrashing! And van der Velke squirmed nervously, ran madly round the room, ran out of the room, followed by his tormentor. Addy, if you don't leave off, you'll get such a thrashing that you... But there was no holding the boy, and van der Velke, because of that sensitive spot, lost all his self-respect, cringed, entreated, laughed like a madman, when Addy so much as pointed at it. Addy, don't be so silly, cried Constance from the drawing room. Then he rushed to his mother. Hello, are you jealous again? Do you want to play at sweethearts? But his father called to him reproachfully. Come, Addy, let us start. And Addy ran from one to the other like a little dog, and at last landed on his bicycle with a ridiculous jump and Constance stealthily watched him spurting past van der Velke, 
leaning forward over his handlebar, pedalling like mad. Then she felt happy, because he was merry, like a child. Emily had been married a day or two, when Addie said at dinner, I went for a walk with Henry van Nagel and his friend Kees Heidrecht. But Addie, said Constance, who was very irritable that day, why are you always with those boys? Do they really care for going out with you? Why not go to Aunt Adolphine's boys instead? They are your own age. Well, I can understand that Addie prefers Henry, van der Velke let fall, unfortunately. Why? she asked, immediately up in arms. He wished to avoid a dispute. He was sometimes more reasonable than she, and he merely said, Well, they're rather rough. It would be a miracle, she at once began to cavil, if you ever saw anything good in the Van Satsuma's house. He looked at her with wide eyes, his fine young blue eyes. But Constance... Yes, you're always crabbing Adolphine, her husband, her house, her children. But Constance, I never mention them. That's not true. I assure you. That is not true, I tell you. Only the other day you said that the house was vulgar. Two days ago you said Van Satsuma looks like a farm labourer. But you yourself said, at Emily's wedding. It is not true. I said nothing. I tell you, once and for all, I won't have you always crabbing one of my sisters and her household. This time it's the boys who are rather rough. Oh, perhaps you want to see Addy like them. I think it ridiculous for Addie to be always going about with undergraduates. The Van Satsuma boys are very nice, and of his own age. And I think them three unmannerly young blackguards. Henry, I forbid you from this time forward to comment on my family in my presence. Look here, you give your orders to your servants, not to me. I won't have it, I tell you. But he flung down his napkin, rose from his seat, left the room suddenly in a passion. Addy sat quietly looking before him, playing with his fork. Papa has very bad manners, to go throwing down his napkin, slamming the door like a schoolboy, she said, fretfully, involuntarily, as though to annoy Addy. But he frowned and said nothing, and she went on. At least, in my father's house I was never accustomed to such rudeness. Suddenly, he clenched his little fist, and banged it on the table till the glasses rang again. And now you keep quiet about Papa. He looked at her severely, with his blue eyes suddenly grown hard, and a frown on his forehead. She started, and upset her glass. Then she began to weep softly. He let her be for a few minutes. She cried, sobbed, bit her handkerchief. Then he rose walked round the table, kissed her very gently. "'You have a nice way of talking to your mother,' she said, between her sobs. He made no reply. "'A pretty tone to use to your mother,' she went on. He took her by the chin and lifted up her face. "'For shame to lose your temper like that,' he scolded, "'and to grumble and mope and squabble and upset yourself and kick up a hullabaloo.' Do you call that a pleasant way of dining? She buried her face in his breast, in his arms. He stroked her hair. Come, mummy, be sensible now. It's nothing. Yes, but papa mustn't crab Aunt Adolphine. And you mustn't crab papa. What did papa say, after all? That Aunt Adolphine's boys were rough. Do you think they're girls, then? No. Well, then, what else? I don't approve of your going out with boys so much older than yourself. Then you can tell me so quietly. But it's no reason to go quarrelling like that. I can't eat any more now. Oh, Addy, just when I've ordered... What? Apple pudding and wine sauce. Well, it'll keep till tomorrow. Do have a little. You know you like it. Yes, but I can't eat when I see you so cross. It chokes me here and he pointed to his throat. "'Have just a little bit,' she said coaxingly. "'If you're very good, give me a kiss.' 
but mind you're very good they laughed together he gently wiped away her tears you ought to see yourself in the glass he added with those red eyes of yours he sat down she rang the bell the servants brought in the pudding displayed no particular surprise at finding that Menere had gone is there any cheese for papa he asked the servants brought the cheese Addy cut a piece of gruyere put it on a plate with some butter and biscuits poured out a glass of wine Addy, wait a minute he said and he went upstairs with the cheese and the wine van der velke was sitting glowering in the smoking room here's your cheese and biscuits father you don't like apple pudding do you oh i don't want anything now don't be disagreeable eat up your cheese i can't eat when mamma she's sorry already she's all nerves today so don't talk about it any more i i'm not talking no but suda now as aunt royvena says will you eat your cheese now presently we'll go for a ride he went away here i sit just like a naughty child thought van der velke with my little plate of cheese and biscuits that silly boy and he ate up his bit of cheese and laughed downstairs constance had put a piece of pudding on addy's plate he ate slowly she looked at him contentedly because he was enjoying it if you hadn't fired up like that he said i'd have told you something about henry what about him that chap's going to be ill why he's so upset at emily's marriage that it's made him quite unwell case hyderecht got angry and said are you in love with your sister and then henry almost began to cry leiden man though he is no he wasn't in love he said but he had always been with emily with emily and marianne and now she was married and would be a stranger he was so bad that we took him home and then he locked himself in his room and wouldn't even see marianne but addy that's morbid i dare say but it's true i must go round to aunt bertha's will you take me no let me go cycling with papa he's sitting upstairs eating his cheese for all he's worth you'd better tell trouchard to take him up his coffee but addy what will the girl think when she sees papa finishing his dinner upstairs she can think what she likes it's your fault shall i come and fetch you at aunt bertha's at a quarter to ten she looked at him radiantly delighted surprised and she kissed him passionately my boy my darling she cried pressing him to her heart translator's note suda quiet that'll do end of chapter 18「19 of Small Souls by Louis Couperus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In the same nervous mood in which she had been all day, Constance hurried after dinner to the Bezaudenhout, taking the tram along the Schreveningschweg, and another to the plain. When she rang at the Van Nagels, she thought it strange that there was no light in the hall, as she knew from Addy that they were at home that evening. The butler who opened the door said that he did not know whether Mafrau could see her, as Mafrau was not feeling well. She waited in the drawing room, where the butler hurriedly turned on the light before going to say that she was there. All round the big room were the faded and withered flower baskets and bouquets of Emily's wedding. The frail flowers shrivelled and brown and decayed, while the broad white ribbons still hung in silvery folds around them. The room had evidently not been touched since the wedding breakfast. The dust lay thick on the furniture, and the chairs still stood as though the room had just been left by a multitude of guests. Constance waited some time, then she heard footsteps. Marianne came in, looking pale and untidy. We are so sorry, Auntie, to have kept you waiting. 
Mamma is very tired and has an awful headache and is lying down in her room. Then I won't disturb her. But Mamma asked if you would come upstairs. She followed Constance to Bertha's bedroom. Constance was astonished at the almost deathly stillness in that great house, which, on the three or four occasions that she had entered it, she had never seen other than full of movement, life, all sorts of little interests which together made up a bustling existence. There was no draught on the top floor, where Frances had her apartments. There were no doors slamming. She saw no maids, no babu, no children. Everything was quiet, deadly quiet, and when she entered Bertha's room, it looked to her in the subdued light like a sick room. "'I have come to see how you are.' Bertha put out her hand silently. Then she said, "'That is nice of you. I am very tired, and I have a headache. I shall not stay long. Yes, do stay. I don't mind you.' Bertha and Constance were now alone, and it struck Constance that a disconsolate sadness distorted Bertha's features, and that she looked very old now that her hair with its grey patches was down. "'All this rush has been too much for you.' "'Oh, I don't know,' said Bertha vaguely. "'There's always plenty of rush here. "'Still, it's just as well that you're taking a rest. "'Yes.' "'They were silent, and there was no sound save the ticking of the clock. "'Then Constance stooped and kissed Bertha on the forehead. "'I wanted badly to see you this evening,' she said. "'Addy was out with Henry.' and he told me that Henry was so depressed, and so I came round. Henry, said Bertha vaguely, I don't think so. He seemed all right. But Addy said, what, that he was so depressed? Really, I didn't notice it. Well, perhaps Addy was mistaken, said Constance gently. Come, I've seen you now, Bertha, and perhaps it's better that I should go and let you rest and she stooped again to kiss Bertha goodbye. But Bertha caught her by the hand. "'Do stay with me,' she said hesitatingly. "'I'm really afraid of disturbing you.' "'No, please stay,' said Bertha. "'I think it's nice of you to have come. You mustn't think me indifferent, but what's the use of talking? If one doesn't talk, everything is so much simpler. Words always mean so much.' Don't think me cold, Constance. I'm like that, you see. I never talk. To anybody. I prefer to withdraw into myself when there's anything the matter with me. But there's nothing wrong now. I'm only a little tired. Of course I feel rather sad at Emily's going, but we must hope that she will be happy. Edward is not a bad fellow, and why should Emily have accepted him if she didn't care for him? Do stay and talk to me. Tell me about yourself. It is the first time that we've had a real talk. For years. Yes, for years. And much has happened, Constance. But it all belongs to the past now. Yes, but the past remains so long. Properly speaking, it never goes. It's always the past. Constance, it is twenty years since we saw each other. Twenty years. Papa has been dead fourteen years. It was my fault that he died. No, Constance. Yes, it was. You needn't mind. It was my fault. I know you all think so, and I feel it myself. It was my fault. I can never forget that. I can never forgive myself that. Hush, Constance. Really, it's such a long time. Such a very long time ago. But it will always remain. A murder. You have the future before you now. There's your son. Yes, there's my son. But it has come to this, that I am not living for him, but he for me. That is wrong. Yes, it is wrong. And my whole life is wrong. Everything has gone wrong in my life. Oh, Bertha, I can't tell you how I yearned for Holland and for you all. How I yearned to be no longer alone, alone with my boy. Now perhaps it will be different, among all of you. I feel at home once more. At home, do you know what that means? If I had remained away, things would never have come right. Now perhaps I can still hope. I really don't know. 
alone with your boy why don't you speak of your husband no not my husband why not no no we only endure each other for addy's sake constance don't forget what what he did for you what his people did oh if only i had never accepted that sacrifice if only i had gone right away alone somewhere far away and then never come back to you all for as it is it was possible after fifteen years but then it would have been impossible to be grateful to be grateful all the time while all the time i am full of bitterness i can't do it i can't be grateful when i feel so bitter but constance you're back now and we are all glad to have you back bertha i don't know if you mean what you say i do know that i am happy to be back in holland among you all but i also know that in twenty years people drift far apart and perhaps i who had become a stranger was not wise to come back to all of you to want to be a sister to you again perhaps we shall have to get used to one another constance as sisters but you always remained a daughter to mamma and i am very glad for mamma's sake yes i feel that that you all tolerate me for mamma's sake it's nice of you but it's not quite what i should have wished but constance all that will come later i'm convinced that soon you will feel no longer a stranger but don't be impatient and let us get used to one another again and there is this too that every one has his own interests in life and it's a pity but there is not always time to feel for another and to think of another that is very strange but it's true just think it is two months since you came back to holland and this is the first time that we've had a chance of talking to each other i've only once been to see you at your house and all this is not from heartlessness but because one has no time yes bertha i know and i'm not reproaching you and you've been very busy with the wedding and when it's not a wedding it's something else it's always like that constance and sometimes i ask myself why why do we do it why have all this fuss all this bustle all this excitement there is a reason for it all our children's happiness lies in that direction we do everything for our children that's what it comes to van nagel's being in the cabinet my giving dinners the reason is always though one doesn't always realize it for the children for their happiness but then constance then we ought to have our reward and see our children happy in return for all our trouble and worry for all this rushing about and weariness for all the money we spend we do want to see our children just a little happy and then oh when i her eyes filled with tears when i see otto and francis otto discontented and francis ill louise sad because of otto whom she is so fond of emily married now but how married poor thing and why and marianne all nerves and not knowing what she wants and henry too so melancholy then i say to myself why have we all these children for whom we live and think and contrive and wouldn't it be better not to have them and isn't it better to have as little as possible in one's life and to make that life as small and simple and quiet as possible once we have to live oh constance all this aimlessness and uselessness amid which people like ourselves women in our position our environment our set turn and turn like humming tops or fools isn't it enough sometimes to tempt one to run away from it all and to go and sit on a mountain somewhere and look out over the sea women like ourselves marry as young girls knowing nothing and having only a vague presentiment of our own lives that they will be like the lives of our mothers before us and all that futility seems most important until one fine day we find that we have grown old and tired and have lived for nothing at all for visits dresses dinners things which we thought were necessary all sorts of interests among which we were born and brought up and grew old and which we cannot escape and which are worth nothing 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 and then when we think that we have lived for our children and slaved and schemed and contrived for them then it all comes to nothing 
Nothing, nothing, and not one of them is happy. You see, Constance, I have talked to you now, but what's the good of it? Why say all that I have said? You'll go away presently and think, what a fit of depression Bertha had, and that is all it was, a fit of depression. But when I have had a couple of days' rest, why, then life will go on as before. I shall have two charwomen in at once. The whole house has to be done after the wedding and because of the spring cleaning. Well, then, was it really worth while to speak out? Oh, no, talking leads to so little, and it's best simply to do all the little duties that fall to one's share. I am very glad, though, Bertha, that you have let yourself go. I did not know you thought like that. I myself have sometimes thought so, even though my life was not so busy as yours. But in Brussels, I too sometimes thought, well, yes, I am living for Addy, but if he were not here, he would not have his own troubles in the future, and I should not need to go on living. And perhaps there are hundreds who think like that, in our class. Isn't it the same in every class? Perhaps life is hopeless for everybody, and yet, when I am rested, tomorrow or the day after, and when my headache is gone, I shall start all this work over again. They were silent, hand in hand. For a moment they had found each other again, were like two sisters. Then Bertha went on. When I lie here like this, with my headaches, I always think of my children. Yes, it was nice of you to come, Connie. Was Addy out with Henry, did you say? Isn't it morbid of Henry to be so melancholy? But my children are so dependent on one another, almost more than on their parents. Otto and Louise are always together, and then Francis is jealous. The two boys at Leiden are always together, and Henry was always with his sisters too, and Marianne Mrs. Emily. And still... Notwithstanding that feeling for one another, notwithstanding that we do everything for them, notwithstanding that all our thoughts are for them, notwithstanding all we spend on them and for them, my children are not happy. Not one of them has received, what shall I say, the gift of happiness. It is strange. It is as if life lay heavy upon all of them, and as if they were too small, too weak to bear the burden of it. Tell me, Constance, what is your boy like? I don't think he is like that. But then, he is old for his years, isn't he? Yes, but he is very sensible. Yes, he is a little man. He is strong, in mind as well as in body. I was going to say that he is just as though he were not little. He works entirely to please himself, and he is a comfort to both of us. He is a strange child. He is not a child. And what is he going to be? He will probably go into the diplomatic service. She spoke the words and saw in a flash before her eyes, Rome, the Staffela, all her vain past, and in that half-darkened room, in that hour of absolute sincerity, she asked herself whether that career would spell happiness for her son. Will van der Velke like that? Yes, but Addy must decide for himself. We shall not force him. There was a knock at the door, and Henry put his head into the room. May I come in, Mamma? Yes. What is it? Here's Aunt Constance. How are you, Aunt? I came to see how you are, Mamma. The undergraduate was a tall boy of just twenty, with a pale, gentle face, and dressed with the ultra smartness of a youth who is in the swim at Leiden. Pretty well, my boy. I shall go back to Leiden to morrow, Mamma. Oh. Yes, and I shall probably not be home for some time. I mean to work hard. That's right. There's really nothing else to do but work. It's so slow here, Auntie, now that Emily's gone. Otto's all right, with Louise. She missed him badly while he was in India. Funny brothers and sisters, aren't we? So exaggerated. Well, Mamma, I'll say goodbye. I shall start the first thing in the morning. He said goodbye and went away pulling himself together, putting a good face on his grief. Bertha began to weep softly. A maid knocked at the door. Master van der Velke, my frau. Addy's come to fetch me. Ask Master van der Velke to come upstairs, 
said Bertha. The boy came in. He remained near the door in the half-dark room. He stood small but erect, like a little man. I've come to fetch you, Mamma. The two sisters looked at him, smiling. Bertha had it on her lips to say that it was not right for Addy to go about the streets alone, but she said nothing when the boy went up to his mother. He looked capable of protecting her and himself against anything, although he was only thirteen, against the dark night and against life that bore down so heavily upon their small souls. And a melancholy jealousy welled up in Bertha while Constance was kissing her goodbye. "'Don't be too bitter, Constance,' she whispered, "'and cherish, cherish that boy of yours.' End of chapter 19「Twenty of Small Souls by Louis Couperus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Constance, after this talk with Bertha, for days felt easier in her mind, as though filled with an indefinable contentment that bid fair to soothe and heal. Yes, she hoped that gradually she would win them all back like that, all her near ones, whom she had lost for years. She saw Mamma daily, and in these regular meetings between mother and child there was the sweetness of finding each other after long years of almost uninterrupted separation, a sweetness touched with a melancholy that held no bitterness, a mingling of glad tears and smiles over the happiness of it all. Also, Constance had now found Bertha again, although they did not see each other until Mamma's Sunday evening. Still, there was more sisterly confidence between them. While Marianne grew to like running in at the Kirchhofflan and would stay to dinner or go cycling with van der Velke and Addy. In this way, light bonds were established. As for Carol and Cato, Constance was sorry, for in Carol she still remembered the brother with whom she used to play on the boulders in the river at Bautenzor. But she had felt at once that she must not expect much from Carol now that he and his wife had become mutual images of placid egotism, wrapped in their well-fed middle-class life, in the sheltered comfort of their warm, shut house. No, Carol, she felt, she had lost, though they were conventionally civil to each other. With Gerrit it was pleasanter. Gerrit and Adeline would come now and then to take tea in the evening, after the children had gone to bed. Only it was a pity that Gerrit always insisted on crabbing and poking fun at the Van Nagels and their friends. This, Constance thought, was not very tactful towards van der Velke, because, though he and she did not go into society, it so happened that van der Velke had a good many old friends at the club who belonged to the aristocratic set. Gerrit was a boisterous, lively fellow, fair-haired, handsome, broad-shouldered and vigorous in his hussar's uniform. But his boisterousness was sometimes, she thought, rather overdone, and she suspected that van der Velke did not like Gerrit, thought him a little vulgar, and so she was always on the alert to take up the cudgels for Gerrit against her husband, and van der Velke said nothing about Gerrit, and was even amiable and talkative when Gerrit and Adeline were there. Adeline was a dear little woman, a fair-haired little doll mother, with her seven children, like a family of flaxen-haired dolls. The oldest a girl turned eight, the youngest a baby of a year or so, and Gerrit was always making jokes about not leaving off yet, and indeed Adeline was expecting another in the autumn. So Constance got on well with Gerrit and Adeline, but still she felt out of touch with this brother too even though Gerrit had such a charming way of bringing back the memory of their early days, when they used to play in the river at Bautenzor. Yes, she was an interesting child then, Gerrit always said. There was something so nice about her. She was full of imagination. And it was curious to hear this great heavy hussar going into ecstasies over that little sister of the old days, a frail fair-haired little girl in her white badju. She used to walk on her pretty little bare feet over the boulders and invent all sorts of fables and fairy tales, which her elder brothers were not quite capable of understanding, 
and yet had to play at good-humouredly, for the two brothers were very fond of their little sister. Yes, Gerrit always said, he had not understood until afterwards how much poetry there was in Constance in the days when she dreamed those stories, those fables in which she often played a fairy or a putri out of the Javanese legends. At such times she would wreathe her hair with a garland of broad leaves. She would look like Ophelia in the water, decked with tropical blossoms, and the brothers must needs follow the tiny bare feet and the fancies of their little sister, who looked marvellously charming as she ran over the great rocks, ran through the foaming water, ran in crystal green shadows, which quivered over the river, under the heavy awning of the foliage. Yes, that had left a great impression on Gerrit, and he often talked about it. Constance, do you remember? What a nice little girl you were then, though you were a little queer, until Constance would laugh and ask if she was no longer nice now that she no longer ran about barefoot in a white badju with purple kambang spatu on her temples. Then Gerrit shook his head and said yes, she was very nice still, but, but, and diving back into his recollections he said that, two years later, she suddenly changed, became grown up and a prig, and would dance with no one but the secretary-general. And then Constance cried with laughter, because Gerrit could never forget that secretary-general. Yes, she would only dance with the biggest bigwigs. She was a mass of vanity, a real daughter of the Twan Bazaar and it was as though Gerrit were bent upon getting back that little younger sister who used to make up fairy tales in the river behind the palace at Boutensor, notwithstanding that he was now a big, heavy, powerful fellow, and a captain of hussars. Then Constance would look at him, handsome, broad, fair-haired, vigorous, enjoying his drink or his good cigar, and she reflected that she did not know Gerrit, and did not understand Gerrit. Very vaguely, she felt something in him escape her, felt it so vaguely that it was hardly a thought, but merely a haze passing over her bewilderment. Adeline sat very quietly in the midst of it, smiling pleasantly at those reminiscences, those games of the old days. Yes, it's extraordinary, the way children play by themselves, she said simply, and then she would tell prettily of the games of her own fair-haired brood but Gerrit would shake his head. No, that was romping, what his boys did, but the other thing was playing, real playing, until Constance laughingly asked him to talk of something else than her bare feet, and then the conversation took a more ordinary turn, and it was as if both Gerrit and Constance felt that, although they liked each other, they had not yet found each other, and in this there was a very gentle melancholy that could hardly be formulated. Constance did not see much of Ernst. She and van der Velke and Addy had once lunched with him at his rooms, and he had been a most amiable host. He showed her the old family papers, which, after papa's death, he had asked leave to keep, because he took most interest in them, and they would be in good hands. He would leave them to Gerrit's eldest son. Gerrit was the only one of the four brothers who so far had provided heirs. He showed her his old china and called her attention to the different marks that were signs of its value. Next he spread out an old piece of brocade, embroidered with seed pearls, and said, very seriously, that it was a stomacher from a dress of Queen Elizabeth's. When Constance laughed and ventured to express a doubt, he became rather grave and almost angry, but graciously changed the conversation as one does, a little condescendingly with people who have said something stupid, who have not the same culture as ourselves. When they sat down to lunch in his room, with its beautiful old colouring, the table was so carefully laid, the flowers so tastefully arranged, with all the grace of a woman's hand, and the lunch was so exquisite and dainty, that Constance, amazed, had paid him a compliment. He half filled an antique glass with champagne, and drank to welcome her to Holland. There was about him, about his surroundings, about his manner, something refined and something timid, something feminine and something shy, something lovable and yet something reserved, 
as though he were afraid of wounding himself or another. He had obviously devised this reception in order to give pleasure to Constance. The conversation flagged. Ernst never completed his sentences, and his eyes were always wandering round the room. After lunch he was a little more communicative, and he then asked her if she had ever thought on the grace and symbolism of a vase. She listened with interest, while she saw something in van der Velke's glance, as though he thought that Ernst was mad, and Addy listened very seriously, full of tense and silent astonishment. A vase, Ernst said, was like a soul, and he took in his hand a slender satsuma vase of ivory-tinted porcelain, with the elegant arabesques waving delicately as a woman's hair. It was like a soul. For Ernst there were sad and merry vases, proud and humble vases, there were lovelorn vases, and vases of passion, there were vases of desire, and there were dead vases, which only came to life again when he put a flower in them. He said all this very seriously, without a smile, and also without the rhapsody of an artist or poet. He talked almost laconically about his vases, as though any other view would have been quite impossible. Constance had not seen him since that day, because he was the only one who did not come regularly to Mamma's Sunday evenings, and she retained an impression of that afternoon spent with her brother Ernst, as of something exotic and strangely symbolical. Something, it was true, which she had liked and found pleasant and refined, but which, all the same, lacked the familiar cordiality of a brother and sister meeting again after a separation of years. As regards Adolphine and her children, Constance, to a first sense of recoil, had almost unconsciously laid down rules for her feelings, though perhaps she did not see those rules so very clearly outlined in her mind. But unconsciously, she positively refused to dislike Adolphine, and, on the contrary, was positively determined to think everything about Adolphine pleasant and attractive, her husband, her house, her children, and her ideas. If anyone, even Mamma, said the least thing about Adolphine, she at once espoused her cause, violently. Through circumstances such as the arranging of her own house and Emily's wedding, she had not as yet been often to the Van Satsumas, but she promised herself not to neglect this in future, and, with the greatest tact, to advise Adolphine in all sorts of matters. It operated strangely in Constance, the feeling of recoil, which, after all, was there, an absolute determination to act against this feeling of recoil, and, combined with these two, a silent wish, a gentle resolve to improve Adolphine in one way and another. She insisted that Addie should ask Adolphine's boys to lunch one Sunday, and, though her nerves were racked and she driven almost mad by their rude manners and coarse voices, she had controlled herself and deliberately played the kind auntie. Addy, sacrificing himself for Mamma's sake, had gone out walking with his cousins, but had taken the first opportunity of giving the young louts the slip. Knowing his mother's idiosyncrasies, he did not say much when he returned, and even declared that they were not half bad fellows. When his father, however, asked him if he understood why Mamma encouraged those unmannerly cubs, Addy stoically replied, because they were cousins, one of Mamma's ideas, family affection. Constance, meanwhile, was so tired of the three young Van Satsumas that she did not venture to repeat the experiment. Constance thought Doreen uncertain. Doreen was very pleasant sometimes to go shopping with, or would go shopping herself for Constance. It was she who asked, not Constance. And then, at other times, Doreen would be cold and nervously irritable. This was because Doreen had a positive mania for doing all sorts of things for other people, but at the same time was always craving for appreciation, and never thought that she was sufficiently appreciated by any member of the family for whose benefit she ran about. But the mania was too strong for her, and she went on running about, for Mamma, for Bertha, for Constance, for Adolphine, and was always grumbling to herself that she was not appreciated. 
Yes, she would like to see their faces, if she, Doreen, said one day that she was tired. What would they say, she wondered, if she ventured to suggest that one sometimes gets wet in the rain? Thus she always grumbled to herself, fitful, dissatisfied, discontented, and yet never able to make a comfortable corner for herself in the boarding-house where she lived, always tearing along the street from one sister to the other. It was as though she had a mania that drove her ever onwards. She was miserable if a day came when she had no errands to run, and she would go to Adolphine and say, Look here, if you'd like me to go to Isa Reefs and ask about those pillowcases for Florcher, you've only got to say so. I'm going that way anyhow. And then, when she went that way, she muttered to herself, At it again! Of course, there's only Doreen to inquire about Florcher's pillowcases. Why can't the girl go herself? Or why don't they send the maid? Paul was the one whom Constance saw most often of all the brothers and sisters. He had begun by finding in her a fairly sympathetic listener for his endless unbosomings and philosophizings. Then van der Velke liked him best, and they sometimes had a cigarette together in the smoking room. He was the most of a brother to them of the four, just an ordinary brother. He would arrive in the morning and run straight up to Constance's room, while she was still dressing, and declare that of course he could come in, though she was in her petticoat. When not too long-winded, he had an interesting way of talking which van der Velke appreciated. He always looked at Addy with the eye of a philosopher, and Addy liked him, found him great fun, with his exquisite trousers and wonderful neckties. Constance was fond of him, and it was in Paul that she had really for the first time met a brother again, in Paul, who had come least within her ken in the old days when she was a girl of twenty, and he a child of thirteen. Translator's Note Kambang Spatu, Tropical Flowers Tuan Basar, The Great House, that is, the Viceregal Palace at Bautenzorg. End of chapter 20「Chapter Twenty One of Small Souls by Louis Couperus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. So you're thinking of being presented at court next winter, said Van Freesweyck, who had been a chum of Henry's at Leiden, and who was now a chamberlain extraordinary to the Queen Regent, as he and Van der Velke were leaving the Platz together. Van der Velke looked up. I wasn't thinking of it for a second. Really? I heard that you meant to, or rather that it was your wife's intention. I haven't exchanged a single word on the subject with my wife. Van Freesweyck took van der Velke's arm. Really? Well, to tell you the truth, I could not quite understand it. Why not? asked van der Velke, promptly taking offence. Look here, old fellow, I can speak to you frankly, can't I? As an old friend... "'But if you're touchy, then we'll avoid intimate matters. "'Not at all. What were you going to say? "'Nothing that you won't see for yourself if you think for a moment. "'But if the whole question of getting presented at court "'doesn't exist with you and your wife, "'then don't let me bring it up at all.' "'No, no,' said van der Velke, becoming interested. "'Don't beat about the bush. Say what you mean to say. "'I couldn't understand your having the idea.' or how the idea could ever have occurred to your wife. I tell you so honestly. The Staffela is a relation of the Eilenbergs, and of the Van Steins, and it would surely be painful for you and your wife to meet those people, wouldn't it? That's all. Short and sweet, said van der Velke, still feeling put out. But that's the whole point of it. You're right, muttered van der Velke gloomily. Perhaps we ought never to have come to The Hague. Nonsense, said van Freesweyck rather feebly. Your old friends are glad to see you back again. The question of the court is non existent with you both. Well, then, there's nothing to fret about. As for myself, I'm more than glad to see you at The Hague again, he continued, more cheerfully, almost in a tone of relief. 
I have the pleasantest memories of the occasions when I had the privilege of meeting your wife in Brussels. When would it suit you both for me to come and call? Will you look round one evening? Or if you really want to be friendly, come and dine. I should like to. Above all things, when shall I come? Day after tomorrow, at seven. Delighted. Just yourselves. And I'll call and leave a card tomorrow. By the way, said van der Velke, you mentioned a Staffeler. Where is he now? At his country place near Harlem. He's still flourishing. He's well over eighty. He must be. They parted. Van der Velke went gloomily home. It was curious, but every afternoon when he went home from the Witter or the Platz, he had that gloomy, unsettled feeling. The moment he set eyes on Addy, however, his face at once lighted up. But this time, when the boy wanted to romp before dinner, van der Velke began to think whether Constance would approve of his having asked van Freysweig to dinner two days later. They sat down to table. "'By the way,' said van der Velke, hesitatingly, "'I met van Freysweig, and he wanted to call on you, and asked when it would suit you. "'He might have done so long ago.' said Constance, who had entertained van Freysweig once or twice in Brussels. He apologised, said van der Velke, in defence of his friend. He did not know whether you were quite settled. I told him he must come and dine one night, and, if it's not too much trouble for you, I asked him to come the day after tomorrow. I think he might have paid a visit first. He said something about leaving a card tomorrow, but if you don't care about it, I'll put him off. No, "'It's all right,' said Constance. It was an instinct with her to be hospitable, to have her house always open to her friends. But until now, she had dreaded asking anyone to meals, except Gerrit and Adeline, quite quietly, and just once, Paul. Paul happened to call that evening. "'Do you mind if I ask Paul, too?' she said to her husband. "'No, of course not. Paul is delightful.' Paul accepted with pleasure. On the evening of the little dinner, he was the first to arrive. Addy is dining with Gerrit and Adeline, she said. It will be nicer for him. How charming you've made your place, Luke, said Paul enthusiastically. She had a pretty little drawing room, cosy and comfortable and gay with many flowers in vases, and she looked most charming, young with the attractive pallor of her rounded face the face of a woman in her prime, and a smile in the dimples about her lips, because the graciousness of a hostess was natural to her. Paul thought her the best-looking of all his sisters as she stood before him in her black dress, a film of black mousseline de soie and black lace falling in a diaphanous cloud over white taffeta. There reigned in her rooms, in herself, the easy grace of a woman of the world, a quality which Paul had not yet observed in her, because until now he had seen her either quite intimately in her bedroom or at those crowded family evenings. It was as though she had come into her own again. Yes, as she now welcomed van Freytsvijk with a soft, playful word or two, Paul thought her simply adorable. He suddenly understood that ten years ago his sister might well have been irresistible. Even now she had something about her so young, so charming, engaging, pretty and distinguished, that she was a revelation to him. She was an exquisite woman. She had not hired a manservant. The parlourmaid would wait. She herself drew back the hangings from the dining-room doorway and, without taking van Freysweig's arm, asked the men to come in to dinner. A pink light of shaded candles slumbered over the table with its bunch of grapes and its pink roses and maidenhair fern in between the crystal and the silver. "'But this is most charming,' said Paul to himself, for he could not tell his sister so yet, as she and van der Velke were talking to van Freysweig. "'This is most charming, a party of four, like this in this pretty room. That's just what I like. Compare all that formality of Bertha's. Bertha never gives these intimate little dinners.' This is just what I like at my age. Paul was thirty-five. No formality, but everything elegant and nicely served and good. 
excellent hors d'oeuvre constance knows how to do things compare the friendly but homely rump steak which i sometimes get at gerrit's and adeline's or adolphine's harem scarum dinners no this is as it should be a quiet friendly little dinner and yet everything just right van freysveig's dinner jacket looks very well on him only i don't like the cut of his waistcoat too high i think his waistcoat those are nice buttons of his but he's wearing a ready-made black tie how is it possible strange how you suddenly perceive an aberration like that in a man a ready-made tie who on earth wears a ready-made tie nowadays still he looks very well otherwise nice soup this velouté what a duck constance looks would you ever think that she was a woman of two and forty she's like mamma mamma also has that softness that distinction that same smile mamma even has those dimples still in the corners of her mouth no none of my other sisters could have done that pulled back the hangings herself with that pretty gesture and asked us so naturally to come in to dinner you'll see constance will make her house very cosy even though they are not rich and though they won't get into society officially these friendly little dinners are just the thing he had to join in the conversation now with van freysveig and van der velke who was in a pleasant mood let himself go in a burst of irrepressible frankness tell me freysveig who is it that's been saying we wanted to be presented at court van freysveig hesitated thought it a dangerous subject of conversation but constance laughed gently yes she said seconding her husband there seems to be a rumour that we have that intention and the intention never existed for a moment van freysveig breathed again relieved oh my frau how do people ever get hold of their notions one will suggest i wonder if they mean to be presented the other catches only the last words and says they mean to be presented and so the story gets about i shouldn't care for it in the least said constance i've become so used of late to a quiet life that i should think it tiresome to be paying and receiving a lot of visits i'm glad to be at the hague because i'm back among my family and the family is very glad too said paul with brotherly gallantry and raised his glass she thanked him with her little laugh but i want nothing more than that and i don't think henry cares for anything else either no not at all said van der velke only i can't understand why people at once start talking about others and without a moment's hesitation pretend to know more about a fellow's plans than he himself does i never talk about anybody i must admit constance laughed that i often differ from my husband but in this we are absolutely at one i too never talk about anybody but that people should talk about us is only natural i suppose said van der velke and threw up his young blue eyes almost ingenuously they had forgotten us for years and now they see us again he oughtn't to have said that thought paul sometimes he is just like a young colt and he could understand that constance occasionally felt peevish these allusions however slight must necessarily vex her he thought van der velke when he let himself go was capable of saying very tactless things he generally restrained himself but when he did not he became too spontaneous for anything and paul said something to van freysveig to change the conversation yes paul felt for his sister after all that sort of past always remained always clung about one they were sitting here so cosily van freysveig was a charming talker and yet at every moment there were little rocks against which the conversation ran constance was behaving well thought paul he had seen her quite different flying out at the least word but she was a woman of the world she did not fly out before a stranger here they were again though the conversation was turning on old mr and mrs van der velke there they were again he felt that van freysveig hesitated even before asking after the old people 
and not until Constance herself said that she thought them both looking so well, did Van Freysvike venture to go on talking about that father and mother-in-law, who had sacrificed their son, who had refused for years to see their daughter-in-law, and even their grandchild. Surely it was better to talk about indifferent things. But this was not only one of Constance's handsome, but also one of her amiable evenings. As a hostess, in however small a way, she came into her own, and was like another woman, much more gentle, without any bitterness, and ready to accept the fact that a rock had to be doubled now and again. Her smile gave to her cheeks a roundness that made her look younger. What a pity, thought Paul, that she was not always just like that, so full of tact, always the hostess in her own house, hostess to her husband too. How strange women are, he thought, if I were dining here alone with them in the ordinary course of things, and if these same rocks had occurred in the conversation, Constance would have lost her temper three times by now, and van der Velke would have caught it finely, and now that there's a guest, now that we are in our dinner jackets and Constance in an evening frock, now that there are grapes and flowers on the table and a more elaborate menu than usual, now she does not lose her temper, and won't lose her temper, however many rocks we may have to steer past. I believe that, even if we began to talk about infidelity and divorce, about marriages with old men and love affairs with young ones, she would remain quite calm, smiling prettily, with those little dimples at the corners of her mouth, as though nothing could apply to her. What strange creatures women are, full of little reserves of force that make them very powerful in life. And presently, when van Freysweig is gone, she will rave at van der Velke if he so much as blows his nose, and all her little reserve forces will have vanished, and she will be left without the smallest self-control. Still, in any case, she is most charming, and I have had a capital dinner, and am feeling very pleasant. The bell rang, and through the open door leading to the hall, Constance and Paul heard voices at the front door. "'That's Adolphine's voice,' said Constance. "'And Carolinchus," said Paul. "'Oh, then I won't stay,' they heard Adolphine say, loudly, shrilly. Constance rose from her chair. She thought it a bore that Adolphine should call in just this evening, but she was bent upon never allowing Adolphine to see that she was unwelcome. "'Excuse me, Mr. Van Freysweig, for a moment. I hear my sister.' She went out into the passage. "'How are you, Adolphine? How are you, Constance?' said Adolphine. She knew that Constance was giving a little dinner that evening, and she had come prying on purpose, though she pretended to know nothing. "'I just looked in,' she said, "'as I was passing with Carolincha. I saw a light in your windows, and thought you must be at home. "'But your servant says you are having a dinner-party.' said Adolphine, tartly and reproachfully, as though Constance had no right to give a dinner. Not a dinner party. Van Freysweig and Paul are dining with us. Van Freysweig? Oh, said Adolphine, the one at court. He's a chamberlain of the regents, said Constance simply. Oh, he's an old friend of van der Velke's, said Constance, almost in self-excuse. Oh, well then, I won't disturb you. The dining room door was open. Adolphine peeped in and saw the three men talking over their dessert. She saw the candles, the flowers, the dinner jackets of the men. She noticed Constance's dress. Do come in, Adolphine, said Constance, mastering herself, and in her gentlest voice. No, thanks. If you're having a dinner party, I won't come in at dessert. Oof! How hot it is in here, Constance. Do you still keep on fires? It's suffocating in your house, and so dark with those candles. How pale you look. Aren't you feeling well? Pale? No, I'm feeling very well indeed. Oh, I thought you must be tired or ill. You look so awfully pale. You're not looking well. Perhaps you've put on too much powder. 
or is it your dress that makes you look pale? Is that one of your Brussels dresses? I don't think it improves you. Your grey cashmere suits you much better. Yes, Adolphine, but that's a walking dress. Oh, of course, you can't wear that at a dinner, at a dinner party. Still, I prefer that walking dress. Won't you come in for a moment? No, I'm only in walking dress, you see, Constance dear, and Caroline should too. And then, I don't want to disturb you at your men's dinner party. I'm sorry, Adolphine, that you should have called just this night. If you won't come in, come in to tea some other evening soon, will you? Well, you see, I don't often come this way. You live so far from everywhere in this depressing Kirkhoflan. At least, I always think it depressing. What induced you to come and live here, tell me, between two graveyards? It's not healthy to live in, you know, because of the miasma. Oh, we never notice anything. Ah, that's because you always keep your windows shut. You want more ventilation, really, in Holland. I assure you, I should stifle in this atmosphere. Come, Adolphine, do come in. No, really not. I'm going. Make my apologies to your husband. Goodbye, Constance. Come, Karolincha. And as though she were really suffocating, she hurried to the front door with her daughter, first glancing through the open door of the dining room, noticing the hot house grapes, the pink roses, screwing up her eyes to read the label on the champagne bottle from which Paul was filling up the glasses. Then she pushed Karolincha before her and departed, slamming the front door after her. Constance went back to the dining room. Her nerves were shaken, but she kept a good countenance. It was Adolphine, wasn't it? asked Paul. Yes, but she wouldn't come in, said Constance. It's such a pity. She's such good company. She did not mean it, but she wished to mean it. That she said so was not hypocrisy on her part. Any other evening, after Adolphine's comments, all in five minutes, on her house, her street, her candles, her fires, her dress and her complexion, she would probably have flung herself at full length on her sofa to recover from the annoyance of it. But now she was the hostess, and she showed no discomposure, and asked the men not to mind her, and to stay and smoke their cigars with her at the dinner table. She herself poured out the coffee from her dainty little silver gilt service, and the liqueurs, and when Paul asked her if she would not smoke a cigarette, she answered with her pretty expression, and the little laugh at the bend of her lips which made her so young that night, had caused her to look so very charming. No, I used to smoke, in my flighty days, but I gave it up long ago. End of chapter 21「Twenty Two of Small Souls by Louis Couperus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Maricha von Satsuma stood at the window and looked out into the street. She looked down the whole street, because the house, her corner house, stood not in the length of it, but in the width, half closing the street, making it a sort of courtyard of big houses. The street stretched to some distance, and another house part closed the farther end, turning it actually into a courtyard, occupied by well-to-do people. The two rows of gables ran along with a fine independence of chimney-stacks, of little cast-iron pinnacles, and pointed zinc roofs, little copper weathercocks, and little balconies and bow-windows, as though the architects and builders had conspired to produce something artistic and refused to design one long, monotonous gable line. But the new street, it was about twenty years old, had nevertheless retained the Dutch trimness that characterises the dwellings of the better classes. The well-scrubbed pavements ran into the distance, growing ever narrower to the eye with their grey hem of curbstone, their regularly recurring lamp-posts. In the middle of the street was a plantation, oval grass plots surrounded by low railings, in which were chestnut trees neatly pruned, and beneath them 
a neat shrubbery of dwarf firs. The fronts of the houses glistened with cleanliness after the spring cleaning. The tidily laid bricks displayed their rectangular outlines, clearly even at a distance. The window frames were bright with fresh paint, dazzling cream colour or pale brown. The blinds, neatly lowered in front of the shining plate glass windows, were let down in each house, precisely the same depth, as though mathematically measured, and the houses concealed their inner lives very quietly behind the straight, nicely balanced lace curtains. And this was very characteristic, that above each gable there jutted a flagstaff, held aslant with iron pins, the staff painted a bright red, white and blue, the national colours, as though wound about with ribbons, with a freshly gilded knob at the top. All those flagstaffs, a forest of staffs with their iron pins, for ever aslant on the gables, waited patiently to hoist their colours, to wave their bunting twice a year, for the Queen and her mother, the Regent. Maricha looked out. It was May, and the chestnuts in the grass plots tried to outstretch and unfurl their soft, pale green fans, now folded and bent back against their stalks. But a mad wind whirled through the street, which was like a courtyard of opulence, and the wind scourged the still-furled chestnut fans. The girl looked at them compassionately, as they were whipped to and fro by the wind, the eager young leaves which, full of vernal life and pride of youth, were trying hard to unfold. The tender leaves were full of hope, because yesterday the sun had shone, after the rain, out of a flood-swept sky, and they thought that their leafy days were beginning their life of leaves budding out from stalk and twig. They did not know that the wind was always at work, lashing as with angry scourges, with stinging whips. They did not know that their leafy parents had been lashed last year, even as they were now, and, though they loved the wind, upon which they dreamt of floating and waving and being merry and happy, they never expected to be lashed with whips, even before they had unfurled all the young bravery of their green. The wind was pitiless, the wind lashed through the air like one possessed, like a madman that had no feeling, strong in his might and blind in his heartlessness. And the girl's pity went out to the eager leaves, the young hoping leaves, which she saw shaken and pulled and scourged, and driven withered across the street. The blind, or powerful northeast wind filled the street. The weathercocks spun madly. The iron pins of the flagstaff creaked goutily and painfully. The flagstaffs themselves bent, as though they were the masts of a fleet of houses moored in a roadstead of bricks. The girl looked out into the street. It was a May morning. Standing in front of one house, and looking for all the world like sailors on a ship, were men dressed in white sailors' jackets, busy fixing ladders and climbing up them to clean the plate-glass windows. They swarmed up the ladders, carrying pails of water, and in the midst of the forest of masts, of the red, white and blue flagstaffs, they looked like seamen, gaily rigging a ship. Along the streets went the brightly painted carts of a laundry, a pastry cook, a butter factory. Hard behind came loud-voiced hawkers, pushing barrows with oranges, and the very first purple-stained strawberries. And the whole economy of eating and drinking of those tidy houses, whose life lay hidden behind their lace curtains, filled the morning street. Butcher boys prevailed. Each house had a different butcher. Broad and sturdy, the boys walked along in their clean white smocks, carrying their wicker baskets of quivering meat, held with a fist at the handle, firmly on shoulder or hip, bending their bodies a little because of the weight, and they rang at all the doors. Sometimes a couple bicycled swiftly down the street. At all the houses they delivered loads of meat, beefsteaks and rump steaks and fillet steaks and ribs, and sirloins of beef, and balls of forced meat. 
the maidservants took the meat in at the front doors with an exchange of chaff, and then closed the door again with a bang. The butcher boys largely prevailed, but the greengrocers, with their barrows, arranged with fresh vegetables, were also many in number. The dairy, with its cart filled with polished copper cans, rang at every door, and notable for its ostentatious neatness was a van conveying beer in cans. The driver, who was constantly getting down and ringing, wore a sort of brown shooting suit, with top boots and a motor cap. The cart was painted with earthenware cans, swelling out in relief from the panels. A barrel organ quavered on, playing a very doleful tune. The organ man ground out a bit of dolefulness, stopped, and then pushed on again. His old woman rang at every door, put the coppers she received in her pocket, as if she were collecting so many debts. Each time the maids in their lilac print dresses appeared at the doors, or leant out, and looked from the open windows of the bedrooms, or called out and flung down the rich man's dole of coppers. Domestic economy filled the street, while the wind, the blundering mighty wind, blew on. A gentleman passed on his way to his office, hugging a portfolio. Two girls flew by on bicycles, a lady hurried along on some urgent errand, but for the rest there was nothing but the economy of eating and drinking. It filled the street, it rang and rang and rang, until all the houses chimed with the ringing. And the houses took in their supplies. The streets grew quiet. Only the wind blew the young chestnut leaves to pieces, and the flagstaffs groaned on their creaking, gouty pins. Maricha turned away. She was a pale, fair-haired little thing of sixteen, with pale blue eyes and a white, bloodless skin. Her hair, brushed off her forehead, was already done up behind into a knob. She wore a little pinafore to protect her frock, and now she sat down at the piano and began to tap out her scales. The room in which Maricha was practising was the drawing room. It was a fairly large room on the first floor, but it was so terribly crammed with furniture arranged in studied confusion, with an affectation of elegance, that there was hardly space to move about or sit. On the backs of all the chairs hung fancy antimacassars, flattened by the pressure of reclining forms, with faded and crumpled ribbons. On all sorts of little tables stood nameless ornaments, little earthenware dogs and china smelling bottles, set out as in a tenpenny bazaar. The wallpaper displayed big flowers, the carpets more big flowers of a different species, while on the curtains blossomed a third kind of flower, and the colours of all these flowers yelled at each other like so many screeching parrots. In the corners of the room rose dusty Macart's bouquets, which decorated those same corners year in, year out. Maricha played her scales in the drawing room, while the wind howled down the chimney which smelt of soot after the winter fires. Conscientiously, Maricha played her scales with her stubborn little fingers, constantly making the same mistake, which she did not hear, and therefore did not correct, thinking that it was right as it was. Now and then she looked up through the window. Poor trees, thought Maricha, poor leaves, see how the wind's killing them, and they're hardly open yet. She played on, conscientiously, but she dearly wished that she could make the wind stop, to save the leaves, the young chestnut's leaves. She remembered it was just the same thing last spring, the spring before that it was the same too, and then, when the chestnut's leaves were at last able to unfurl themselves, in a quiet, windless moment, then they were scorched and shriveled for the whole summer, for their whole leafy lives. Poor trees, poor leaves. The stubborn fingers went on conscientiously, tapping out the scales, and constantly playing that same wrong note with almost comical persistency. Da! The front doorbell was constantly going, ting-a-ling, ting-a-ling. All those noises, the wind, phew, boo, 
the scales. Da, 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 da. The front doorbell. Ting-a-ling, ting-a-ling. The barrel organs in the street. Two going at the same time. The colours indoors. The colours of the wallpaper and curtains and carpet. Screeching like parrots. The cries of the costermongers outside. Strawberries! Fine strawberries! The rattle of the greengrocer's carts clattering over the noisy cobblestones. All these noises rang out together, and it was as though the wind defined and accentuated each individual sound, blowing away a mist from each sound, leaving only the rough, resonant kernel of each sound to ring out against the glittering plate-glass windows along the goutily creaking flagstaffs. Into this room, where the parrot colours jabbered aloud, it blew and rang and screeched and jabbered, and the girl with her continual false note, da, heard none of it, but thought only, Oh, those poor trees! Oh, those poor leaves! in her gentle little hypersensitive soul. Used as she was to the wind, the noises and the colours, she saw nothing but the trees, heard nothing but the rustling of the leaves, nor heard her own persistence, little false notes. Da! Ting-a-ling, ting-a-ling, went the bell, and the wind must have rushed through the front door and up the stairs, for the drawing-room door blew open as lightly as though the great door had been no more than a sheet of note-paper. The maid came pounding up the stairs, the stairs creaked, another door slammed, the maid at the door screamed out something loud through the house loud through the wind, loud through all the sounds and colours. Another voice sounded sharply in reply. The maid went pounding down again. The stairs creaked, and bang went the door. "'Will you please go upstairs, my frau?' "'Come upstairs, Cato. "'But am I really not disturbing you, Adolphine?' "'No, come up. "'What a wind, eh, fiend? "'Eh?' How it's blowing! Da 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 da! Went Maricha's scales as Mamma entered with Aunt Cato. Phew! Boo! Blew the wind. Crack! Crack! Went the flagstaff outside the window. Good morning, Maricha, and tell me, Fien, was it a regular dinner? Yes, it was a formal dinner. Oh! So they do see people, and I thought they lived so quietly. We are never asked there. Are you, Adolphine? No, never. I do think she might also sometimes show a little politeness to her brothers and sisters. We never see people, as you know, don't you, Adolphine? Carol doesn't care for it. He only cares for quiet. I should rather like it. But it's Carol, you see, who doesn't care for it. And who were there, Adolphine? Oh, well, they know nobody, so it looked to me rather like a failure. Nobody except that phrase, Fike. No doubt they had one or two refusals, for they'd asked Paul to make up the party. Oh, Paul! No doubt one or two must have refused. Yes, of course. Well, really, Constance is. But then, I don't call a dinner like that a success. Do you, Adolphine? No, I thought it ridiculous. A dinner party of four. Were the men dressed? Yes, dressed. And Constance, low-necked? No, not low-necked, but smart as paint. And champagne. Really, champagne as well? Yes, a cheap brand, and the room's so dark. I didn't think it respectable. Such a dim light, you know. Quite disreputable, I thought, with those three men, said Adolphine, whispering because of Maricha. She can't hear. She's playing. Oh, really? And what's next? Well, I think if Constance wants to see people in that sort of way, she could have done so just as well in Brussels. She's supposed to have come here for the family. But she doesn't ask the family. 
"'Oh, you mustn't count us, Fien. "'We always live very quietly. "'It's Carol, you see. "'But I feel sure now that she means to get presented at court. "'Yes, by Freysweik, no doubt. "'Will he present her to the Queen?' asked Kato, rounding her owl's eyes. "'Oh, no,' said Adolphine irritably. "'But they mean to push themselves with his assistance.' "'Oh, is that the way it's done? "'You see, we know nothing about the court. "'You wouldn't get Carol to go to court for anything, "'not if you paid him. "'But now it's quite certain.' "'Yes, I'm convinced of it now. "'About the court? "'Yes. "'Oh, well, I always thought that Constance "'would have too much tact for that.' "'And may I have a look at Florcha's trousseau now, Adolphine? "'She'll be married quite soon now, won't she? "'In a week? "'Ah, and I always think it's so nice to be married in May, "'don't you, Adolphine?' "'The two sisters' voices whined and snarled, "'the stairs creaked, the doors slammed. "'Da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da!' went the scales.' Phew! Boo! Phew! went the wind, roaring down the sooty chimney. Crack! Crack! went the gouty flagstaff. Strawberries! Fine strawberries! shouted the costermonger outside. Da! went Maricha's obstinate false note. The girl looked up through the window. Those poor trees! thought Maricha. Oh, those poor leaves! End of chapter 22、二十一世紀の世界を描いた。Adolphine attached more importance to her own house, her own children, her own furniture, her own affairs, matters and things, than to anything else in the world. She was never tired of displaying for the extorted admiration of the sister or friend who came to visit her the thickness of her carpets, the heaviness of her curtains, the taste with which she had arranged the ornaments in her drawing room, and she praised all that belonged to her. Cried it up as though for a sale, inviting the appreciation of her sister or friend. In her heart of hearts, she was always afraid of being eclipsed, and, in order to conceal her fear from the other's eyes, she bragged and boasted of all her belongings. The fact that she was a Van Loer appeared in this that she included her husband and children and puffed them up also in her general self glorification, and in all her bragging. One could easily detect a shade of reproach against her family, her acquaintances, the Hague, because nothing about her was properly valued, not she, nor her husband, nor her house, nor her furniture, nor her ideas, nor the street she lived in. And she explained at great length to the friend or sister her way of thinking, of managing, of calculating, of bringing up children, of furnishing, of giving dinners, of ordering a dress. As though all of this was of such immense interest to the friend or sister that nothing more immense could be imagined. If thereupon the friend or sister, for the sake of conversation, in her turn described her own thoughts or arrangements or methods of entertaining, Adolphine was unable to listen to a word and showed plainly that the affairs of the sister or friend did not interest her in the least, and that, for instance, the quality of the covering of her. Adolphine's chairs, or the fresh air of the street in which she, Adolphine, lived, or the velvet of the collar of the greatcoat of Van Satsuma, Adolphine's husband, was of much greater importance. For she wanted the sister or friend to realize, above everything else, that in her, Adolphine's life, everything was of the best and finest kind. Things animate and inanimate, things movable and immovable alike. Adolphine's cook, the sister or friend was assured, cooked better than any other cook, especially than Bertha's cook. Adolphine's dog, 
A pug was the sweetest pug of all the pugs in the world, and while she bragged like this, she was filled with a deep-seated dread, asked herself almost unconsciously, Can my cook really cook? And isn't my pug, if the truth were told, an ill-tempered little brute? But these were deeply hidden doubts, and, to her family and friends, Adolphine boasted loudly of all and everything that belonged to her, and insisted upon an admiring appreciation of her children and furniture. It was part of her nature to want to be high-placed. She was her father's child, to be rich, to have everything fine and imposing and distinguished about her, and it was as though fate had compelled her from a child to have everything a little, a trifle less good than her family and friends. In reality, she was never satisfied, for all her boasting. In reality, she reproached life with its horrible injustice. As a child, she was a plain, unattractive girl, whereas Bertha was at least passable, and Constance was decidedly pretty. That Doreen was not pretty either did not console her. She did not even notice it. Both Bertha and Constance had been presented at court, one as a young woman, the other as a mere girl. After Constance's marriage, however, her father and mother had conceived a sort of weariness of society, and whenever Mamma did suggest that it was perhaps time for Adolphine to be presented too, Papa used to say, Oh, what good has it done the others? And for one reason or another, Adolphine had never been presented. She never forgave her parents, nor, for that matter, her sisters, but she always said that she did not care in the least for all that fuss about the court. She was married early, at twenty. She accepted Fansatsuma almost for fear, lest life should show itself unjust once more if she refused him. And Fansatsuma had proposed to her, even as hundreds of men proposed to hundreds of women, for one or other of those very small reasons of small people, which work like tiny wheels in small souls, and which others are not able to understand, so that they ask themselves in amazement, Why on earth did so-and-so do this or that? Why did this happen to so-and-so? Why did so-and-so marry so-and-so? Fansatsuma had a fine-sounding name, was a doctor of laws, had a little money. Adolphine had risked it, but while Van Nagel, after practising at the bar in India, was making his way through interest, through his political tact, through the influence of Papa Van Loa, who liked him, while Van Nagel was placed on all sorts of committees, each one of which raised him one rung higher in the official world of The Hague, until he was elected a member of the Second Chamber and at last entered the Cabinet as Colonial Secretary, Van Satsuma remained quietly jogging on at the Ministry of Justice, without ever obtaining any special promotion, without ever receiving any special opportunity, without being pushed on much by Papa Van Loa, just as though Papa, with a sort of stepfatherly disdain, had thought this as little worth while as having a dolphin presented at court. Van Satsuma was now chief clerk, was a respected public servant, performing his work accurately and well, and even valued by the secretary-general but there it ended. And this was the despair of Adolphine, who, ever since Van Nagel had become a minister, wanted to see her husband a minister too, a hope which there was not the least prospect of ever realising. And so Adolphine had had to look on at all Van Nagel and Bertha's distinction with envious eyes. And however much she might boast of everything that belonged to her, that distinction, which she would never achieve, remained a torture to her vanity. It had come of itself, in the course of Van Nachel and Bertha's life, through Papa's patronage, through Van Nachel's own connections and his over family, which had always played a part in the political history of the country. It had come of itself, that not only had Van Nachel attained a high level in his career, but his house had become a political and also an aristocratic salon at The Hague, as though, through their respective connections, Van Nagel and Bertha, after Papa Van Loa's death, had continued the tradition which, after the vice-regal period, had prevailed in the Alexanderstraat, where Mama was now left peacefully leading her afterlife as an old woman and a widow. 
On the other hand, Adolphine's house, in spite of all her wishes and endeavours, had never been anything more than an omnium gatherum, a rubbish heap. She lacked tact and the gift of discrimination. She thought that for her too to have a busy house would give her something of Bertha's importance and distinction, and so she paid visits right and left, and had a multitude of incongruous acquaintances, all belonging to different sets, the orthodox set, the Indian set, the official set, the military set, but not, alas, the court set, nor the leaven of aristocracy, which, after papa's death, at first used to leave a card once a year or so, but had gradually dropped her. And so it had come of itself, in the course of their, Van Satsuma and Adolphine's, life, that their house had become an ever-increasing omnium gatherum, a busy house, it is true, where they saw people, but a nondescript house, where no one ever knew whom one would meet, nor what the hostess was really aiming at. There was something maddening about Adolphine's way of turning her house into a busy house, crammed with people. She would propose, for instance, to give a small dinner five days later. She would ask eight people, but remember, two days before the dinner, that she might as well ask a few more. Then she would send round a few quite formal invitations, couched in terms which were out of keeping with the interval between the date of the invitation and the date of the dinner, with the results that, first of all, she utterly put out the hired chef, that sometimes there was a bottle of champagne short, and that her guests invariably appeared in every possible gradation of evening dress. Or else she thought of giving a big dinner, received a number of refusals, did not know whom to invite instead, asked people informally, or even by word of mouth, and found herself entertaining half a dozen guests with a superabundance of dishes and wine, while once again the men were dressed, one in a swallowtail coat and white tie, the other in a morning coat, the ladies, one in a low-necked bodice, the other in a blouse, a disparity that was constantly giving them fresh shocks of dismay. It was always a medley, and, even as she lacked the tack to give a successful dinner, she was doomed to lack the tack to achieve the distinction for which she craved. Her very husband thwarted her, a simple man, a little boorish in his ways, who trudged daily to his office and back, conscientious about his work like a schoolboy finishing his exercises, and devoid of any particular ability or political adroitness. He approved of what Adolphine did, but could not understand that craving, that vital need of hers for distinction. It was true that he had caught from his wife that exuberant satisfaction with his wife, his house, his children, his furniture and his friends. He knew too how to boast of his coat, his office, even his minister, his secretary-general. But Adolphine might have stood behind him with a whip and would still have urged him to the summits of earthly and hagish greatness. He was ponderous, fog-brained, a man who worked by rote, who went his way like a draft-ox, year in, year out, with the same heavy tread of a Dutch steer under heavy Dutch skies. He bore within him the natural instinct to be an inferior, an underling, to remain in the background, and there to go on working in an accurate, small-souled, worthy fashion, in the little groove in which he had first started. They had three boys and three girls, and they were not bad parents. They both of them loved their children and thought of their children's welfare, but they knew as little of a system of education as of a system of dinner-giving, and such education as existed in their house was as ramshackle as their friends, their rooms, their tables. It was especially where her children were concerned that Adolphine had that mania for having and doing everything in a very imposing fashion, a fashion at least as imposing as that in which Bertha had and did things for hers. As Adolphine, however, was the only one of the Van Loers who was, by exception, thrifty, her thrift often waged a severe struggle with her yearning for what was imposing. And so, whereas everything relating to the Van Nagel's household and the education of their children was conducted as a matter of course on the most expensive lines, which they both recognised as expensive, 
but which their tastes and their manner of life made it impossible to alter. Everything at Adolphine's was done cheaply. And so, whereas Louise and Emily and Marianne had been to expensive boarding schools near London and Paris, great country houses where the daughters of wealthy men received a fashionable education, with dancing lessons in ball dresses, drawing, painting and music lessons given by well-known masters, Adolphine, though inwardly eaten up with jealousy, pronounced those boarding schools simply absurd and quite beyond her means, and discovered one near Cleves, to which she sent Florcher and Caroline, a very respectable establishment, but one where German shopkeepers' daughters were taken in, and where a very different tone prevailed from that of the aristocratic schools near Paris and London. This, however, did not prevent Adolphine from extolling her boarding school as far above those silly, frivolous institutions to which Bertha had sent her children, and, as regards the boys, Adolphine magnified her three boys, Pete, Chris and Yap. The eldest was to enter the East Indian civil service. The two others were intended for Breda and Willemsort, which was better than those two spendthrift Leiden students, who were at it again, wanting some thousands of guilders for their approaching masks, and far better than that lazy lout of a carol. Also, Adolphine was always drawing comparisons between her Maricha, a gentle, fair, white-skinned little girl, a bit subdued amid the blatancy of the others, and Bertha's Maricha, comparisons invariably in her own child's favour. But now, after Emily's wedding with Van Raven, she drew comparisons more particularly between Emily's wedding preparations and all that she, Adolphine, was doing for Florcher and Dykerhoff. And brag and boast as she might, she, the exception among the Van Loers, the thrifty Adolphine who counted every tuppenny bit, where did she get those economical ideas from? Mamma Van Loer would sometimes ask herself, was unable to come within hailing distance of what Van Nagel and Bertha and the Van Ravens and their friends on both sides had done. She thought it absurd. She thought it's flinging money away. She grumbled to herself that everything had gone up so terribly in price. A deep-rooted prudence, an atavistic quality, a mysterious throwback, disapproved of that luxury of parties, trousseaus, presents, flowers with which Emily's wedding days had glittered. She thought it ridiculous. She wanted to do everything more economically, and yet she did not like doing everything so economically. And so there was an incessant struggle, both with herself and with Florcher, who also did not wish to be second to Emily, and who gave no thought to money. It was only her parents' money. But still, with her peculiar gift of self-glorification, Adolphine was now able to praise Florcher's trousseau to Cateau, above all those lace fripperies of Emily's. Much nicer and more lasting, I think, Adolphine, whined Cateau. Yes, and just look at those chemises. Look at those tablecloths and napkins. There's quality there, you can't beat it, said Adolphine, patting the stacks of linen in the cupboard and all those silly presents which Emily had, all that silver which she can't use. What do young people, who of course won't be seeing people for the first few years, want with so much silver? I'm very glad that our friends have been more practical in choosing their presents for Florcher. I shouldn't have been at all pleased if Florcher had been set up in her silver cupboard by people whom you make all acquaintances if you like, but who, after all, are strangers. Yes, whined Cato, at Emilich's reception. It looked just like Van Kempen's shop. I thought it so vulgar and common. Didn't you, Adolphine? The epithets were not exceptionally well chosen as applied to Van Nagel and Bertha. Even Adolphine could see that. But she admired her own purchases and her friend's presence too greatly to say so to Cato. End of chapter 23「Chapter 24 of Small Souls by Louis Couperus. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Constance made it a duty to go often to Adolphine's during Florcher's wedding preliminaries. She went out of her way to be cordial. She sent a beautiful basket of flowers on the day of the contract. She gave a handsome present, much more expensive than the one she had sent Emily, and she showed great interest in the party and the dinner that were to be given at the Witterbruch. She examined attentively the open presses with the stacks of linen composing Florcher's trousseau. Just look at those chemises and those tablecloths and napkins. There's quality there. You can't beat it. Just feel them. Only feel them. Where is those fripperies of Emily's? And listened attentively to the endless paeans of self-glorification, spent herself in admiration, was determined to flatter Adolphine and to make a good impression on her sister. Because during those days she had conscientiously set herself the task of winning over Adolphine, she swallowed the criticism that was never wanting. Little spiteful arrows shot off in between the peons. How pale you are looking! Have you been using too much powder again? Or aren't you well? What a pity that your boy is such an old gentleman, Constance! Tell me, Constance, your father and mother-in-law were not very nice to you, were they? Constance, are those rings of yours real? Oh, really? Upon my word, I thought one of those stones was paste. She swallowed it all, accepted the affront with a gentle smile, a word of almost assenting reply. Yes, Addie is rather old-fashioned. Oh, it was very difficult for Papa and Mamma van der Velke. You are right, that stone is a little dull sometimes. She swallowed it, took it all so gently and so submissively, that Addy, when he happened to be present, looked up at his mother in surprise, thinking her so different from the woman whom he knew, who blazed out for the least thing at papa, and who always behaved towards himself as the spoilt little mother, who wanted to be petted and loved by her boy. And the lad in his small, bright, earnest, doughty soul, felt a sort of amazement at that puzzle of a woman's soul that was his mother's. Are they all like that, so queer, or is it only Mamma? And why is she so forbearing towards Aunt Adolphine when she can't bear the least thing from Papa? This made him still more of a little man towards his mother, with something protecting and condescending, because she was so weak and irresolute and excitable, but also with very much that was affectionate because that strange womanliness possessed a charm for his small male soul. Adolphine, however, on the day when the contract was signed at the big family dinner at the Witterbruch, and the subsequent evening party for all the friends and relations, boasted aloud in her self-complacency. She bragged to Uncle Reuvener, to Carol and Cateau, to Constance, to Geritz and Adeline. Those were fine rooms! the rooms of the Witterbrug, much finer than the rooms in the Doolen. This was a splendid dinner, the dinner which she had given. It cost a lot of money, though, and she told how much, but added a couple of hundred guilders to the cost. And did they remember that impossible dinner of Bertha's at Emily's wedding, and the queer dishes that had been set before them? Wasn't it a splendid dessert, with beautiful strawberries, which she had given, and so many, and at this season too. But you had to pay for them, and how gay they had been at table, her family, as though that same family were not also Bertha's family, and her friends, so very different from that pretentious set of Bertha's. There was such a gay, spontaneous tone in the speeches and the conversation, and did Gerrit remember that deathly stillness at table at Emma Leach's dinner? Such nice people, Dykerhoff's parents, her girl's future father and mother-in-law, and how well Florcha looked, didn't she? And the other girls were prettily dressed too. She boasted so breathlessly of everything, of every detail, that neither uncle nor Gerrit had a single opportunity of expressing their appreciation, of giving voice to their admiration. And it was not until she had passed on, boasting right and left to her acquaintances. Well, what do you say to my dinner? Well, what do you say to my party? Well, what do you think of my dress? That Uncle Reuvener said, 
Anyone would think that Adolphine had built the Witterbrug herself. I think, whined Cato, Adolphine oughtn't to say those things herself. Don't you, Gerrit? Well, said Gerrit, it's a delightful feeling to be so pleased with your own self and your own children and your own dinner. But if you think as you do, Cato, why didn't you compliment her yourself? Because I think, whined Cato, whining worse than usual, that that dress doesn't look at all smart on Adolphine. What do you think, Adeline? Oh, I don't know, said Adeline good-naturedly. Constance, you have such very good taste. Do tell me, do you think that dress looks smart? I think Adolphine looks exceedingly well tonight, said Constance irritably. I say, Sissy, you can't mean that, said Gerrit. And even if you don't think so, Gerrit, it's not nice of you to speak like that of your sister. Eh, well, a little criticism. Yes, but to be always criticising one another is horrid, I think, said Constance angrily. I'm bound to say, though, that I think it's a ramshackle party, said Uncle Roivener. Who on earth are all these people? he continued, putting on dignity disdainfully. I say, Tutti, are you enjoying yourself? Yes, papa, awfully, said Tutti, as she passed on her partner's arm. The Rivener girls, though no longer young, always enjoyed themselves awfully, not caring whether it was at Bertha's or Adolphine's. Good-natured, kindly, simply and pleasantly Indian in their ways, they loved dancing. They always enjoyed themselves awfully. Uh, don't you? What do you think of my party? Oh, Adolphine, so jolly your party. I'm enjoying it awfully. And Dot also shone with gratitude and perspiration after dancing. Are those the Dykerhoff's friends? asked Mamma Van Loer in a whisper of Bertha, glancing towards a gentleman and a lady who had been introduced to her but whose name she had not caught. What strange friends those Dykerhoffs have! Such obscure people! One never knows who they are or what they are. Very vulgar people, I think. It's such a pity, Bertha, isn't it? Dykerhoff himself is not bad, and if Florcher is fond of him, well, I suppose it will be all right. But I must admit, I'm sorry that Adolphine is mixed up with this lot. And those people over there, Bertha, the stout man and the tall woman with whom Adeline is talking so familiarly, are those intimate friends. What curious friends she has. It must strike Constance, too, now that she's come back to it all. At our house there was a certain harmony, a set, as there is in your house now, Bertha. But at Adolphine's it's always such a queer lot, such a queer lot. I can't call it anything else. Goodness gracious, what a number of curious people. Mamma, said Paul, what do you think of this menagerie of Adolphine's? Oh, Paul, sighed the old lady, a little nervously, I was just saying to Bertha, but we mustn't let anyone else notice what we think. I say, Mamma, asked Gerrit, do you know who those two are? No, Gerrit. Van Nagel, do you know who those two people are? That stout gentleman and that tall lady? Yes, Mamma, it's Broyce and his wife. He's the editor of the phonograph. Very respectable people, Mamma. My dear Van Nagel. Utterly perplexed, the old lady passed on, leaning on Van Nagel's arm. Constance had overheard the comments of the family upon Adolphine's friends. She herself, newcomer that she now was in Hague society, was not so greatly struck by the fact that Adolphine's guests consisted of all sorts of dissimilar elements. She had sometimes at Rome had to suffer incongruous elements at her big receptions, and she had often found abroad that it was possible for witty, polished, cultured people to exist, even though they did not belong to her set. Then again, she considered that, at a wedding party, which was attended by relations, relations, and friends, friends, 
it was almost inevitable that the guests were sometimes entirely unknown to one another. Wasn't it the same at Bertha's party? Yes, Bertha had given two evening parties in order to separate the elements, but hadn't the family found fault with this? Was there nothing but fault-finding and criticising in the family, and did none think right what another did? Gerrit and Paul were now sitting beside her, and she heard them talking, condemning, criticising, ridiculing. Poor dear mother, she's quite bewildered. I say, Paul, are you allowing yourself to be introduced to Dykerhoff's uncles and aunts? I'm not going to be introduced to another soul, said Paul, wearily blinking his eyes. I'm here to make studies. The only way to amuse yourself in a Noah's Ark like this party of Adolphines is to make studies of the animal side of mankind. Look at Mrs. Broy's eating her cake with an almost animal satisfaction. Look at that uncle of Dykerhoff's dancing with Van Satsuma's cousin. It's almost disgusting. Paul, said Constance, I've known you wittier than you are tonight. My dear sister, I feel myself growing dull here. The figures and colours swarm before my eyes so hideously as really to cause me physical pain. My God, the charm of our modern life, the charm at an evening party of Adolphines. Where is it? Where is it? It's gone, it's gone, Gerrit noisily declaimed. Adolphine's charm is gone. I don't think either of you at all nice, Constance broke in irritably. Tell me, my dear brothers, is this irony, this fault-finding tone usual among us? Has it become a custom for the brothers and sisters to carp and cavil at one another, and even for mamma to cavil at her children, as I've heard you all do tonight? Does each of us criticise the other in a general cross-fire of criticism? I heard something of the kind at Bertha's party, but is there really nothing good here tonight? I feel bound to tell you, I think you very petty, provincial, narrow-minded and cliquey, even you, Paul, for all your philosophy. You, Gerrit, are afraid of demeaning yourself by allowing yourself to be introduced to a few of Dykerhoff's uncles and aunts, who perhaps you won't see three times again as long as you live. And as for you, Paul, why are you so spiteful in your comments on absolute strangers who don't eat a cake in the exact way which you approve of? I think Uncle Royven a ridiculous. He's not particularly well-bred himself, and he sneers at the breeding of Van Satsuma's friends. I think Cateau ridiculous. She hasn't the faintest pretensions to smartness, though her clothes may be good and substantial, and she criticises Adolphine's smartness. "'Oh, dear, gentle soul,' said Paul affectedly, and took Constance's hand. "'Oh, proud and noble one! Oh, heroine in a sacred cause! You are a revelation to me! How broad are the principles which you proclaim! How great your tolerance! It is terrible! Only you, dear, gentle soul, are not so sparing of the criticism which you criticise in us! Very well, I criticised you for once. "'but you're criticising others everlastingly. "'No, not quite, but we're only very small people, "'and we think it's fun to pass remarks on others,' said Gerrit. "'I am a very small person, like yourselves. "'I have never met big people in our set,' said Constance with a sneer. "'What is anyone in our set but small?' "'Good,' said Paul. "'Well done. You got that from me.' But proceed, my fond disciple. I am frightened, said Constance earnestly. You think I'm only just exciting myself a little, but I'm frightened. I'm simply frightened. I hear so much criticism from the mouths of my relations on every side. Criticism on a dress, on an evening party, on a couple of utter strangers who happen to be friends of my sister's that I'm frightened of the criticism of my relations concerning myself, myself, in whom there is so much to criticise. Come, sis, said Gerrit good-naturedly, restlessly stretching out his long legs. Mayn't I speak out my mind to my brothers? asked Constance. 
have I come back to The Hague, and to all of you, after being away for years, to behave as though nothing had happened to separate me from all of you who are dear to me? Oh, tender one, said Paul, hearken unto the words of wisdom of your younger brother. You are afraid of criticism because you fear that, where so much criticism is past, in such a hotbed of criticism as our family, you yourself will not escape a severe judgment. But let me tell you now that you don't know humanity, the humanity of small people. Small people criticise because they think it's fun, as Gerrit says. Criticise a dress or an evening party, but they never criticise life. To begin with, they're afraid to. Small people are interested only in what is not serious, in what is really not worth while. I don't believe you, said Constance. That's a clever phrase, Paul, and nothing more. I'm becoming distrustful when I hear so much criticising, even from Mamma on Adolphine. I ask myself, what will my mother, what will my brothers and sisters find to say of me? Oh, perhaps it can't be helped. Perhaps everything is insincere in our set. But not in our family, said Gerrit. You say that, Gerrit, with a nice sound in your voice. The captain of hussars, with a nice sound in his voice, said Paul. You silly boy, be serious for a moment, if you can. I am frightened, I am frightened. Honestly, it makes me nervous. Perhaps I did wrong. Perhaps I ought not to have come back here to The Hague among all of you. Are you so disappointed in your brothers and sisters? asked Gerrit. I am not complaining on my own behalf now. I am complaining on behalf of Adolphine. I think you others are not tolerant enough of anything that does not appeal to your taste. That's all. I am not complaining as far as I am concerned. You have all received me very nicely. Only I am frightened. I am frightened. I am frightened. Tell me, is it possible that there should be a strong family feeling, a mutual kindliness, when the daily criticism is so inexorable? The daily criticism in the family. What a good title for an essay. Paul, do be serious. My dear Connie, you know I can't. Alas, I can only be serious when I'm holding forth myself. Well then, I'll let you talk. That's generous of you. My Connie, you must remember this. It's a cruel law in our social life that parents care much for their children, but children less for their parents that the family bonds become still looser between brothers and sisters, and that those bonds gradually become wholly loosened between uncles and aunts and nephews and nieces and cousins. Family life may have existed in the days of the old patriarchs who went into the wilderness with sons and daughters and herds, but it has ceased to exist in our modern days. At Heritz, although he has no herds, a little bit of it may still exist, because his children are very many and very small. But when children are a little bigger, they want to stretch their wings, and then the family bonds get loosened. If children marry, then each child has his own family, for so long as it lasts, and his own interests, and the bonds that bound together the patriarchal family of the desert flap lightly in the wind. Now, how can you expect criticism? the greatest and cheapest fun that man can have at his fellow man's expense, not to be directed at relations, when the word relation is really only a synonym for stranger. There is no such thing as the family in modern society. Each man is himself. But in natures such as yours and mamma's, there remains something nice and atavistic that belongs to the patriarchal family of the desert. You would like to see the family exist with family love, love of parents for children and children for parents, of brothers and sisters and even nephews and nieces and uncles and aunts and cousins. Mamma, who has a simple nature, has instituted for the satisfying of that feeling a weekly evening, but which we, who are related by blood but not by interest, meet out of deference for an old woman whom we do not want to grieve, whom we wish to leave in her illusion. You, my noble, gentle one, with your more complex character, 
feel a more powerful yearning for the old patriarchal life of the desert, especially after the sorrow and loneliness which you have known in your life, and you come to The Hague, with your pastoral ideas, to find yourself in the midst of polished cannibals, who rend one another daily into tiny pieces, and eat one another up with their family criticism. That your gentle nature should be shocked at the spectacle was only to be expected. So, we are all strangers to one another, said Constance, and a chilly feeling passed over her. A melancholy rose within her at the sound of those words of Paul's, half banter, half earnest. We are strangers to one another. That feeling which I felt to be deep and true within myself when I was abroad, and which drove me back to my family and my country, is what you call atavistic, and has no reason for existence since we no longer live in mosaic times. So, we are strangers to one another, we who, for Mamma's sake, continue to greet one another as relations once a week at her Sundays, because otherwise we should give her pain. And my longing for you all, whom I had not seen for twenty years, my yearning for you which brought me back to my own country, was no more than an illusion, a phantom. Well, Connie, perhaps I was cruel, but really, you are so pastoral. Country, native country, my dear child, what beautiful phrases, how well you remember your Dutch. I have forgotten the very words. Sis, dear. Gerrit interrupted. Don't listen to the fellow. He's talking nonsense. He denies everything because he loves to hear himself speak and because he is a humbug. Tomorrow he will be defending the country and the family, just as he is demolishing them tonight. No, sis, believe me, there are such things as family in one's native country. Listen to the captain, the defender of his country, with a nice sound in his voice. There is such a thing as family, not only with me because my children are still young, as Paul has been trying to explain, but everywhere, everywhere. I feel that you are my sister, even though I didn't see you for twenty years. I did not recognise you at once, perhaps. Perhaps I have not quite got you back yet. When I think of Constance, I always think of my little sister who used to play in the river at Boutensor. Oh, credit! Don't begin about my bare feet again, said Constance, raising her finger. But I feel that you are not a stranger, that there is a bond between us, a relationship, something almost mystical. Oh, I say, what a poetic captain of hussars, cried Paul, once he lets himself go. And country, one's native country, Gerrit continued impetuously. There is such a thing as one's country. I feel it in me, Paul, you sceptic and philosopher, old before your time. I feel it in me, not as something poetical and mystical, my boy, like the family feeling, but as something quite simple, when I ride at the head of my squadron. I feel it as something big and primitive, and not at all complex, when I escort my queen. I feel that there exists for me a land where I was born, out of which I have grown. Adelincha, Paul beckoned. Do come here, Adelincha. Your husband is so poetic. You must really listen to him. The fair-haired little mother came up. I feel that if anyone says anything about Holland, about my native land, criticises it, speaks a disrespectful word of my sovereign, I feel something here, here in my breast. Adelincha, do listen. Your husband is not an orator but he still feels that he feels something. In short, he feels loud cheers for the captain of Hussars, with the soft note in his voice and the mystic feelings. Gerrit, they are teasing you, said Adeline. Gerrit shrugged his shoulders, a little angrily, a little uncomfortably, and stretched his long legs across the carpet. Gerrit, said Constance, I'm glad you said what you did. It's all nonsense, growled Gerrit. There is a tendency, not only in Paul, he's a humbug, but in all sorts of people in our set, Constance, of which you were speaking so scornfully just now, to run Holland down, to think nothing Dutch good, 
to think our language ugly, to think everything French, English or German better than Dutch. Those are your smart Dutch people, Constance, your Hague people, whom you meet in Bertha's drawing-room, Constance. If they go abroad for a couple of months, they've forgotten their mother tongue when they come back. But let them be three years without going to Paris, London or Berlin. They'll never, never forget their French, their English or their German. Oh, they know their foreign languages so well. Gerrit, said Paul, what you say is true, but just try and say it in fine Dutch, Gerrit. And sis, continued Gerrit, stammering a little, but full of metal, that is why I think it's so nice that you, a woman like you, who have lived for years in Rome, in just that smart cosmopolitan world where patriotism tends to disappear, that you, who've been away from your country for twenty years, that just you have felt awaken in yourself. Bravo! cried Paul. His words are coming. A feeling for your country, for your motherland, that made you long to see Holland again. I would never have suspected it in you, and that, Sissy, is why I should almost like to kiss you. But we're at a party, and a party of Adolphines into the bargain, and Adelintia is jealous. No, I'm not, said Adeline, good-naturedly. Well, then, Connie, here goes, and Gerrit gave his sister an off-hand kiss. You're a couple of pastoral characters, said Paul. I can't compete with you. And now, Constance, a glass of champagne and drink to all the family and our native land, said Gerrit, and with Constance on his arm, he walked across the room to the buffet. Adelicia, said Paul, was there ever such a madman as your husband? But Adolphine approached, triumphant, trailing her satin train, which she thought magnificent, and radiant with self-complacency, asked, Adeline, tell me now, what do you think of my party? Oh, beautiful, Adolphine, said Adeline. Adolphine, said Paul, your party is simply dazzling. I've been to many parties in my life, but one like tonight's never. And a good dinner, wasn't it? The dinner was so good, it couldn't have been better. How do you like my new dress, Adeline? Just see how it fits. She passed her hands over her bosom. It's a very charming dress, Adolphine, said Adeline. Adolphine, said Paul, that velvet on the collar of Satsuma's coat. Yes, that's good velvet. Yes, they're his new dress clothes, from Tunisans. And that satin of Florcher's dress. Yes, that's good satin. Oh, what do you know about satin? Everyone's saying so. Really? Yes, I heard them saying so all over the room. Not really. Yes, as I moved about among the people, I heard it whispered on every side like a rumour. Have you noticed the satin of Florcher's dress? I say, did you notice the satin of Florcher's dress? Adolphine looked vaguely in front of her, not knowing what to believe. Well, that frock cost a hundred and twenty guilders, she said, lying to the extent of forty guilders. And, radiant, she went on and talked to Mrs. Broyce, the wife of the editor of the phonograph. And my frau, what do you say to my party? Paul, said Adeline in gentle reproach, I was really frightened that Adolphine would notice. End of chapter 24